Um, good morning, everybody, um, and very welcome to uh, this conference, to the Society of Antiquaries and to Burlington House. Um, my name's Linda. Um, I'm one of the co-conveners of the conference today. Um, but before I hand over to my uh, fellow convener, John Hines, who's going to do the official welcome, um, I just wanted to do a few little boring housekeeping um, things to get them out of the way. Um, so first of all, um, if anybody does feel um, unwell at any point, do obviously let me or another member of staff know. Um, I'm afraid there's no uh, food or drink allowed in this room other than just plain water. We just have to protect the um, amazing paintings that you'll see around the wall. Um, we have uh, no scheduled fire practices today. So should a fire alarm go off, it is actually a real fire alarm. Um, in which case we'll just need to leave this building. Um, our meeting point is straight outside in the courtyard by the Joshua Reynolds um, statue. Obviously staff will supervise that. Um, and the only other thing I was going to say is that if anybody here, um, this is your first visit um, to Burlington House, and if you'd like to have a look around um, some of our amazing collection objects and paintings, um, and our library, I'd be delighted to show you around during our lunch break today, so just let me know. So with all the boring stuff out of the way, um, I'm going to hand over to my co-convener, John Hines, who is also the Vice President of the Society of Antiquaries, um, and he's going to do a proper welcome. Thank you. Much indeed. Right, well, uh, good morning too from me, um, everybody, and welcome to the Society of Antiquaries of London both to those who are with us here in Burlington House and those who are connected with us at a distance. Um, my name is John Hines and I'm Vice President of the Society um, with my colleague, Dr. Linda Grant, FSA. I'm one of the organizers of today's conference and indeed we shall both also be speakers on the program. Um, at this point though, my pleasant task is to greet you in the name of the Society and very briefly to introduce today's event. The Society of Antiquaries of London is a venerable one. It was founded in 1707, granted a royal charter in 1751, which defines the Society's business to be the encouragement, advancement, and furtherance of the study and knowledge of the antiquities of both the United Kingdom and other countries, which basically, of course, means everywhere. A history of over 300 years with the associations and customs accumulated in that time inevitably bequeathed to the present day fellows and affiliate members of the society, an institution that has much to be proud of and much of value um, that could not possibly exist other than from that unique history and evolution. But these, however, will just as inevitably coexist with features inherited from a past whose social structures and intellectual values and much more besides were markedly different from those of the present. Managing forward-looking development within the society in order to maintain its validity and its relevance in the present without sacrificing either long embedded qualities or even just charming traditions is no easy task. It's nonetheless one that the society embraces willingly and determinedly. The aim of today's conference is to take another concrete step in promoting greater understanding of and wider engagement with the multiracial heritage in Britain, along with both knowledge and appreciation of the histories and cultures of the lands, in this case, specifically the islands of the Caribbean. On the opposite side of the Atlantic to where I'm speaking now, but linked historically and geographically with Britain and Ireland in so many ways. It was a conscious objective of Linda Grant and myself in formulating our plans, to try to focus on a practical framework and a relevant topic that would encourage, if not even demand, inclusive and collaborative study of both contemporary culture and of cultural heritage. I know I speak for us both in declaring us to be thrilled to have reached the opening of this event and that the program we have for today promises that our hopes and ambitions will be met in abundance. Now we're, also delighted that the Jamaican High Commission is similarly infused by and supportive of this event. And it's an honor for me now to ask the acting High Commissioner, Mrs. Patrice Laird Grant, um, to speak to us too. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. I greet you on behalf of the staff of the Jamaican High Commission, and thank you for extending that invitation to me and my colleagues to be here with you this morning. The invitation came as quite a delight for us because most of us who um, are in the High Commission, of course, would have been children of direct descendants of or actually born Jamaican nationals living here in the UK. And so when we see, and especially for us book loving um, individuals, when we see an event that seeks to celebrate the contribution of the Caribbean to literature in general, and that being done here in the United Kingdom, we were overly enthused to be present and to participate. Now, I will take my cue from John's introductory remarks. And he spoke about a multiracial approach. And as you know, for Jamaica, our national motto is out of many, one people. And so for us, we are an amalgamation of many races, nationalities, cultures. We have our indigenous people who is initially we were taught that they were the Arawaks, and then we have in more recent times come to learn that they are the Tainas. We have the Africans, we have the Asians, the Europeans, all contributed to making Jamaica and indeed the Caribbean, the kind of melting pot that it is for cultures. We are not just though multiracial, we are also interracial. And that interracial nature breeds a kind of acceptance, tolerance, an ability to be able to live with each other peacefully and to understand each other, to understand our customs or traditions, to celebrate with each other those differences and to revel in those differences. We see the influence of these various cultures um, on our politics and our social interactions. We see it in the way we dress or etiquette and our legal and political strictures. We see it in the foods. We have our jerk from the Tainos and the Africans. We have our one pot meals and our stews, our curries and our herbs and spices and flatbreads. We have our puddings and our desserts. And of course, we see it in our music and entertainment, in our cultural retentions, in the reggae, the dance hall, the calypso, the soca, and also the pantomime. Lastly, and perhaps the most profound is the language and the literature. The Caribbean, in this regard, is akin to the last child the one who is considered in our parlance, the wash belly. And the wash belly who has that unique advantage to be able to learn from and borrow from those who are older, who came before. It gives that individual, and in this respect, the Caribbean, that opportunity to effect a change in the thinking and perception of how we understand, how we relate, and how we communicate the world within which we exist. Not to do away with the past, but to use it as a foundation upon which to build a society in which we are more tolerant and understanding of each other. And so today, as we come to look at Caribbean literature and to look at the retentions in Caribbean literature, 
and the new art form, the new space that it is creating. It is my pleasure to be here with you to learn, to hear, and to see the new and dynamic pathways that are being created by our literary geniuses. So thank you and I wish for you a pleasant and enlightening morning. Well, our chair for the um, day is going to be um, Professor Matthew Smith um, from uh, University College London, whose research is pan-Caribbean in scope, um, with a special interest in the 19th and 20th century histories of Haiti and Jamaica. Um, amongst his current research projects, in fact, is a study of the representations and legacies of the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865, and a social history of Jamaican popular music uh, since the uh, 1950s, which I would be intrigued to hear more about sometime that, but maybe not today. So um, I'm happy now to hand over to Matt Smith, who's the chair. Thank you, thank you, John, and good morning, everyone. Um, good, very, very early morning, everyone who's tuning in from Jamaica, because we know there are some of us who are tuning in. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. Let me first start by saying to be able to be part of this conversation today um, and to congratulate, first of all, the organizers, John and Linda, for uh, this event, which, which I think speaks very much to the sorts of work that we do at the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery at UCL. Um, we don't deal specifically with literature. Our business is the past. We deal with the history of British enslavement in the Caribbean and looking at its long-term legacies. But that history and the telling of that history is very much in parallel with the evolution of Caribbean literature. And those of us familiar with the history of Caribbean literature as a history that is very much founded in a voice on the, in the part of the Caribbean people to tell their stories and to tell that story of the past of the Caribbean very much connected through fiction, but also in a way in which the heritage of the Caribbean, which is very much African, very much uh, British, very much European of, very, of various um, nationalities, uh, very much Asian, all of that comes through in the storytelling. So there's always been this very interesting uh, interrelationship between Caribbean history and Caribbean literature. Um, and in some ways, some of the work that we do, and I, uh, you know, I say this with, with some degree of trepidation, not to offend those of my guild historians, but uh, I will say so much of the work that we do as historians in terms of the empirical work we try and uh, find and bring together is catching up in some ways with the work that the foundational uh, literary scholars and, and writers of the Caribbean have done, their, their way in which they've tuned their ear very much to Caribbean society and legacies. So I'm very pleased to be part of this conversation um, as, I, as I see it, a conversation that will take, take us through the course of most of today uh, on looking back, writing back and writing forward in Caribbean literature. Uh, without any further ado, I think I would move now to introducing our first uh, presenter uh, from the University of the West Indies Mona campus in Jamaica. That's Dr. Isis Simaj Hall. And uh, Dr. Simaj Hall is a specialist in Caribbean literatures and English. She's a uh, lecturer there at the uh, Department of Literatures and English in, at University of the West Indies. Uh, she also focuses in her work on regional national languages as well as African diasporic popular culture. Her research focuses on constructions of the self, decolonizing gender, Jamaican music, and the digital. And, and she's been published uh, in such scholarly journals as Caribbean Quarterly, Jamaica Journal, Cultural Dynamics, and Essex Salon, which is part of the Small Acts Collective uh, that's been going on for nearly 30 years now, I believe, uh, in, from Columbia University. She's currently working on two projects, 
a monograph titled On the B-Side, Dub Disruptions and the Decolonial in Contemporary Caribbean Text that analyzes contemporary Caribbean literature through the music production techniques that were created and popularized by dub music, which emerged in the 1970s in Jamaica. He's also doing an edited collection of oral histories on the silences in Jamaican music. And I kind of love that turn of phrase there, silences in music. Uh, she podcasts for posterity, maintains a blog called Write Ponder Rhythm, and is a co-founding editor of Pre, a literary uh, journal in Caribbean writing. So I'm going to turn things over to um, Dr. Simaj Hall for her presentation. Dr. Simaj Hall. Thank you so much. And I think we're just gonna go ahead and if we are coordinating with the tech side, we'll be able to begin. So thanks so much. I'm happy to be here. Good morning. Good morning. I am I Dr. Am Isis Samaj Hall. Hall. I'm a lecturer I'm a specializing, specializing in Caribbean, Caribbean literature and, and popular culture in the Department of Literatures and English at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus, campus here in Jamaica. Jamaica. I'm, grateful I'm grateful to the Society, to the society and to and Professor John Hines, Hines and Dr. And Linda Grant for the invitation to participate in today's event. event. Thank, you thank you all for joining me and thank you to our chair, Professor Matthew Smith. So, so where to where begin, to begin this, exploration this exploration of Caribbean, Caribbean literature, literature and, its and its engagement with canonicity? Well, well I, choose I choose to begin, to begin by, recognizing by recognizing where we are and from and where, where we have we come. come. 2022, 2022 marks, marks the 52nd, 52nd anniversary, anniversary of the publication of, of Professor, Professor Kenneth Ramshan's West Indian novel and its background. background. This most this critical most text critical examines, examines the history, history of prose fiction, fiction at the hand of we who were born in and of these, and of these former, former British colonies in the Caribbean. The Caribbean. I, salute I salute Professor Ramshan and, and all of my, of my scholarly, scholarly predecessors who first, who first acknowledged the cultural, the cultural importance, importance of our writings, our writings and the revolutionary, and the revolutionary need, need to decolonize, decolonize the Department of English. Of English. I recognize, I recognize Professor Ramshan for, for leading the charge and decentering what it means to study English. Early on, Early on, he knew, he knew that West, West Indian, Indian Englishes, Englishes matter, matter, which is why, which is why my, my university's department, department is to this day the more inclusively titled, titled Department of Literatures, Literatures in English. In English. I also, I also thank Ramshan for, for introducing in the 1960s, the, 1960s the first full course, course on West Indian literature, literature which, helped which helped us at UWE as, as the epicenter, the epicenter of, West of West Indian literature as a field of focus. focus. And if I may, if I may make, make one more statement more of statement gratitude, gratitude, it is also it is to also thank to Professor thank Ramshan, Ramshan for what I'm, what about, I'm to about to say. Because, because it is he who reminds us, us that as Caribbean, Caribbean critics, it is our it duty, is our duty to, turn to turn an audience's attention to the Caribbean's, to the Caribbean's authors in such a way that will implore one re to read the works with greater attention. I'll have done my job well if you are stirred to purchase, borrow, download, whatever it is, but grab on to a piece of writing from these Antilles. So let us dive in. What we think scholars are considering today with regard to Caribbean literature and its canon begins in the 19th century and has unfolded in a series of waves. The first wave of Caribbean writing, the mid 1800s through the 1940s, focused on identifying a West Indian consciousness by amplifying the voice of the folk majority. These works were often penned by the middle-class writers who had access to literacy. We see the emergence of writers like Tom Redcam, Claude McKay, H.G. Delisser, and to the later end, C.L.R. James. The second wave of writers capture the pre-independence years through independence and include the likes of Wilson Harris, V.S. Naipaul, George Lamming, Sam Selvon, Edgar Middlehauser, Walcott, and other men who often were situated outside of the Caribbean in England, but not always. These writings are concerned with decolonization and the reality and politics of what independence will mean for West Indians. The third wave moves from the 1970s through the 1990s and is a shift to focus on sexuality and gender in relation to nation. In this wave, the female writers were sometimes, but not always, located outside of the Caribbean, 
with a notable shift in migration to the USA and Canada rather than England. Some key writers of the third wave are Paul Marshall, who was writing since the 1950s, Jamaica Kincaid, Erna Brodber, Michelle Cliff, Pauline Melville, Merle Hodge, and Janice Scheinborn, and Merle Collins. The Caribbean literary canon is now in its fourth wave, where, as Cherie Marie Harrison outlines in her 2014 monograph, Jamaica's Difficult Subjects, is the wave that sees Caribbean writers, quote, overturning institutions of traditional order and undermining old notions of community, end quote. Writers like Nalo Hopkinson, Diana McCauley, Thomas Glaive, Marlon James, Karen Lord, Nicole Dennis Benn, they are all a part of this most recent wave of Caribbean writers, and I was just naming a few. Each of these waves has been engaged with canonicity, but as I'll argue today, despite English colonization, the English canon has not always been at the center of Anglophone Caribbean storytelling. Born in Clarendon Parish in Jamaica and educated here as well, Claude McKay did ultimately migrate to the United States in 1912. He later went on to be a major figure in the Harlem Renaissance. But before that, he published a collection of Jamaica dialect poems, poems that expressed the voice of Jamaicans rather than the voice of the English. The poem, A Midnight Woman to a Bobby, is, as Carolyn Cooper has noted, one of McKay's most accomplished dialect pieces. It is about a prostitute who has been arrested by a police officer. I'll read just a few stanzas, then discuss a bit of the use of language. No palm me up, you dirty brute. You jam out, mash like a ripe breadfruit. You fasten now, but wait, Leah. I'll see you grunt under the law. You think you wise, but we will see. You're not the first one, but fast with me. I'll live for see them turn you out, as sure as you got that mash mouth. I born right down beneath the clock. You ugly brute, you turn your back. Don't think that I'm a come round. I born right way in Spanish town. You big and ugly old ton foot. Been never know fair wear a boot. And chicken yam your tumpa toe, till knit filly like herring row. The prostitute persona, as I've just read, is here defending herself by berating the officer with reminders that no matter his uniform, him no better than she. She reminds the officer that his job does not make him better and her job does not make her worse. He is still ru a rural country boy. Country boy farmer, ton officer, trying to eke out a living in the city, just like she. I highlight this poem because while McKay could have written this poem and all of his poems in the kind of English he grew up accustomed to reading and studying while as a schoolboy in Jamaica, he instead was encouraged to write at least some of his poetry using the Jamaican voices he grew up hearing. Supported by philologist Walter Jekyll, an Englishman with a sincere appreciation for Jamaican folk culture and language, McKay's collection of poetry titled Songs of Jamaica was published in 1912. Poems such as the one I read today are significant early contributions to the Caribbean canon and a significant early use of dialect. But it is necessary to note here, too, that Claude McKay appreciated his study of Shakespeare, Wordsworth, and Milton in school, and he was deeply influenced by the Scottish dialect poet Robert Burns. As McKay, biographer Winston James notes, quote, Burns was witty and funny and captured the everyday language of the people and experience of ordinary Scottish people. And McKay tried to do the same in relation to the Jamaican people, end quote. Thus, it would not be incorrect to conclude that both the published poets of the English canon and the rhythm of Jamaican expression are what encouraged McKay's pen, a pen that would help to encourage future Caribbean writers to find and write their own voices into a new, rich canon of Caribbean works. Just a few decades later, and across the Atlantic Ocean, 
Una Marson began sparking a literary and political fire in England. Marson recognized the need to connect the lonely West Indian Londoners with their friends and family back home. So she produced BBC's Calling the West Indies program in 1939, which later became Caribbean Voices, and ran from 1943 to 1958, with Henry Swansey taking the reins. Still, Una Marson's work with the BBC was critical in furthering the literary careers of Caribbean authors, and she was a persuasive writer in her own right. Though her contributions are largely undervalued to this day, she wrote for magazines and newspapers and penned dramas, essays, and poems of protest. Written nearly 100 years ago in the 1940s, Marson's poem, Kinky Hair Blues, gives voice to the effects of colorism and curlism on black women. Here I'll share a portion of the poem. I hate that iron hair and that bleaching skin. Hate that iron hair and that bleaching skin. But I'll be all alone if I don't fall in. Lord, tis you did give me all this kinky hair. Now I's gwine press me hair and bleach me skin. I's gwine press me hair and bleach me skin. End quote. Marson's poem can still be felt today as skin bleaching persists, as hair manipulation continues. Marson's words, they strike a chord, a long chord, with African and African diasporic women audiences worldwide. Like Claude McKay, Marson chose to portray the Jamaican voice on the page, and though her work is still und understudied, she is nevertheless a critical contributor to the Caribbean canon and in more ways than one. This Jamaican woman, anti-colonial activist and feminist, used her journalism, social justice, and oratory skills to become the BBC's first black woman broadcaster. And in that position, she created spaces for Caribbean servicemen and Windrush writers like Wilson Harris of Guyana, V.S. Naipaul, and Sam Selvon of Trinidad, and George Lamming of Barbados, so that they could read their works over the air to be heard across the seas. Audible to all, these stories that our Caribbean big men told via poetry and prose rejected imitating Wordsworth and Dickens in favor of raising their uniquely Guyanese, Trini, and Bayesian voices. Rebelliously, they rejected their colonial English lessons that taught them more, quote, about the falling of snow and nothing about the force of hurricanes that take place every year in the Caribbean. Here I take a necessary digression to highlight the importance of the 1984 published History of the Voice, where Brathwaite understandably and frustratedly laments that, quote, we haven't got the syllables, the syllabic intelligence to describe the hurricane, which is our own experience whereas we can describe the imported alien experience of the snowfall, end quote. Famously, of course, Brathwaite goes on to declare that the hurricane does not roar in pentameter. Using nation language, which is our Caribbean language, these languages that are heavily influenced by African tongues, may, as Brathwaite points out, appear to be English in terms of its lexicon, but is not English in terms of its syntax. And English, it certainly is not in terms of the rhythms and timber, its sound explosion. In its contours, it is not English, even though the words as you hear them would be English to a greater or lesser degree. The standard imported educated English, he says, is what the Caribbean writers subverted by creating literature that put nation language to work. Digression complete those writers I noted published uniquely Caribbean works during the mid-20th century that have helped to define Caribbean literature as its own canon, with writers who were more invested in looking at what mattered to Caribbean people than in seeking to please the sensibilities of an English reader or gain entry in an English canon. Just as is the McKay example, here too you will hear a canon shift, Listen to the rhythms of Trinidadian author Sam Selvon's The Lonely Londoners, where in this short novel, the narrator opens with the following bold use of what Brathwaite terms nation language. 
One grim winter evening, when it had a kind of unrealness about London, with the fog sleeping restlessly over the city and the lights showing in the blur as if it's not London at all, but some strange place on another planet, Moses Alouetta hop on a number 46 bus at the corner of Chepstow Road and Westbourne Grove to go to Waterloo to meet a feller who was coming from Trinidad on the boat train. When Moses sit down and pay his fare, he take out a white handkerchief and blow his nose. Note the use of present tense narration, a clear marker of Trinidad nation language. While the Caribbean literary canon, the Caribbean authored texts that have shaped our understanding of self then and continue to enlighten us today, while this canon has developed along the same timeline as the development and questioning of the nation, it has overwhelmingly centered male Afro-Caribbean working class perspectives. Thus, historically, underappreciating works like Una Marsin's during the second quarter of the, sen the 20th century. Scholars like Belinda Edmondson, David Dabadeen, and Alison Donnell have been working to fill the gaps in the canon and more recovery must be done so that we can re-examine the works of the forgotten Caribbean writers of the first and second wave. It is important that I underscore here that the third and fourth waves of Caribbean literature ushered in greater representation from women writers, but also from non-African descent, non-heteronormative, and non-working class writers of the Caribbean. Now at the halfway mark of my presentation, I will move from a survey of the Caribbean canon to a few specific examples of how Caribbean works no longer seem to write back to England's canon of text, but now engage instead with the Caribbean's own rich canon of literature. Huracan, published in 2012, is loosely based on author Diana Macaulay's family history and weaves in and out of contemporary Jamaica and colonial Jamaica to tell the story of the fictional Lee Macaulay, who returns to live in Jamaica after 15 years in the U.S. Spanning three centuries, slavery days, post-emancipation, and post-independence, Huracan tells the interconnected story of one white woman and two white men, each finding their place in Jamaica. In this novel, each generation's experience coming to Jamaica and coming to an understanding of Jamaica serves to move readers beyond the gentler rhetoric of a Jamaica marred by a colonial legacy or a system still haunted by specters of colonialism to the harsher reality of a colony turned country making insufficient advancements with regard to racial equality, economic opportunities, and social and class reform. The novel opens with these words. White gal, exclaimed by a drunk and barefooted black man. White gal, the familiar damning expression echoing from her childhood is hurled at Lee Macaulay, the protagonist. With these two words, white gal, hurricane, or Huracan, rather, immediately launches readers into the racially tense Kingston of 1986. For me, when Diana Macaulay opens this novel with those words, she is inviting readers to retrace the Caribbean canon and recall similar such literary occasions. For me, white girl rings out with the damning ostracization of white cockroach being called out in Jean Reese's 1966 novel, Wide Sargasso Sea. Reese, a Dominican author, wrote Wide Sargasso Sea as a post-colonial pseudo-prequel to the 1847 classic Jane Eyre. In this novella, Reese writes back to Empire when she rewinds the clock on Charlotte Bronte's Bertha and takes her out of the cold English attic and returns her to the Caribbean. Reese then imagines what life must have been like for Bertha in Jamaica during the years immediately following emancipation. Reese writes of the hostility between the black ex-slaves and the poor whites in the Caribbean colony. They hated us, says Bertha, and much like the damning white gal that opens Macaulay's novel, the protagonist of Reese's text explains that the black people called her white cockroach, and she is told she is unwanted and that she should go away. But the writing back does not stop here. Diana Macaulay's Huracan also calls forth the work of the canonical comic writer Anthony Winkler. 
He is the celebrated Jamaican novelist and short story writer who writes honestly and humorously about all facets of Jamaican culture, from politics and religion to class, colonialism, and race. In his semi-autobiographical Going Home to Teach, Winkler reflects on his 1975 return to Jamaica, the country which, despite birthing him, often rejected him as a child and questioned his claims to the nation because of the white color of his skin. Early on in his text, Winkler tells the story of being chased and bullied by a few black boys as he was returning home from school one day. Quote, Sometimes they would walk beside me and flail at my back with switches. Sometimes they would pinch my arms or kick or thump me all over. But I never fought back against them, he writes. Winkler confesses to readers his feelings of white guilt and white shame in a majority black colony like Jamaica. He admits, quote, I could not tell him that in my heart I felt that I deserved their abuse and beating, that if I had been born black and poor in one of Jamaica's mephitic slums, I too would have hated the sight of white skin and be just as inclined as they to kick and thump and abase me on the street, end quote. I point to these examples to show that engagement with canonist canonicity need not journey across the Atlantic to the English. Canon engagement can be achieved through a short drift within Caribbean waters too. Sure, Jean Rhys in 1966 wrote back to the classic English novelist Charlotte Bronte, but in 2012, it is the growth of the Caribbean canon that has allowed Macaulay to write back, not to a British predecessor, but to fellow Jamaican novelist Anthony Winkler. It is the growth of the Caribbean canon that invites readers to consider Macaulay's 2012 Huracan as a novel engaging with a canonical Caribbean text like Wide Sargasso Sea. In my next and final examination, I turn to what may seem to be an unlikely source for considering Caribbean literary canonicity. Because I am as much a Caribbean literature specialist as I am a Caribbean popular culture specialist, this turn in the presentation is critical. As Carolyn Cooper's trailblazing Noises in the Blood did just shy of 30 years ago, and the Rutledge Reader in Caribbean literature did with its inclusion of both Mighty Sparrow and Mighty Chalk Dust Calypsos as poems, and as I have done with the words of dub music pioneer Lee Scratch Perry, I want to encourage us to examine the words of our song lyricists for their contributions to the annals of Caribbean words. Therefore, closing out this presentation, I turn to the work of Rihanna. Indeed, I shall examine here how words written about her and words sung by her engage with the complexities of both colonialism and canonicity. The 2021 declared National Hero of Barbados the Right Honorable Robin Rihanna Fenty, is a woman whose Caribbean identity has often been conflated and read as proof that the Caribbean woman is, quote, sexually carefree and wild. And I say this intentionally, highlighting all of the colonial, racial, and regional stereotypes that are packaged with such a term as wild. GQ magazine writer Jay Bulger has swooned over Rihanna, as the 2012 Obsession of the Year. And in 2011, Esquire Men's Magazine staged a photo shoot of the Bayesian beauty flecked in black sand with seaweed barely obscuring her breasts and buttocks. This is just a sample of the exotification of Rihanna as a Caribbean sea enchantress. In that same year, Esquire also named the singer Sexiest Woman Alive. The entertainment writer Ross McCammon described the singer as the indisputable champion of carnal pop. For hundreds of years, under the desirous and possessive male gaze of the colonizer and under the insecure gaze of colonial wives, Caribbean black girls and black women did not have access to a word like carefree, nor did they have access to a movement like feminism. Through her music and musical persona, Rihanna, like the women of the canon's third wave, becomes emblematic of a critical shift. Rihanna owns her masters, and she also owns her sexuality. Look but don't touch, her body reads, and she has many readers. 
But Rihanna does not suffer under the gaze. She commands it, demanding that viewers like Ross McCammon watch her every move and listeners hear her every word. Released on her most recent album from 2016, Anti, Needed Me, I argue, is one of several songs by the artist that are most fully rounded out, not by a study of fellow pop stars like Beyonce or Britney Spears, but by reading the works of the Caribbean literary canon. Again, released in 2016, at just three minutes and 11 seconds of recorded sound, the atypical production offered on Anti's second single, Needed Me, carries lyrics written by 11 writers, including Rihanna herself. Bluntly worded, with two six-line verses and an unyielding, almost droning refrain, Rihanna's Needed Me digs into the listener's ears, and as it digs, it unearths literary links that remind readers of Marlon James' historical fiction, The Book of Night Women, Nalo Hopkinson's speculative fiction Salt Roads, and Jean Reese's novella Wide Sargasso Sea, all of which feature some of the canon's most self-assured female prag- protagonists and their dependent and emotionally depleting suitors. Though all published in the last half century or so, these three examples are deft explorations of the historical reality of being a creolized woman in the Caribbean setting. As a daughter of Barbados, as a Caribbean woman, as a global popular music star, and as an international symbol of, quote, exotic sexuality, Needed Me's persona provocatively asks listeners, who are sometimes also literary critics, didn't they tell you that I was a savage. The they in Rihanna's questioning lyric could very well be pointing to Heather D. Russell and Sir Hilary Beckles, whose book-length study of Rihanna reminds readers that Rihanna is 100% Bayesian. At the superficial level, Rihanna's question in the song lyrics, didn't they tell you that I was a savage, can be read in the context of the song as an admission of Rihanna's capacity to sexually, if not cannibalistically, consume and discard men without emotion. Arguably, however, Rihanna's question is open to theoretical engagement. And does more literary work, perhaps, than first realized as the word savage subversively calls forth 400 years of post-colonial tension and writing in the New World. From the 17th century British playwright, travel writer, and foremother of the English novel, Afra Ben, and her seminal text, Orinoco, The Royal Slave, to Jamaican writer Michelle Cliff's Abeng and No Telephone to Heaven. The sonic experience of Needed Me opens up a multiplicity of literary linkages. To be savage is to be seen as subhuman, primitive, wild, unruly, and unfit for civilized society. As scholar Kristen Guest explains in Eating Their Words, quote, cannibalism is the ultimate charge. Call a group cannibals and you not only prove that they are savages, but authorize their extinction, end quote. Sung by a 100% Bayesian, Rihanna, in her Needed Me, it demonstrates an ownership of the savage identity that both writes back and rejects British Afra Ben's construction of the noble savage, and at the same time aligns with Michelle Cliff's fictive character Claire Savage to represent a dissident anti-colonial appropriation of the term savage. The lyrics that follow the persona's question, F your white horse and a carriage, demonstrate a rejection of the colonially prescribed and subordinating myth of romantic love. Thus, With Needed Me and Needed Me's anti-colonial gestures, the persona rejects European prescriptions for love, takes power, and subverts savagery. Rihanna's subversive engagement in canonicity should not be glossed over. Her music actively actively contributes to and engages with the fourth-wave works of the Caribbean canon in ways that are as complex and rich as the calypso, reggae, and dancehall poets of the 20th century. Now to conclude, I want to make two brief statements about the use of language to express the self. 
First, first, I'll address Walcott. In the poem, A Far Cry from Africa, the St. Lucian Nobel laureate, Derek Walcott, highlights the complexity of the divided Caribbean when he asks rhetorically, how choose between this Africa and the English tongue I love? End quote. Walcott writes with an attention to both histories, with an African orality, as well as European canon in mind, which is why his sprawling poem Omeros is, as Walcott says, not a Homeric epic. Rather, as Joseph Farrell has summarized, Omeros's quote, most important antecedents are to be found in Walcott's own dramatic works, end quote. I know there will be greater focus on Walcott later today, so I'll only mention this here to emphasize how critical it has been for Caribbean writers to use English and nation language both to write back and to engage with our own Caribbean works. And second, I want to turn to Jamaica Kincaid. The Antigua-born Kincaid wrote these words in her 1988 extended essay, A Small Place. Quote, isn't it odd that the only language I have in which to speak of this crime of plantation slavery and by extension racism is the language of the criminal who committed the crime? The language of the criminal can explain and express the deed only from the criminal's point of view. It cannot contain the horror of the deed, the injustice of the deed, the agony, the humiliation inflicted on me. End quote. This, I suppose, has been the importance and the difficulty of being of the Anglophone Caribbean and voicing our stories using the English novel form or English style odes or European epic poems or global pop song lyrics during the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries. The English language, literary genres, and forms that we have been educated to write in seem to betray with every word a limited shift away from the colonial horror. But that would be a short-sighted view. A long look shows how we have chosen to write revolutionary words that are national narratives. We have taken this tongue and made it a weapon of truth and fiction. We have taken this pen and made it a knife so that we could carve our stories into the shelves of posterity. We have taken our sound colonial educations and used them to write our local experiences with racism, classism, and sexism. The oppressive systems and prejudice laws, the screaming victims and the silent beneficiaries are all here. The writers see this. The writers hear this. The Caribbean writers have written these truths at the risk of their lives and livelihood. By writing our Caribbean stories in our own voices, sometimes subverting English words to the will of the myriad Caribbean grammars and sometimes stretching the limits of English, we have been writing revolution into prose and poetry and into our song lyrics too. We have taken our forced familiarity with English literature and chosen to write against the empire and to build our own canon of Caribbean inclusivity. This is our pride and joy. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you for taking the time to listen to these words. I appreciate your attention. Thank you again. I'm happy to take any questions that there may be. You my specialization is history. I'll just say again, my name is Dr. Michael Siva. But naturally, I have great fascination throughout my life growing up in Jamaica with um, Caribbean literature. But one writer I never learned about was Una Marson. And your presentation quite rightly highlighted her contribution. There was a little known documentary on BBC recently 
which was also on Una Morrison, which was not promoted, and I was only alerted to it by somebody I followed on Twitter. And um, there was some very powerful poems in there, especially Little Brown Girl about her struggles, not only as a woman, but as a brown woman in 1930s UK. Um, we, we would like to see a lot more of her being publicized, not in both the UK and in the Caribbean, because of her immense contribution. Naturally, that's probably not going to happen in the UK given the current climate. But my question is, are there any plans within the university, um, UWE, or in the departments of education in the Caribbean to introduce her a little bit more into the Caribbean curriculum so we can learn more about some of the wonderful works that Una Marson has done? Thank you for that question. I think it's um, a really important one. And what you're raising is, is quite critical. The work of Una Marson has been understudied for too long, and there is a great need for her work to be reviewed now. Um, it seems more apt than ever, which is, I guess, a, another strange point to, to think about. There has been a, a, a focused biography on Una Marson that was written by a colleague at the University of the West Indies, Lisa Tomlinson. And that's a great uh, source for anyone that's interested in learning much more about Una Marson in book form. There hasn't, to my knowledge, been any move, um, any focus to bring Una Marson into the classroom more specifically or to bring her onto the English curriculum in high schools. But it's certainly something worth investigating and worth um, advocating for. I do teach some of her work, some of her poetry in my literature courses, but it'd be great to see more students, more young students learning about her work earlier on before they reach the tertiary level. So I really appreciate that question. And if I, if I can do my part, I'll, I'll do what I can to help it to become a reality for the high school students as well and, and speak with colleagues in education. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, is it online? Online, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, let, let, yes, I saw both hands at the same time. Forgive me. Linda. Thank you. Um, my, my question um, actually follows on really neatly from uh, Michael's question um, in that I also wrote down uh, Una Marson as somebody who I'd never heard of, um, but actually a lot of the people that you were talking about, and, and I'm a non-Caribbean person, um, you know, from London, um, I, I was really wanted to ask about gatekeepers. Um, and the idea of, you know, are publishers perhaps moving more towards publishing or putting some of these writers um, back in print? Um, because there are so many people. And yet I think if we think about Caribbean literature, um, certainly here in the UK, there are probably a, a few key names that, that we think of, you know, Marlon James, Kai Miller. Um, but there's obviously a much much wider canon that that we don't know about, um, and I don't know if this is a fair question to ask you this, but I, I wonder if you if if you have any thoughts on uh, the publishing industry as a kind of gatekeeper and perhaps any changes um, that you might foresee in terms of making Caribbean literature uh, more publicly available. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I actually have a lot to say, or there's a lot that I could say about publishing, uh, the publishing industry and how it is impacting the Caribbean. Um, one point I think I'll start off with is to say that there is a great difficulty in purchasing, accessing Caribbean texts written by Caribbean authors, um, whether they're Caribbean in, um, in the Caribbean or whether they are in the Caribbean diaspora. There's a great difficulty in being able to access those texts in the Caribbean. And that to me is, is probably the most alarming uh, reality of 2022 is that the publishing industry still does not recognize the Caribbean as a um, distribution zone, right? So we are already suffering from the inability to access our own works. If authors in the Caribbean want to be published, they overwhelmingly have to be published outside of the region, right? There are a few small presses, um, small publishing houses in the Caribbean, but overwhelmingly um, they are outside, right? So writers are already dealing with that. Now, as mentioned in my bio, I am one of the co-founders of Pre-Caribbean Writing, which is an online Caribbean um, writing magazine. 
and what PRE was launched for. The reason it came to be was as a way of helping Caribbean writers to have an outlet that is accessible within the region. So it's a website that anyone can access. There are no um, uh, pay barriers or anything. Um, and it's it's there, we've created this just for the sake of having people be able to access Caribbean writing. So this is contemporary writing, this is the freshest writing. And so I definitely want to salute Annie Paul, who is the editor in chief of PRE. Now, in terms of gatekeeping outside of the region, um, yes, it, it does happen. And again, I think it has something to do with the distribution patterns um, and where Caribbean texts are expected to be read. So there's a lot more work that we as consumers of, um, analysts of Caribbean literature have to do. I think if we press the presses, if you will, if we press the publishers um, for more, uh, they will have to respond. I think that they need to see how it will unfortunately benefit them uh, to bring this literature to the public. So that's something that we want to think about. There's also the university presses who have been doing a lot of the work of publishing the understudied and underread texts of the past. So lots of republishing has happened through those avenues. And again, we just need to to raise our voices, right? We can kind of have those social media takeovers and we can hashtag bring out more Caribbean texts. Who are those Caribbean readers and what have you and tag in these kinds of ways, the publishing houses. And I think it will bring their attention to this region and this field of study and this field of literature. So there's work that we can do um, to, to change this, to make it so that we, we have greater access and that our writers have greater opportunities to be read. Thank you so much. I, we only have time for one more and we don't want to neglect our online audience. So we'll take our last question from someone online. Uh, someone on Zoom asks, how is the stigma of Jamaican language balanced out with the cultural reclamation and contribution in the context of writing back and rejection colonial trope, including dance hall language impact? Okay, so thank you for that question. Um, the stigma of Jamaican language, I suppose you're referring to the stigma of Jamaican language within Jamaica, yes? Um, so for readers of Caribbean texts, um, even in the Caribbean, for readers who are encountering, if you will, Jamaican language or nation language um, in print for the first time, I suppose it can be as jarring as encountering Shakespeare for the first time, that there's a way that one has to become familiar with how to read the oral, right? Words that we're used to hearing and making sense of, how then to make sense of it on the page. And in ways that are probably much more subconscious, there's a, a fracture in identity, right? This understanding that one can know a language through the ear, but not necessarily readily make sense of that language on the page. Now that probably happened much more pretext, uh, as in pre WhatsApp and pre use of texting, because nation language has come into um, the written space of being able to share uh, communication freely between friends. But I think there is a way that that many of us in Jamaica and across the Caribbean are still grappling to some degree with what is. Um, the appropriateness of language and which languages should be considered high art and which are the languages of, um, or which language would be relegated to folk art. These are, I think are still being worked out to some degree, but again, the more Caribbean texts that we bring into our, our school systems, whether this is at the uh, secondary level or at the tertiary level, the more that this will start to shift and the more that this will, or I guess the, the, the smaller the divide will be, right? Between those who think that um, a particular language is appropriate or inappropriate. And of course we have Louise Bennett Coverly to thank in large part for how language reception um, has shifted over the decades, right? So her work on stage, um, her work, her performance work, um, her poetry that is, often performed annually at different Jamaica events 
have all helped to have a shift or bring a shift in how language is received in Jamaica, of course, feeding into reggae music and the voice of reggae musicians and dance hall artists and the voices that are used in that space. So the literary space has done a lot of work. The writers have been doing a lot of work. Performance artists have been doing a lot of work. And really it's up to us, again, as audiences, as consumers, as lovers of this work to make it known that we need more and that we want respectable um, uh, compensation, right? For these artists who are providing this work for us. It's a cultural artifact that we need. Wonderful, thank you. That was a great way to end. Thanks you again, Isis, for that presentation and everyone for the questions. Thank you for having me. We now move on to our next presenter, and our next presenter is John Hines, um, professor. You like to? No, 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 no. Professor of Archaeology at Cardiff University and a specialist on relations between Britain and Scandinavia, before and during the Viking period. John also has broader interests in literature, including Jane Austen, and the prequels, sequels, and translations of her knowledge of her novels. Sorry. Maybe that was a Freudian slip of our knowledge. I don't know. We'll, we'll hear for sure in John's paper shortly of her novels on TV and in film. And John's presentation is titled Representations of the Caribbean in Jane Austen. John? Thank you very much indeed. I do, while I'm opening up the um, PowerPoint here, um, I will say I feel almost uh, guilty of uh, interrupting the discussion with them. Um, uh, ISAS th there, though the whole point is that, of course, this is going to be um, discussion and debate, which is intended to carry on not just throughout today, um, but, you know, for weeks um, and indeed we hope for years to come. Um, the, as you'll see, the title Reflections from the Caribbean rather than Representations is the one slight um, difference there. Um, and there's also that interesting concept of progressive composition. Uh, which I hope I'll be able to explain um, for you. I'm going to talk about an approach which could be a constructive and even a healing way of reading and sharing literature. That's applied here to an extremely well-known authoress who thoroughly represents, as we all know very well, a model of genteel Englishness that for more than two centuries since her death in 1817 has been transmitted and treasured as the epitome of civilized culture and admirable social manners. In many respects, it couldn't seem more different, I think, than Rihanna, as we've just heard about it, but we know that what it superficially appears to be the case may be very, very different indeed in heart and in terms of significance. In Jane Austen's novels, characters who are unkind or selfish, the pretentious and the foolish are judged by means of satirical exposure. Correspondingly, those who show themselves at heart to be principled, caring and intelligent are rewarded and quite consistently that is through achieving ultimate happiness in romantic love and marriage. In the great majority of cases, those heroines and heroes have to go through a process of learning, maturation and improvement to enhance their intrinsic qualities. These are very simply classic novels. Now, what's intended to make a discussion of Jane Austen's work relevant to the theme of today's conference is a theory. The theory is that insights suggested by the psychological analysis and treatment of traumatic memory can productively be applied to how her work has been read, dramatized, reinterpreted, and extended through sequels and completions. The settings and cast lists of Jane Austen's novels consistently marginalized, but did not completely block out real awareness of unpleasant and close contemporary circumstances concerning, for instance, the Napoleonic Wars, poverty and social inequality within England, and the state of affairs in the Caribbean, known to Jane Austen and her circle as the West Indies. That region was one pole of the practical worldview Jane Austen was familiar with, at the other end of which, in fact, were the East Indies, which feature comparably in her life records and her novels. 
Now, I choose now usually to avoid the term contested heritage. It was a term that served its turn some years ago in highlighting a definitely important issue, but it has largely now become something of a superficial label, which actually stands in the way of the examination of specific issues and nuanced strategies. But what is at issue there, of course, is cultural heritage that is strongly, if not essentially connected to atrocities and inhumane behavior in the past. Essential components of therapeutic approaches for traumatized individuals comprise, firstly, full acceptance of the factual realities of the traumatic past as immutable. That history is not to be denied and it cannot be wished away. Nor indeed is it therapeutically helpful to try to reassess it or reconfigure it as not that bad if you look at it from this point of view. But the second and complementary therapeutic strategy is nevertheless to facilitate the framing of those certain terrible facts with equally valid and true contextual awareness. Now this can include more comfortable knowledge of other facts associated with the same persons or places or times that are involved in the traumatic memory. It can indeed extend to wider explanations of behavior and moral considerations. The really challenging question for the present discussion is whether healing processes developed for individuals and their personal life stories can be adapted to whole societies and to transgenerational heritage. Jane Austen lived from 1775 to 1817. Her known writing career was from her relatively early teens in the late 1780s through to a few months before her death when she was composing her unfinished novel Sanditon. She enjoyed success as a published authoress only for some five and a half years from the publication of Sense and Sensibility late in 1811. As well as her fictional writings, we have many letters that she wrote, mostly to her elder sister Cassandra. These date from January 1796, when she was just 20, to May 1817. Her adult life only just outlasted the context of the French Revolution, 1789-1792, and the Napoleonic Wars. She was 31 when the Act for the Abolition of the Slave Trade was passed by the United Kingdom Parliament in March 1807. The Austin family had risen to some local status in southeast England, primarily in Kent and Hampshire. Earlier generations had been successful manufacturers and traders. Jane Austen's father, George, was the son of a surgeon practicing in Tunbridge. He was educated at Tunbridge School and St John's College, Oxford, and was ordained an Anglican church clergyman. He held a fellowship of the college for 10 years in the 1750s and also taught for a while at Tunbridge School. Favourable family connections allowed him to progress to eligible livings, as they were called, at Steventon and Dean in Hampshire, before being able to retire to Bath at the age of 70 for the last few years of his life. At Oxford, George Austin had become a close friend of a younger man, James Langford Nibbs, the son of the owner of a slave work plantation in Antigua, who himself settled and lived in Devon. In 1760, George Austin accepted the position of trustee to preserve the contingent remainders, is the legal term, of Langford Nibbs's estate, which would therefore include his financial interest in the Antiguan plantation. Jane Austen's own life experiences were restricted. She moved often for sojourns around the southeast of England and to Bath, the Dorset coast or the South Midlands. Her day-to-day -day life revolved around domestic spaces and gardens, grocers and haberdashers shops, church and country walks. In her letters, however, she both follows and recounts the diverse experiences of a wide circle of family and friends. Her aunt Philadelphia had lived in India and France. Her cousin Eliza's first husband died under the guillotine in 1794, and Eliza then married Jane's elder brother, Henry. Jane Austen's elder sister, Cassandra's fiance, Tom Fowles, had left for Barbados as a military chaplain 
early in 1796, but died in San Domingo the following year. Early in 1807, her one younger brother, Charles, left for the Caribbean, I'm looking up your pronunciation here, <laughs> left for the Caribbean, the Jamaica station, as it was called, as a rising naval officer, and he married in Bermuda. Now, while much of Jane Austen's correspondence can seem ineffably trivial in its gossip and its mundane news, she occasionally comments on events in and around the wars. She read widely and seriously, and particularly commended Charles Paisley's military policy and institutions of the British Empire of 1810. And that military police on the slide here is not a, a typo. Um, that was how policy was written in the early 19th century. Um, and she declared in a letter of 1813 that she was in love with this author as much as she was with Thomas Clarkson, the most intellectual and scholarly abolitionist campaigner. She largely eschewed um, direct statements of political opinion or sentiment, largely because of a notion of propriety in relation to her situation, modulated as a concept of fitness in relation to the genres of familiar correspondence or novels that were intended to entertain. She could nevertheless pithily compare Britain to the young United States and describe Britain as a, a nation in spite of much evil improving in religion. Now this comment and that valorization of religion has to be treated seriously as expressing Jane Austen's deepest values. Her wider range of awareness is incorporated into all of her novels from Mansfield Park onwards. Mansfield Park is set in the years 1808 to 1810 and was published late in 1814. It's the only one of her novels for which Jane Austen herself made a country house and estate the titular focus. That fictional estate in Northamptonshire is held by Sir Thomas Bertram in conjunction with a property in Antigua, beyond serious question, a slave worked sugar plantation, just as James Langford Nibbs is. Sir Thomas's absence from home in Antigua, which is rather vaguely described as being for the better arrangement of his affairs, creates the situation for crucial and damaging disruptions to the usually tedious but relatively orderly running of the household, out of which many characters eventually learn moral lessons on the danger of laxity and of neglect. Now, much was made of by Edward Said in his book, Culture and Imperialism, of the reported rather than actually dramatized aborted conversation in which Fanny Price had asked Sir Thomas, her uncle, about the slave trade upon his return. Her cousin Edmund, with whom she is secretly in love, had complimented her on how attractive she is. Oh, don't talk so, don't talk so, cried Fanny, distressed by more feelings than he was aware of. But seeing that she was distressed, he had done with the subject and only added more seriously, your uncle is disposed to be pleased with you in every respect, and I only wish you would walk, talk to him more. You are one of those who are too silent in the evening circle. But I do talk to him more than I used. I am sure I do. Did you not hear, sorry, did not you hear me talk, ask him about the slave trade last night? I did, and was in hopes your question would be followed up by others. It would have pleased your uncle to be inquired of farther, and I longed to do it. But there was such a dead silence. And while my cousins were sitting by without speaking a word or seeming at all interested in the subject, I did not like. I, I thought it would appear as I wanted to set myself off at their expense by showing a curiosity and pleasure in his information, which he must wish his own daughters to feel. Now, Emma followed Mansfield Park in 1816. It's generally a sunnier coming of age story and social comedy of manners. Yet the grim taint of the Atlantic slave trade and continuing slave working in the Caribbean is substantially represented by Augusta Hawkins, the extremely rich daughter of a Bristol merchant who becomes the disagreeably self-important new wife of the ambitious clergyman, Mr. Elton. In one scene, Mrs. Elton has assumed that Jane Fairfax has pointedly drawn a simile between enslavement and the servitude of a governess the sale, not quite of human flesh, but of human intellect. 
Mrs. Elton considers it sufficient to salve her conscience by claiming that her brother-in-law was rather a friend to abolition. Jane Fairfax insists she was not referring to the slave trade, but the issue having been raised affirms her opinion that the issues are widely different as to the guilt of those who carry it on, although also admitting herself to be unable to know where the greater misery of the victims lies. In the posthumously published Persuasion, Captain Wentworth, exactly like Jane Austen's brother Charles, has had a successful and profitable spell as a naval officer in the Caribbean. The chronology of the novel makes it clear that he would have started that stage of his career exactly when Charles was posted to, to, to the Jamaica station early in 1807. Equally, an important, equally important a character in Persuasion is Anne Elliot's unfortunate former school friend, the widowed Mrs. Smith, living in genteel poverty in Bath. For the story, she is able to confirm for Anne the deceitfully worthless character of the junior Mr. William Elliot, whom it seems, just like Fanny Price with Henry Crawford, Anne may be cajoled into marrying against her better instincts. Mrs. Smith's predicament is a consequence of the improvidence of her extravagant deceased husband. There was, however, an interest in a property in the West Indies, which that same Mr. Elliot, as executor of her husband's will, could retrieve for Mrs. Smith, but simply did not bother to do so. In the end, Captain Wentworth, now married to Anne, does that task for her. Now, the situation of Mrs. Smith in persuasion is derived extremely closely from the real life situation of Barbara Nibbs, the widow of James Langford Nibbs, for whom the Reverend George Austin had accepted the role of trustee. The widowed Barbara Nibbs was living in Bath from 1808 to 1813. We cannot though say that her situation was identical to Mrs. Smith's fictional uh, predicament. James Langford Nibbs had died in 1796 and his will primarily concerns his estate in Antigua, on which an annuity of £150 was payable. That's not a huge amount of money in the early 19th century, but one could just about live on it. The will refers explicitly to the disastrous improvidence of his own son, who had even transferred the rights to his inheritance to a relative by marriage in his father's generation, Thomas Oliver, from whom indeed the Via Langford Oliver, who composed the history of the island of Antigua in 1896, was descended. The will therefore seeks to secure sufficient provision for Barbara after his decease. There is no further mention of the Antiguan property in Barbara's own modest will of 1813. Now, before turning to the unfinished Sanditon, begun by Jane Austen in her final months in 1817, I shall review key features of the relevant critical heritage with regard to the complete novels. Although the post-colonialism he embraced is current still, Edward Said's discussion of Jane Austen in Empire is almost 40 years old now in its origins, and it has dated. That is not least true of Edward Said's claim that literary theory and general cultural history have neglected most aspects of the history of imperialism and colonization. Said sought to explicate how literary culture in particular had adapted to serve the interests of power and social order in the context of the growth of the British Empire in the 19th century, in contrast to political, military, or economic studies of that process. Jane Austen, Said saw as exemplifying the early stages of, eventually, the full-scale imperialist worldview of Victorian culture and its many equivocations. In essence, the Bertram family depends on its income from Antigua to maintain the affluent comfort of the Northamptonshire house. An interesting part of Said's analysis is the proposition that Fanny Price's intrusive move to preeminence in the home estate is structurally parallel to that dependency on wealth extracted from the plantation, but that, encapsulated by Fanny's apparently unanswered question about the slave trade, 
the narrative simply avoids or even resists engaging with geographically other settings, and thus is part of a conspiracy of silence on the exploitation and inhumanity characteristic of those colonies. Now, in that respect, I can agree with the points recently reviewed by Corinne Fowler, drawing as she notes on a number of earlier studies and critiques, and particularly in that Said did use very selective evidence to construct his case. What Sir Thomas saw in Antigua was reportedly a matter of co regular conversation after his return. Fanny opens the conversation with Edmund that refers directly to the slave trade by saying, the evenings do not appear long to me. I love to hear my uncle talk of the West Indies. I could listen to him for an hour together. It entertains me more than many other things have done. It's important to stress here that the concept of entertainment is not the trivial sense of entertainment um, that we might, might have. It is something that engross, engrosses would perhaps be a more accurate modern term than entertains um, there. It's difficult to explain why, if the topic is so taboo as Saeed claims, it is referred to so pointedly at all. If I exemplifying Fanny's continuing diffidence with a point, presumably any number of other topics would have served. The dead silence after her question cannot possibly be construed as the polite Sir Thomas simply blanking his increasingly adored niece but it explicitly represents the failure of the others who incidentally must have included Edmund to play their parts in developing a shared conversation. Said's view is also particularly hard to sustain if QD Nevis's apparently almost forgotten case for the gestation over nearly 20 years of Mansfield Park out of Lady Susan via an intermediary draft epistolary novel is correct. If so, the reference to Antigua was carefully added in. Q.D. Levis, however, was condensed to explain that addition simply to modern sensitivities, I would say reductively, as a burlesque allusion to a naive plot device at the start of volume three of Elizabeth Inchbold's A Simple Story of 1791, which you have there on the slide in front of you. Yet again, though, the addition of details that make this part of the narrative truly realistic for the period in which Mansfield Park is set creates a quite new and serious moral perspective. All the same, not least in light of the apparent acquiescence in the story in Persuasion of a dependent woman securing a more comfortable life for herself by cashing in as best she could a still slave worked asset in the Caribbean and disengaging from the brutal profiteering of that economic zone on those terms, it's not easy, to be honest, to recast Jane Austen purely as a forerunner of an especially female concern with social justice here in the form of abolitionism. We know how Jane Austen's own moral judgment fell. For the newlywed Bertrams to move into a property of the scandalous Lascelles family, also major plantation owners in Wimpole Street in London, completely anticipates Mr. Elton's amorality in joining himself to Augusta Hawkins and her tainted fortune. The names Mansfield and Norris may also be names that are associable, associable with the admirable and the despicable in the British history of the Atlantic slave trade respectively, but none of this turns Mansfield Park into a moral or political allegory. Now, my own assessment is that a fuller rather than a selective study of the evidence does actually vindicate something similar to Saeed's overall position. Jane Fairfax in Emma declared that she could not know what the misery of a plantation slave was or how to measure that against wretchedness, which she could easily observe and understand and was indeed threatened with. In a simple, practical sense, that must be true. Her range of experience was as limited to Jane Austen's. For her to admit it does not imply complete indifference to, or a refusal to imagine, the horrors suffered by an enslaved population. Jane Austen's overall position, I suggest, was one of acknowledging a knowable world and indeed a moral universe in which there were spheres or sectors of abysmal human brutality and cruelty. 
her regular response was where it could pragmatically be done to encourage disengagement from those contexts, implying perhaps that such evils were ineradicable and unreformable. It is another of QD Leavis's astute but long ignored insights that there is evidence that Jane Austen nurtured a strong conventional Christian faith and morality, which is largely hidden by levity in her discourse with a witty and cynical circle of family and friends. Now, I regard it as a poignant tragedy that Jane Austen could not complete Sanditon. It was, this was promising to be as good as anything else she wrote, and was especially interesting because she had broken away from the parlor-centered rural gentility of her previous novels to engage with commercial developments and entrepreneurialism. The business at the heart of the tale is the selling of care to the sick or the imagined sick at a South Coast seaside spa. The affluent infirm are potential customers to be corralled in while any and every hypochondriac with a bit of money to spend is to be encouraged and indulged. That Jane Austen started this novel when herself genuinely and in fact terminally ill is to be remembered when enjoying the satirical wit of her introductory portraits of, for instance, the pathetic Arthur Parker and his meddlesome sister and self-appointed nanny, Diana, or the preposterously vain poseur, Sir Edward Denham. Sanditon also represents a significant step for Jane Austen as she introduces her first character of color, as I hope is a correct way to refer to her. A Miss Lamb, described as a young West Indian of large fortune and in delicate health, who is in the care of a Mrs. Mrs. Griffiths who ran a finishing school for older girls and very young ladies. Mrs. Griffiths brings three teenagers to Sanditon. Of these three, um, and indeed of all, Miss Lamb was beyond comparison the most important and precious, as she paid in proportion to her fortune. She was about 17, half mulatto, chilly and tender, had a maid of her own, was to have the best room in the lodgings, and was also of first consequence in every plan of Mrs. Griffiths. Now, if it's correct that Jane Austen thought in terms of repatriation and assimilation, to a more civilized social order as a curative process for those brutalized by the barbarities of the slave trade and plantations. I can readily suppose that it literally represents a shading down of the potentially progressive move of including a character of African descent to make Miss Lamb half mulatto. This is the only use of that particular phrase that I've been able to find um, anywhere. I don't, nobody can really tell you exactly what it's meant to mean. Her chilliness, I can suppose, is what Jane Austen assumed would be how someone from the warmth of the Caribbean would find the south coast of England, although of course it may imply or warn of chilliness of character. Tender, likewise, can, either, can be either or both a degree of physical robustness and her social disposition. It must be noted, though, that the false belief that mixed-race parenthood led to physically and mentally weaker offspring was a widespread one at this time. Now, what matters to the folk of Sanditon, whose reactions we see, is not, however, anything to do with Miss Lamb's mixed race, but the fact that she is wealthy and, better still, allegedly delicate. The description quoted here is the only sentence about her that does not represent only what the other profiteering characters want to see in here. The ambiguities in Chile and Tender draw particular attention, and it is reasonable for the reader to imagine that that account represents the heroine, Charlotte Haywood's first frank impression of the new arrival. The awareness of economic processes and their impact in post-war England is clearly enunciated through the blunt-spoken Lady Denham in conversation with Mr. Parker, the businessman who is promoting the resort. Lady Denham uses the colloquial terms a West Indy family and West Indines who are associated with lots of ready money. No people spend more freely, I believe, than the West Indians, observed Mr. Parker. Lady Denham points out that that sort of influx of cash raises prices, it causes inflation. 
Mr. Parker, however, is a firm optimist in terms of the economic consequences. Such a diffusion of money among us must do more good than harm. Now, reinforcing the case that Sanditon represents a long-term continuity in Jane Austen's authorship, planning and thinking about future novels, while still seeing some through the press and writing others, the heroine of Sanditon, Charlotte Hayward, is apparently modeled on a Charlotte Williams, whose sagacity, taste and appearance were praised by Jane in a letter to Cassandra of October 1813. I will compliment her, she said, by naming a heroine after her. Charlotte Williams did spend a lot of time at health spas, caring for her elder sister, Betsy. The household of Jane and Cassandra's very close friend, Alethea Biggs, moved into the Williams's house in the cathedral close of Winchester in 1813, where in January 1817, just when Sanditon was begun, Jane wrote to Alethea saying that she was pleased to hear Betsy Williams's condition had improved because that would make things easier for her sister Charlotte. Those circumstantial clues, however, leave the West Indian heiress, Miss Lamb, an independent creation of Jane Austen's. Now, that thrown out speculative suggestion on Miss Lamb's family connections, probably a niece, with echoes of Harriet Smith in Emma, the natural daughter of somebody, resonates further and powerfully with the record of a mixed race Christopher Nibs in Antigua, born into slavery around 1757 to 58, who died aged 36 in 1793 or 1794. So far as I have been able to discover, there is no record of who fathered him, nor did Jane Austen have to be aware of specific mixed race descendants or close relatives of the Nibs family. She did know for his brief personal story recorded because it was itself recast in the mode of Methodist missionary evangelization to belong with the whole complex mass of stories and their frames in the spaces between and around Mansfield Park and Sanditon. 50 years after R.W. Chapman's edition of the manuscript of Sanditon appeared, the first serious essay at completing the novel by Marie Dobbs under the pseudonym Another Lady, appeared in 1975. In 2009, another established author, Juliet Shapiro, issued her version of Sanditon, Jane Austen's unfinished masterpiece completed. These completions of Sanditon approach the novel purely and simply as a romance, a set of intertwined love stories with misunderstandings and obstacles to overcome before happy endings are achieved. It's striking that the romantic entanglements in these versions have nothing of the thematic and moral essence embedded in such narratives characteristic of Jane Austen's own novels. Marie Dobbs did make a little more of the commercial theme by creating a rival resort to Sanditon in Brinshaw. The West Indian heiress, Miss Lamb, is eventually just shunted out of Juliet Shapiro's version when some news came for her, which led to her departing Sanditon the next morning. And it is in fact the need for her to be accompanied on her journey, which does usefully move some other characters around for Juliet Shapiro's plot. Both Dobbs and Shapiro recuperated the indolent Arthur Parker by letting him find love and marry. In the earlier continuation, that is in fact with Miss Lamb, although their relationship is rather frighteningly childish, based on a shared delight in collecting shells and seaweed along the seashore. Now, one certainly cannot accuse the more recent TV adaptation of Sanditon, a first series in 2019 and a further continuation this year, of failing to moralise. But its pronouncements are neither fresh nor subtle, nor solidly embedded in the drama, rather than scheduled in as set-piece vignettes. The dramatization does make more of Miss Lamb's blackness with intermittent references back to the Caribbean and introducing the storyline of a sugar boycott organized by Miss Lamb to series two. That's done explicitly to atone for the fact that her wealth comes from the plantation's accumulated profits. In the case of Charlotte Hayward, the two seri TV series are ostentatiously anti-romantic as at the end of both, the proposals of marriage she anticipates 
are thwarted by the men she has come to love being manipulated into abandoning her. Georgiana Lamb, as she is now called, is indeed also characterized first and foremost as an independently minded and in her case, financially powerful young woman in a male run society in which all of the male characters are either scoundrels or fools if to varying degrees. Now, I had thought I would make more of the various continuations of Sanditon in a discussion of the concept of reframing with which I began, but I have come to the conclusion that only by straining the material to the extreme could one escape the conclusion that in this case, authors and dramatists have a very long way still to go. In terms of crafting honest and convincing multi and interracial literature and drama, these are flimsy in comparison with many of those works that um, Isis was able to introduce us to um, just now, um, of which it is, to be honest, De Derek Walcott's Omeros that I know best. That adds to the emphasis due to Jane Austen's own intuitive but principled reframing of the West Indian dimension to British life as she knew it. What she could do inevitably had its limits. But that is precisely how any frame works. And let us highlight the fact that her reframing was dynamic and not only prescribed, but was a process that was cut off with her untimely death. In terms of critical approach, my concern is not to rank novels, dramas, or poems in terms of their success or failure against this evaluative criterion in a classic Levisite manner. What matters is the potential value of the phenomenon of framing in conjunction with an incessant process configuring a relationship between past, present, and future. It really does not matter either that even Derek Walcott's writings could up cover only so much. The point of the process is departing from a point of fossilized fracture or rupture, not reaching a predetermined end. That is how I think I can best understand Emmanuel Chaudhuri Izzy's emphasis on time in motion as an essential strength of post-colonial African literature and his rejection of an objectification, as he calls it, of history. That objectification cannot mean indifference to objectivity in distinguishing truth from falsehood or probability from improbability, but it does resist the creation of a past that is just an inert object from which the present is disconnected. Reframing is also a constructive process in a literary critical perspective. The post-colonialism of Edward Said and the contributors to the post-colonial Jane Austen identified relevant material and made propositions to launch a debate. To cut to the chase though, I would suggest that, not least in the context of this one day conference, the most important of the many things I came to perceive much better, just as a result of the preparatory exchanges with the other contributors, is how productive the valorization of multiple layers of discourse should be. In Jane Austen's case, this means recognizing the distinctness and the significance of conversation as a regular and so mode of social and verbal interaction with its own rules. With that goes the extreme practical importance of letter writing, in relation to which current studies are indeed demonstrating and emphasizing conscious attempts to connect the familiar letter with familiar conversation in the later 18th century. From those considerations, a potential link to the vital importance of the huge range of oral genres and their reception, oral tradition and oralized memory, storytelling and rhetoric, performances and their context must surely be where the otherwise highly divergent subjects of a Regency period English novelist and both contemporary and Regent Caribbean culture may effectively join to the benefit of both, but with more surely to flow from a relatively highly oralized context to the more extensively literate one. Common issues to address, for instance, are how one can access and study oral material when any medium of recording must fundamentally change the authentic delivery and its true context. What are the criteria for determining forms of validity of things said, or inevitably, what is understood to have been said, and that latter either by members of a primary audience 
who are therefore in a position to transmit their perceptions or by those who subsequently encounter some report of the event. Now, I don't know the answers to those questions. Perhaps they are in the end unanswerable. And conceivably, they are as questions less significant than they currently appear to be to me. Equally, there are no specific and concrete conclusions characterizing either Jane Austen or the fuller social, economic, and cultural context of the middle and upper classes in Britain in the later 18th and early 19th century that I've been aiming to reach or want to draw. I'm entirely satisfied with the objective of this research and the opportunity to present it for discussion, like this conference as a whole, being to open up areas for shared, comparative, and collaborative study and debate, and that focus constructive on what truly is a common human history, if also a history of grievous divisions wherever one looks. And there is no reason to forget, with all of this, that Jane Austen, as indeed again some of the um, very recent authors that Isis um, referred to, uh, didn't insist on excessive earnestness and pain but was also a kind and a witty novelist who really did seek to entertain the readership. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm, ha I'm hoping rather than Matt having to get up, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you, John. That was very interesting. Um, looking at, as you've outlined, George, her father, George, having, um, uh, having uh, been a trustee on an estate in Antigua, her brother, Charles, having some involvement in Jamaica at a time when it was under slavery, and also giving, taking into consideration that Jane Austen herself seemed to have been very much against the institution of slavery through her praise of Thomas Clarkson, the abolitionist. Is it fair to say that, in your opinion, that Jane Austen might have been exercising her concerns about her family involvement with the institution of slavery by putting these references to how slaves were treated in her novels? Or was it rather just a case that slavery was so much a part of the fabric of British life at the time through the British Empire that this was what they normally spoke about around the dinner table in an upper class, um, upper middle class British family? I, I, I think in some ways, um, all of these things to different degrees, and I would probably actually try and summarize it myself in a slightly different position um, that is in the middle of that. One thing I think I would, I would add as a key um, perspective um, to those points is that I think Jane Austen was very conscious of being part of a generation which had different values, including a much greater repugnance to what was to the situation in the Caribbean and the facts of the transatlantic slave trade than the generation of her parents and the society that they had been brought, born up, brought, born and brought up um, within. Um, now, one detail that I didn't um, bring in here, though it's been noted before, within her letters after the, the death of her father, she refers to the fact that one of the family possessions is there is a portrait of James Langford Nibs. Um, and just in a sort of almost throwaway line, she says, I don't know what on earth we're going to do with that. And you can read all sorts of things into that. You can write it, oh, it's an absolutely hideous you know, picture. We don't, we don't want it anywhere. Or it's, oh, well, father was just very fond of James Langford, you know, of, 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 of James. Um, after all, and we're now far more embarrassed about him or, or whatever. You, you, know, you could read into what she actually says, um, whatever you choose in a way. But I think that that sense of there being a new generation and that there is a, a new way of thinking. Actually, Charles, who served with the Royal Navy 
um, in the in the Caribbean was as explicitly and clearly um, anti-slavery and condemning um, the, and the, the, the continuation of uh, enslavement after the abolition of the slave trade was, you know, was as active and as clear uh, in condemning that um, as Jane was. Uh, more so, but then again, let's remember the conventions of the time for a man. It was easier to express one's um, views of that kind publicly. Women were very, very influential in a lot of ways, but would operate more in the areas that were that were open for women to to operate within, which would indeed be things like parlor conversation, letter writing, um, and and so on. So we have to bring those things together. So so I think you're right. There 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 there, there, there is embarrassment. There is a sense. There's a lot going on in the background which doesn't quite belong in the novels, but is um, is brought into there. I, I, I am very conscious of how attitudes change from the middle of the 18th century to the end of the 18th century in British um, society amongst thinking and responsible um, people from a sort of, oh, it happens, but it's a long way away and it's nothing really very much to do with this, to a sense of really we are responsible for this and we must you know, do what we can about it. I'm so sorry. I'll just have a drink. Um, it's really more a comment, I think, than a question. But just just picking up on what you were saying, I wonder what you think about um, the the movement in Mansfield Park, where obviously the house Mansfield Park we know is being supported. Um, by uh, the economics um, of slavery. And we know, we see the sons go off um, to run those slave-run slave, uh, plantations. But of course, the heroine at the end, Fanny and Edmund, when they marry and become the sort of inheritors of the family, they move away from Mansfield Park, don't they? They, they, uh, they take on the, the living um, yes. somewhere else. Um, and I wonder if you, I, I mean, I, I just wonder what you think about that, the fact that they don't um, inherit the house that is built uh, on it's, slave it's money. It's implied that they will eventually, you know, and 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 do um, eventually. But but yes, it's quite true, you know, the, that that moving on to the um, living is, you know, does it does it detaches them from Man Mansfield Park um, for a bit. Um, remember that Jane Austen herself claimed that the the theme of Mansfield Park was ordination. It was about becoming a clergyman and, you know, how to be a, a model. Clergyman. We've got letters uh, again in the collection of letters that show that it was the most popular novel she published in her lifetime because people recognized that clear moral storyline within it, which really spoke to what they were familiar with in their um, actual lives um, within that way. The other side of that, of, of course, is precisely the point that. You know, equally, Jane Austen is not William Cobbett. He, she is not a radical writer who is explaining just what life is, is like for the rural poor um, and the the various welfare systems that are depressing agricultural. Um, for her, it is still a, an idealized situation where you have you know the, the rich go round um, dispensing um, charity. Um, to the needy poor, and in particular, it is the clergyman, the parish clergyman, who's responsible for for, for organising that. So I think you know, I think you're absolutely right. It does draw attention to a lot of other compromises uh, within her, with without those, with within what she actually puts in the novels, without the issues that need that compromises needs to be addressed towards. You know, remaining very very clear. Thank you so much. A uh, round of applause once again for John. And I'm sure if there are any other questions, he would be happy to engage you over a cup of tea. Our tea break is very short, um, but I think that's fine. We will meet again uh, at midday exactly to start uh, the next session.
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Which one is it? She's putting it in. Okay, so I don't need that.
the door for us. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so we're moving right along with uh, our next session of uh, for the presentations. And um, this paper that we're about to hear actually is um, very specific on Derek Walcott, whose name has been invoked already uh, twice uh, so far by both Isis and John in their presentations. So uh, I think that was sort of a prelude to, in some senses, to the paper we're about to hear. And the paper will be delivered uh, from Linda Grant, one of the co-conveners of today's conference. Uh, Linda has taught at Royal Holloway, Birkbeck, Queen Mary, and University of London. And her research interests are in poetry, classical reception, and translation in the broadest sense. She has written on how to think methodologically about textual receptions and literary dialogues across time and geographies on gender and genre, including epic, and the textual representations of bodies and voices. She's currently working on a book on Shakespeare's bodies. And her paper, as you see on the screen, is titled Derek Walcott's Omarus Rewriting Classical Epic Hybridity and the Creation of Both. Linda? Uh, thank you very much for that, Matthew. Um, and um, it's probably worth saying that I've been fascinated so far that just hearing uh, the other papers, um, there are so many points of contact um, and dialogue uh, with some of the things that I'm planning to say today. So in this paper, I want to think about Derek Walcott's Omeros and his rewriting um, of classical Greek uh, epic poems of Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And the keynote of my reading of Walcott's Omeros today is ambivalence and complexity. There's a sort of push-pull tension, I think, in the ways that Walcott responds to Homer and classical Greek and Roman texts more widely. He both aligns himself with them and yet also struggles against them. And a particular source of anxiety is the way that at various points in history and within certain communities, including for us today, the very concept of classical Greek and Roman culture is at least partially imbued with negative values of elitism, snobbery, and exclusivity, a capacity for division, for creating an us and them that is both socially harmful and frankly quite nasty, but which also cuts us off potentially from a source of artistic and aesthetic pleasure. Now, Walcott's poem engages both implicitly and explicitly with this positioning of classics, and it refuses to be seen in any way as a belated or an inferior imitator. Instead, his poem equalizes the relationship and uses classical Greek epic as a springboard for a narrative poem that naturalizes Caribbean history, geography, its people and cultures as a legitimate subject for such a majestic narrative. Omeros too plays a key role in Walcott's own global recognition as a poet of stature, as evinced by his 1992 Nobel Prize for Literature. And I especially want to think about how Walcott's Omeros thematizes the concepts of hybridity and how it stages or performs a creation of poem. Now, um, as a reminder, Homer's Iliad is a war poem set during the 10 year siege of Troy, featuring the conflict between the warriors Achilles and Hector, names that Walcott uh, reuses for his St. Lucian fishermen in Omeros. And it's also based on the mythic struggle over which man owns the beautiful Helen, a plot line that also reappears in Omeros. Homer's uh, Odyssey, follows Odysseus on his trouble journey back from Troy to his home on the island of Ithaca. And Walcott is certainly not the first writer to reuse Homer's Iliad and Odyssey in the context of contemporary culture. And I've just put some examples up here. Um, we can think, for example, of the recent popular A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, 2019, uh, the blockbuster film Troy, uh, 2000, um, the more cult Coen Brothers film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, uh, 
sorry, Troy was 2004, um, this was 2000. And one of my personal favorites, Margaret Atwood's uh, brilliantly witty and cutting Penelopead, uh, 2005, um, as well as Toni Morrison's, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as Toni Morrison's powerful home um, in 2012, which shifts Odysseus's homecoming from a Greek warrior struggling to get back from the Trojan War to a black American GI returning to his home in Georgia after fighting in the Korean War. Um, and this is certainly not an inclusive list. I'm sure you can think of very uh, many books that uh, engage with Homer. Um, for Walcott's readers, uh, his Homer, his Omeros, 1990, is therefore in dialogue, not just with Homer's own texts, but with various and multiplicitous storytelling traditions, some of which come after his poem. Now, obviously we don't consume literature or read literature in chronological order. So Omeros is as much in conversation with later Homeric perceptions as it is with ones which predate his own creation. Now, Walcott himself has particularly singled out James Joyce's Ulysses as a point of Homeric contact in the creation of his own poem. Joyce's modernist novel was first serialized between 1918 and 1920 uh, and was published in 1922 as a complete book. It thus coincides with the struggle for Irish independence from British colonial rule, from the Easter Uprising of 1916, through the War of Irish Independence, 1919 to 1921, and the creation of the Irish Free State in 1922. So like Omeros, Ulysses is crucially concerned with issues of national identity, language, resistance to imperialism, and a psychic struggle with a history of oppression and generational trauma. It also innovates linguistically to create a new language through which to articulate a national Irish consciousness. And even while one of Joyce's great protagonists is Leopold Bloom, a man born in Dublin to a Jewish father, who struggles with the racism and anti-Semitism of some of his compatriots, and who is also on a search for something that he calls home. And I'm just going to look at a, a quick example um, from Joyce's Ulysses. Um, this is from uh, chapter 12. Leopold Bloom is in a Dublin pub. And as the drinking proceeds, he's drawn into conversation um, about nationalism and identity. So persecution, says he, all the history of the world is full of it, perpetuating national hatred among nations. But do you know what a nation means, says John Wise. A nation, says Bloom, a nation is the same people living in the same place. Uh, and then a little break. What is your nation, if I may ask, says the citizen. Ireland, says Bloom. I was born here, Ireland. The citizen said nothing, only cleared the spit out of his gullet and gob he spat. Now we'll come back to this issue about the connection between epic as a genre um, and the conception of nation and the, the sort of the vexed relationship between form and content. But first I want to contextualize what it might mean for a modern writer to self-consciously attach himself as both Joyce and Walcott do to what we might broadly call the classical tradition. Now I've put those words, the classical tradition, um, in uh, scare quotes. Um, and this is because classicists today deconstruct terms such as tradition, which have tended traditionally and historically to be passed as essentially conservative and exclusive, and to be seen as white and European, as well as overly gendered masculine. Now this is changing. And the whole landscape of classical reception studies explores the ways in which texts, ideas, and artifacts are in constant dialogue with Greek and Roman precedents. Um, and this is a hugely vibrant subsector in the discipline of classics, and also a self-consciously inclusive, global, and increasingly diverse subsector. Now, I've noted some scholarly works on here for anybody who might be interested um, in this, and they're mostly focused on uh, African-American writing. Um, and personally, I'm especially interested in the way in which Toni Morrison um, reuses classics, 
from Medea and Greek tragedy more widely in her stunning beloved uh, to the Odyssey, as already mentioned um, in her novel, Home. Now, Walcott himself um, has rather subversively redefined tradition as something which is, quote, alert, alive, simultaneous. Um, and he is conspicuously moving away from those cliches of classical texts as dead languages and dusty books that nobody reads. Um, what he says um, is what is needed is not new names for old things or old names for old things, but the faith of using old names anew. So what he's advocating here is a revitalizing of the use and reception of classics that is positive, broad, and culturally inclusive, even I'd suggest transformative. Now, Walcott's Omeros, published in 1990, um, is, as we can see from the dates of these scholarly works, um, and again, these are just a few random examples, um, it was written ahead of this major reorientation um, within the academy. But I would argue that classical texts themselves, including epic, have never been as reactionary and conservative as some scholars, commentators, and readers have either liked to assume or have wanted them to be. Greek and Roman literature, I'd argue, already contains the traces of transgressions that make them such productive tools with which to think. And uh, a few little examples here. Now, the first quotation I'm going to give you is um, Achilles, the warrior, speaking in the Odyssey. And he says, O shining Odysseus, never try to console me for dying. I would rather follow the plow as thrall to another man, one with no land allotted him and not much to live on, than to be king over all the perished dead. Now, a little bit of context here in order to, to, to kind of really understand what's, um, why this is so transgressive. Um, the context is that Homer's Iliad is built on an ideal of what the Greeks called Kalos Thanatos, beautiful death. Um, and this is, a, this is a sort of a war culture which immortalizes dead warriors through poetry and memory. So what it's basically saying is, it doesn't matter if you die young because we'll remember you forever um, through our songs. But what we see here is that Achilles, the greatest of the Greek warriors, doesn't want to, doesn't want to buy into that. He says he would rather be a thrall, a servant, a slave, a captive to a poor landless man than king of the underworld or king of the dead. He would rather be alive and poor than a dead warrior who's immortalized. Um, so the Odyssey completely underlines the warrior ethos uh, that claims to die young in battle is to engender an enduring flame. It collapses this cultural ideal completely upon which its companion poem, the Iliad, is built. It interrogates all the values that the Iliad is built on and stands for. Okay, let's move on to think about uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Now, um, there's a, a very conventional way of reading this as the great kind of legitimator um, of empire. However, it's a classical epic uh, from Rome that tells of the destruction of Troy from the position of the Trojans. Um, it's a war in uh, what is now Turkey. The women are raped and enslaved. Boy children are killed so that they cannot rise up and regroup against the oppressors. And the survivors limp away on ships from their fallen city to spread out all over the Mediterranean before a small group fight for land in Italy where they eventually found a city that will become Rome. So I would say that this is also a great poem of defeat, of diaspora, and of large scale migration. It gives the Romans a mythical origin in the non-European Near East. So again, really quite transgressive there, and that's not always the way that um, it is perceived traditionally. Uh, my third example, uh, Penelope, the wife of Odysseus and the archetype um, of the good and faithful wife. Um, but she's also, interestingly, the gatekeeper of Odysseus's bed which is also the literal as well as the metaphorical pillar 
on which his house and thus his kingship of Ithaca is built. So even though he physically reaches home, he's not fully home um, until Penelope tests him and accepts him back into her bed as her husband. And it's not until he's reinstated as a husband that he can also resume his place as head of the household and ruler of Ithaca. So again, there's kind of quite, quite, a, concert, quite a, a subversive way in which that role of women is presented there. Now, the point that I'm making here is that classical literature and classical epic is more capacious and more transgressive at times than it may appear or than it may be in commentators' interests for it to be. It's full of what we think of as alternative vo uh, voices. And it's this capacity for subversion, for overturning positions of hegemony and authority that make it such a fruitful source for writers such as Toni Morrison, Margaret Atwood, James Joyce, and Walcott himself. It has a kind of um, what I call strategic ambivalence that allows it to be both a pillar of the establishment and a simultaneous site for subversive potential. So let's turn to Walcott and Omros uh, with some of these ideas in mind. So Sir Derek Alton Walcott, 1930 to 2017, a St. Lucian poet and playwright, um, received the 1992 Nobel Prize in Literature and a whole host of literary awards both before and after that, um, which I've listed there. Now, both Walcott's parents, as I'm sure everybody is well aware, like many St. Lucians, was the products of, uh, sorry, his parents were the product of racially mixed marriages. And one of the themes that pervades his work is this paradox of identity intrinsic to his Caribbean life. He was a mixed race poet living on a British ruled island whose people spoke French based Creole mixed with English. But identity in his work is not a puzzle to be solved or to be resolved. It's a factor in the positive embracing of hybridity that characterizes his poetry on so many levels, not least the linguistic, as we'll see. And we can see how this kind of picks up on some of the ideas that um, Isis was talking about earlier. Okay, so his Omeros, published in 1990, um, an epic poem in seven books. But what do we mean when we speak of an epic poem? So epic is about more than just length. As a genre, it tends to be associated with a national or a community mythology to have something of an origin story about it. The Iliad and Odyssey were both originally oral poetry, um, dating to probably around the eighth century BCE, composed and recomposed with each performance and not written down until uh, the sixth century BCE. Um, and they interrogate ideas of Greekness um, at a time when Greece didn't exist as a country um, and was essentially a collection of warring city-states held together by a shared language and a shared religion. Now, Walcott takes elements of both the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, he reuses the names um, of Iliadic characters, uh, his Achille, Hector, Helen, as well as the surface shaping narrative of a struggle over a woman. But he also adopts the more diffuse journey structure of the Odyssey with its focus on how to get home. But beyond Homer, Omeros adopts the form and meter of Dante's epic, The Divine Comedy. It's written in terza rima, a difficult form of writing. It's written in rhyming triplets or three line verses and mingles in references to a whole host of other works uh, by classical authors. So we can find traces of Apollonius of Rhodes, Sophocles, Virgil, Ovid, I could go on. Now, one of the triumphs I'd say of Homeros is how lightly Walcott wears his undoubted learning. He never leaves readers feeling stranded in his poem or feeling that they don't understand what he's talking about. So he makes this classical learning um, intrinsic to his poem and accessible. Um, now, for the ancient Greeks and Romans, genre was primarily defined and understood by a poetic meter. And so one of the characteristics of epic was that it was written in hexameters, so 12-foot lines, 
um, that in Greek and Roman uh, literature never rhymed. It's a stately, grave, majestic meter suitable for a uh, matter of great import, though Homer also uses it for the more prosaic and common, comic moments uh, in the Odyssey. Now, Walcott again takes a free and creatively disruptive approach in his epic. He mixes up meter. He switches from iambic hexameter to a fluid form of free verse with a shift into rhyming couplets for a key moment that we'll look at a little bit more closely later in this talk. The result is an intervention, not just into classical Greek, Greek epic, but a more self-conscious creativity that inserts itself into a whole Western canon, from Homer to Dante, a little bit of Milton's Paradise Lost in there as well. Walcott himself is completely at home in this canonical space. And like a Picasso, he makes himself master of the conventions before upending them to his own post-colonial Caribbean vision. So the very form of this book is itself a form of hybridity that both respects, but also disrupts the canonical, that wrenches it into a new form and has continuities with the past, as well as launching into a new literary space of its own. Now, Seamus Haney, uh, a very sensitive reader, I think, of Walcott and an Irish poet with his own international reputation, uh, puts it nicely, I think, in this way. Derek Walcott has moved with gradually deepening confidence to found his own poetic domain independent of the tradition he inherited, yet not altogether orphaned from it. And I think that chimes quite nicely with some of the things that Isis was talking about um, earlier. So what Omeros is doing is assimilating a distinctively Caribbean epic back into what has been configured as a Western tradition. But that assimilation or cultural synthesis is itself seen in the book as reflective of the intrinsically hybrid nature of Caribbean cultures to which Walcott sees himself the heir. His poetry offers, offers up a celebration of difference, even while it asserts a sameness or a continuity. It sees art as creative and nurturing and makes the connection between cultural hybridity and literary innovation. Uh, so, what does it mean that his poem is titled Omeros? So, Omeros is the Greek name for Homer. So, already the poem is bringing up ideas of who has the power to name something, of a return to origins and a decentering of a westernizing narrative that might obscure other perspectives. Homer himself was, if he existed as a historic persona, um, likely to have been a colonial subject living in a Greek settlement in what is now Turkey. So I'd like to suggest that Omeros is the muse of this poem, a replacement for the conventional um, presiding deity um, which gives sanction to Walcott's vision and writing. Um, a, a significant rejection of the westernized Homer which sets in motion a programmatic agenda by which Walcott doesn't so much build on Western European epic as assimilate a Caribbean epic back into a literary history that has been manipulated to deliberately obscure and marginalize non-white, subaltern, and non-elite voices. Um, and I should just say here, just very quickly, uh, that term subaltern is used in post-colonial studies <clears throat> excuse me, and designates and identifies colonial populations who were socially, politically, and geographically excluded from the hierarchy of power of an imperial colony and from the metropolitan homeland of an empire. Um, now, it's not an ideal term. It doesn't differentiate, for example, between the power given to imperial men versus imperial women. Um, it doesn't really account for the, the status of people of mixed race or for women such as Jean Rhys, also mentioned uh, earlier today, who writes about that in-between status of white West Indians and who herself never feels fully at home, either in her native Dominica or in the UK. It also doesn't help us understand the differentiation between, in Walcott's case, Caribbean male and Caribbean female characters. 
And so one of the questions that I have um, about Omeros is to what extent it might be conceived of as a masculine epic. Now, there are certainly important female characters at the plot level of Omeros. Helen, around whom the struggle between Achille and Hector is fashioned. Mark Kilman, the Circe-like um, healing woman. But importantly, we don't get inside their heads or experience what life is like for them in the way that we do for the male characters in Omeros. Helen, I think, is especially problematic because Helen is also a name for St. Lucia itself, um, an island which was contested between the British and French um, uh, empires, just as the character Helen is contested by two men. Now, this metaphor of women as land is a common and very pernicious one, I think, throughout literature. Women as land are invaded, violated, occupied, and owned. They're looked at, and they don't have the capacity to look back. Quite late um, in uh, Omeros, uh, this is how uh, the narrator describes her. He says, why not see Helen as the sun saw her? with no Homeric shadow, swinging her plastic sandals on that beach alone, as fresh as the sea wind. Now, this is interesting because it kind of pulls her away from, um, from that idea of precedence. Um, so he says, let's see her without that Homeric shadow. But I think the important thing here is that we're asked to see Helen. And I think this again goes back to what Isis was saying um, about Rihanna that idea of the male gaze, this, this woman who is an object to be looked at, who has no power um, to look back. It's something that I find quite troubling um, about this poem. Now, epic is primarily a male author genre, although there have been women um, who've written epic. Um, and this is precisely one of the points that Margaret Atwood picks up in her Penelope ad. Um, and this writing out a female experience in both Walcott's evolution of St. Lucia's troubled history, as well as the present tense of the poem, is made especially clear in an episode in book three, when Achille follows a swift, a bird, into a dream vision of a return to Africa and the generational trauma at the heart of this poem, the experience of being captured by slavers. So at the end of book two, um, Achille, who is a St. Lucian fisherman, is sailing when he sees, uh, quote, he saw the ghost of his father's face. Then for the first time, he asked himself who he was. Now this questioning of identity, of where he's come from and what his history is, is precipitated by this vision of Achille's father, a personification of history, which is decisively gendered masculine. His ancestry appears to center on his father only, not also on his mother. So Akil follows this swift in a vision that takes him back to Africa, a journey through both time and space, where he finds a man, quote, and he knew him by that walk, it was himself in his father. So we have this layering um, of a sort of personal, familial um, identity, which is also a form of racial memory and racial history. Um, now we have a distinctively Miltonic uh, paradise lost moment that recalls how uh, Milton's Adam, the first man, is given the privilege by God to name the things of the world. So Achilles' father, when he meets his son uh, from the future, prompts a conversation um, about the power and loss encompassed in naming. He says, um, in the place you have come from, what do they call you? Um, so Akil here has lost his ancestral African name and has been renamed as the Homerically derived Akil, placing him into a different narrative from that of his father. Um, and as this Africa episode um, proceeds, um, Akil is captured by a raid of slavers. The raid was profitable, the poem tells us. It yielded 15 slaves to the slavers waiting up the coast. And then we get this moment when time stops and merges. Um, so Akil, 
He foresaw their future. He knew nothing could change it. The tinkle of coins of the river, the tinkle of irons. The son's grief was the father's, the father's his son's. Now, without wanting to distract from that moment of generational mourning, the question that I can't help asking myself is what about the grief of women? What about women, daughters, sisters? This, this grief that is shared between the son and the father um, just seems very problematically masculine um, to me. But I, the question that I equally ask myself um, is would I equally problematize the idea of a male poet appropriating female experience that he doesn't directly um, experience? Um, does, but does that make it right that the poem bypasses female experience completely? Uh, gendering this generational trauma is masculine. I really don't know what it is that I want. Um, I just know that I'm troubled and I would be really interested um, to get some feedback um, from all of you at the end about what you think about um, this, this kind of exclusion of women. Now, Supporting Akil um, in his uncanny voyage back into this traumatic past is the figure of Philoctete. On the literal plot level, Philoctete is also a fisherman. Um, he's been wounded in the foot by an anchor and prevented from working. Mark Kilman and Akil are searching for a cure. But on a symbolic level, um, Philoctete embodies, I think, the psychic wounds of enslavement, exile and colonialism. The Greek original um, is a mere mention in Homer and the main extant source we have is Sophocles play uh, Philoctetes. Um, and the mythical story is a prophecy that the Greeks will not be able to destroy Troy without the bow and arrows of which Philoctetes is the guardian. And so Odysseus goes off to find him um, to, to get these bows and arrows and Troy falls. The original then is a weapon in a war of aggression. His actions precipitate the fall of Troy um, and bring on the destruction, genocide, and mass rape and enslavement that follow that Greek victory. Walcott's poem resists and inverts this dynamic, focusing on his philoctety as the embodiment of the wounds of history that echo throughout the Caribbean. The pressure to move towards a form of healing becomes even more important in Walcott's vision. And when it happens in the poem, it's a joint endeavor between Akil and Mark Hillman. Now the import of this episode is central, I think, to the poem. As the Jamaican poet, Philip uh, Sherlock said, colonialism, however important, was an incident in the history of Nigeria and Ghana, Kenya and Uganda, but it is the whole history of the West Indies. So Walcott, I think, embodies the wounds of Caribbean history in his Philoctety. Nevertheless, the powerful, however powerful Walcott's analysis and depiction of the wounds of history, this poem, and I'd suggest Walcott's vision across his work, is one of healing, assimilation, and integration. After Akil has his psychic journey into Africa and his racial past, he's content to return to his Caribbean present. Africa is actually shown to be quite mysterious to him. And with a sly and mischievous humor, Walcott writes of his strangeness when faced with crocodiles and hippopotamuses. Hippopotami, I'm not quite sure. Um, quote, it was like the African movies he had yelped at in childhood. So he learns from his father what his original African name was, but returns to the present, content to be a keel, having come to terms with his history. And the point that I think Walcott is making here is not a rejection of the past and the losses of exile and enslavement, but an assimilation of that past into an accommodation with the present. This episode seems to imply that Akil acknowledges his lost African life, but can still embrace it as something that is a part of his inheritance, just as his father is dead, but is still with and in him. That his African cultural inheritance is an intrinsic part of his Caribbeanness, 
not lost, but a part of that hybridity that we've been discussing in various terms. As the scholar uh, Paula Burnett puts it, against the perception of, of tragic Caribbean loss, Walcott asserts the counter view that the ancestral cultures are not lost, but adapt and survive, learning to root themselves in a different soil, which then becomes powerfully native. Now, Walcott proposes um, a holistic unity that is possible for his St. Lucian characters and for his vision of this poem. And this powerful position is claimed by the poet um, is another characteristic of epic. The term for the epic poet used in Latin is vates, meaning seer or prophet, as well as philosopher. And Walcott himself said, quote, a good poet is the proprietor of the experience of the race. He is and always has been the vessel, vates, rainmaker, the conscience of the king and the embodiment of society, even when society is unable to contain him. Now, this isn't always an unproblematic stance enabled by epic. Certainly, it's a genre which can be appropriated to quite disturbing nationalist narratives that exclude certain groups and communities. And a pertinent example here is the Kosovo cycle, which was disinterred during the Balkan Wars in the 1990s and was used to demonize certain populations um, and uh, enable genocide in the name of patriotism. But that's clearly not a position that Walcott's poem takes. He instead inserts himself into his poem as a character in order to embrace the wider stories of indigenous peoples and cultures oppressed by imperialism and colonialism. In this poem, we see him uh, sort of disinterring the Caribs, the Arawaks of the Caribbean, but also Native Americans when he travels to the US. Um, so he widens out his epic beyond the Caribbean to offer a humane accounting of the brutalities of colonialism. And this leads to my final point, where Walcott's poem takes on a kind of magic or shamanistic role and creates a home on the page. That freighted work throughout so much of this discussion through the metamorphic power of words. And this takes place in book four, chapter 33, section three, if anybody wants the details, and I'm going to quote it in full. House of umbrage, house of fear, house of multiplying air, house of memories that grow like shadows out of Alan Poe, house where marriages go bust, house of telephone and lust, house of caves behind whose doors a wave is crouching with its roar, House of toothbrush, house of sin, of branches scratching, let me in. House whose rooms echo with rain, of wrinkled clouds with on and stain. House that creaks, age 57, wooden earth and plaster heaven. House of channeled cable vision, whose dragoned carpets sneer derision. Unlucky house that I uncurse by rights of genuflecting verse. House I unhouse house that can harden as cold as stones in the lost garden, house where I look down the scorched street but feel its ice ascend my feet. I do not live in you, I bear my house inside me everywhere, until your winters grow more kind by the dancing firelight of mind, where knobs of brass do not exist, whose doors dissolve with tenderness, House that lets in at last those fears that are its guests to sit on chairs, feasts on their human faces and takes pity simply by the hand, shows her her room and feels the hum of wood and brick becoming home. Now there are some key turning points that I just want to draw your attention to. Um, the start, house of umbrage, house of fear. Um, but by the end of that first column um, on my slide, um, the poet takes control, unlucky house that I uncurse by rights of genuflecting verse. And that, that role of poetry is really important here, I think. Um, also, the, the move towards um, that end um, with his idea of uh, wooden bricks becoming home. So the magic is a literary one. It's a metamorphic act of transformation 
through the power of poetry and words. So in summary then, um, what Walcott I think has done through Omaros is to valorize and legitimate uh, legitimate Caribbean and specifically St. Lucian history and place it as the equal and equivalent of Homer's Troy, Virgil's search for a place that will become Rome, Dante's heaven and hell, and Milton's Eden. And one of the many things I love about this poem is its sense of being unfinished, of still being on a journey. This incantation that I've read ends with that becoming home and an image of continuing process and the poem too ends on this note of progress and development still to come. The final line is, quote, when he left the beach, the sea was still going on. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, Linda. Lots of provocative things raised in it. Um, we have time for some questions. Uh, Please indicate by a show of hand and uh, introduce yourself, those who are in the room. And also, I'll keep an eye out for any questions coming in from online. John? Yeah, thank you very much, um, John Hines. Linda, we've touched on this um, before. A third, in my view, major female character in Omaros is Maud Plunkett. And I find Major Plunkett and Maud Plunkett particularly interesting i find it very easy to create an explanation of the sympathy between derek walcott as the author and indeed walcott as a narrator within the poem um, and major plunkett that they're essentially similarly sympathetic characters understanding men of the same age as well which does seem to um help it but and yet it, it seems to me as if maud plunkett interestingly in relation to the dependency on James Joyce, presented as an Irish woman, um, is a female character that somehow Walcott was able to encompass and, in my view, was actually less scared of as a character that he had created than Mark Illman um, or Helen. What do you think about that? Yeah, interesting question. I mean, I, 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 mean, I think you're absolutely right about. I think the Irishness of the Plunkets is is really important uh, because Walcott had talked about uh, the Irish of victims of uh, particularly British colonialism in the same way um, as the Caribbean. So I, I think he does have um, some kind of sympathy, and it, it is interesting that obviously they are a white couple who are thinking about their history um, with the Caribbean as well. I would still argue though, that we don't actually understand uh, very much about the kind of interiority um, of, uh, of Maud Plunkett in the way that, that we kind of get inside the lives of the male characters. You know, we experience, um, we experience their lives and, and Major Plunkett is interesting because he's also looking for, he's looking for a lost ancestor, isn't he? The, the, the guy who get, who's drowned, um, who Akil kind of sees in, in that vision. So again, there's that kind of ancestry as being sort of primarily really gendered masculine um, as he's also looking for, you know, for a lost person. So, um, I mean, obviously he does have, you know, he, he has female characters. I think it's to do with, with the level at which he um, sh allows us to live through those characters. Um, and obviously, you know, I mean, we, we are cross-gendered in the way that we read, you know, as, as women, um, we, of course, we, we experience, you know, the experience of male characters. We don't only have to um, experience female lives, but it just seems quite marked to me um, that, that there is this kind of differential um, between the way that the characters um, are presented. But as I said in my paper, um, you know, I, I, I find it kind of problematic anyway, because I'm not quite sure what it is I want him to do um, in, in terms of do I want him to kind of inhabit female lives that he hasn't lived? Do I want him to kind of say, this is what mothers feel or daughters feel, you know, if, if that's not something he's experienced. And that's something I'd really like to turn back to the room, actually, um, from both, you know, male and female readers about that. I mean, does anybody else find that um, potentially problematic, either in Omeros or in other literature, um, or has identified that as something uh, that is perhaps slightly worrying? Oh, hi there, thanks very much. I mean, my name's uh, Kevin, Kevin Charles. I'm a lawyer, but grew up on a diet of Caribbean literature. Um, 
I think I want to contrast it with Sam Sevlon and um, his Lonely Lond mm. Londoners book, and that's come in for um, some criticism, particularly in recent times, about the absence of uh, female voices and female um, figures and the depth, I guess, lack of depth of female figures and representation in that book. But for me, reading Sam Sevlon, I mean, I, I enjoyed it very much. And in fact, what I wanted to read was to hear about the Black Caribbean male experience. And I wanted to hear Sam Sevlon's voice and focus on that. And that's what he writes about. And, and, and I really got into that book and I really enjoyed that. And I didn't come away with a problematic feeling about the absence of uh, female voices or um, black women voices. And there are lots of books written by uh, black female writers centering and lauding and, and talking about the experience of black women. So for me, reading Sam Sevlon um, was refreshing. I didn't have any of those problematic uh, feelings about it. And I was pleased to read about that centering and that whole black male experience. And that's what it was about. And I thought he did that, that, that very well. And I don't know if similar kind of contrast can be made with Walcott. And just very, very briefly, you talked about, um, was it Akil and his relationship with his father? Well, that's what he was talking about. He, I think he wanted to get under that whole, you know, and we talk about role models and black male role models and the absence of role models for black males and the impact that that has. And he's talking about the experience of a black boy and his relationship with his father. And, and that was a focus. And I don't know if um, introducing other voices or female voice may have even diluted the sense of what he was trying to, to get across. But that was more of an observation from, I think you wanted to hear from a black male perspective. So there you are. Uh, thank you very much for that. That's I, I really appreciate that perspective, and I, I agree. I mean, so, uh, the Lonely London is, is 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 an amazing book, isn't it? Um, and um, you know, just 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 getting that uh, I just touched on this that lang the rhythm of the language as being English but not English is is just stunning. And he does. I mean, you know, he is really interesting about you know the way that he um, he creates those um, black female characters who are actually very strong characters but also can sometimes end up in quite brutalized relationships um, in terms of, you know, kind of being either patronized or actually being physically um, abused. Um, but yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, literature cannot do everything and it can't be, you know, everything to everybody. And that, that thing about individual voices, and I completely take your point about the, the idea about black, black masculinity as well. So thanks very much for that. Yeah. Um, hi, Malika Booker. Um, I would say as a, as a writer and as someone who has been an avid reader all my life of Caribbean literature, that that has been something problematic for me um, in terms of, especially with early texts when it was very male heavy, um, in terms of trying to find a space for my, ourselves um, and to see ourselves as respected of all ourselves. And I think that there is a reason why, um, and this is a personal thing, this, there's no studies about this, but I think there's a reason why a lot of readers like myself then kind of went to African-American female writers to kind of see that self-reflected. Um, so there is something problematic in that. And I do think, I, I, have, I think that the imagination is rich enough to imagine itself into different spaces and different bodies with empathy and also using emotion. Um, and so what I'm struck by in that is, is that same thing that I have with one of the most quintessential texts, which is the Bible, I'm struck by the begatting with no womb. And I'm struck by going back to a so-called motherland with, with just the father. So I hear your point, but for me, that is problematic. I don't know as well, like you, what I'm asking, what that's asking of the writer or whether it's just a critique because it's, it's a critique, um, not because of Derek Walcott alone, but because of a litany of male writers who perpetuate that and where the, the female character becomes kind of like a catalyst for something or is a background to make the male character fuller. So yeah. And I think, I mean, yeah, thank you for that. 
I think the other thing that, that particularly worries me about Walcott is the fact that he has that Nobel Prize. And so for readers who, um, you know, who may not be familiar with Caribbean literature, and I'm not particularly myself, um, if you're thinking about what you might want to read to read more diversely, Walcott is a key name that's going to come up, for, you know, and quite rightly so. Um, but because, you know, because of that Nobel Prize, it, it does to some extent, um, you know, he becomes a kind of stand in for Caribbean literature itself. So thanks for that, Malika. Hi, um, Angela Edwards. One of the comments that came up when Isis was doing her presentation was, whose words do we write, speak, scream? And one of the critiques that I've read for Omarus is that sometimes you're not sure who is speaking, which voice it is. And I remember when I saw that, I was thinking to myself, not just whose words do we write, but which voice do we use to write, to speak, to scream? And I'm just wondering whether it really makes a substantial difference, whether it was deliberate, that you are not sure from one point to another who the narrator actually is. Is that maybe reflective of not just an internal confusion amongst the characters in the, because I mean, they are characters, if you think of them, representational um, within the work and what was actually happening. You know, it's a wider reflection of what happens within the Caribbean or people of the Caribbean, even outside of the Caribbean. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a brilliant point. I mean, I think all of those things that you've said are absolutely the case. And I would also add to that as part of that kind of cacophony of voices that, that we can't necessarily distinguish is precisely this idea of, of the canon. You know, I mean, the fact that he's using Homer's voice and Virgil's voice and Sophocles' voice and Milton's voice um, which is, which is, you know, which is both a kind of, I mean, it could be seen as both a negative and a positive. I mean, on one hand, you can say, who is speaking here? On the other hand, he's speaking for everybody, um, I think. You know, he, I think that's one of the, the amazing things about, you know, Walcott, is the pure multi-layeredness um, of this poem. It's incredible. I mean, you can, you can almost take kind of every single word and, and you can kind of, you know, you can pull it apart and it means so many different things in different contexts to different people and the dialogues it's creating with different ideas and other different texts. So it really is such a kind of, you know, kind of polyvocal um, poem, I think, which is, which is why, you know, it's such a, a rich poem and you really can't kind of do justice to it in a, a 40 minute talk. Um, but so I, I, I would say that he's very conscious um, of voices and about the kind of the merging um, of voices both with characters, but also, um, you know, with Walcott himself, he inserts himself into the poem. So at one point, he's the kind of external narrator. At the other point, he's talking about things like, you know, when he goes off to study um, in the US. And I think he wants to, he wants us to embrace all of those different voices and the different meanings um, that they can represent. Thanks, Linda. That was a great talk. Um, it's provided me with some fuel for thought, food for thought, especially the question raised by um, Kevin, because I thoroughly enjoyed Samuel Selman's Lonely Londoners. But when Kevin talks about the lack of female voices, I didn't notice it at the time. But now when I think back, um, I realize that that novel, great as it was, didn't have much of a female voice. Could it be that Samuel Selman and... Derek Walcott are of a particular generation, which is very much a patriarchal generation. In contrast, uh, more recent writers like Kai Miller, for example, in his August Town, has some very strong female characters in his novel. Could that be a generational issue? And the second question is, does this show that there's a strong need for female representation within the literary canon? Because we see Jean Rhys, for example, when she write, wrote White Sargasso Sea, not only were there strong female characters, there were strong male characters as well. So there was more of a balance, but that probably reflects, does that probably reflect the realities of the patriarchal situation that you would in a female writer's novels, see strong, um, strong male characters along with strong female characters? 
Yeah, great question. Um, as to the generational thing, I, I, I would say yes, you know, and I think we can kind of see that, um, you know, across literature um, generally. Um, Jean Rhys is really interesting, isn't she? I mean, she, she's a, she is a fascinating um, writer and sort of everything that, that she does is, is, is very much done from that sort of position of the, the underdog um, in lots of ways, whether that's because of gender or that very complicated sort of racial positioning of, you know, being a, being a white West, Afri uh, West Indian who's kind of not really at, at home um, anyway. Um, the interesting thing about the, the male voices, I think, in, particularly in White Tech SOC, um, is that she kind of has no choice, does she? Because, because of her rewriting of Jane Eyre, you know, she's got to have, Rochester's got to be in there. But he's, he's I mean, he's a really interesting character in the way that he, he loses himself. You know, he, he's completely overwhelmed by the Caribbean and all of those kind of English values, be, you know, don't, don't have any standing. Um, and he has to kind of, you know, get, get his power back uh, by imposing himself um, on Antoinette. Um, and kind of on the land as well. Um, but I think you're absolutely right about, you know, kind of um, younger generations. I mean, Kai Miller is a, is a great example. Um, I'm also thinking of a book um, whose author I can't remember at the moment. Um, it's called Open Water. Um, and it was written just a couple of years ago um, by a, a black British uh, male writer who, who lives in London. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly tender novel um, and he he deals with those issues about black masculinity and about the vulnerability um, associated um, with that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think I think there is much more of a kind of opening up um, about you know challenging some of those entrenched kind of ideas of what gender means. Is it Kayla Fleming? Yes, I think it might be. Well done, Rebecca. <laughs> oh, thank I'm you. I'm just the one with the mic. Okay. Well, so, well, so I do have the mic. Um... But the, it's, it's a really good point that you raise about the absence. But I think <clears throat> one of the things is to problematize it a little bit more is if we have things in just for having them in and it's not accurate, mm. then that might become a bit more of a problem in itself. So representation generally needs to be understood. And you know, if you've got a male person putting it in and they haven't understood the experience of a female, that in itself may create a little bit of an issue as well. So it's something to think about. Absolutely. No, you're completely right. And I don't want to kind of overstate, you know, the, the, the kind of the problematic issue that I have. It doesn't at all kind of invalidate, you know, the fact that I think this is a wonderful poem and it's doing lots of wonderful things. Um, it, it's just that kind of slight thing that I just kind of wanted to bring up because I was interested in what you were saying. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, people have to, you know, you want to write from authentic in experience. You know, you want to write something with sincerity and, you know, and authenticity. That's what makes great literature. Um, so the idea of kind of, you know, tick boxes, um, I'm not, not advocating in the slightest. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, thanks, thanks to Linda um, for those comments. I'm just going to use the chair's privilege just very, very briefly and just add um, something to this very lively discussion about um, gender and, and women's voices and, and men's voices in literature. It's important to bear in mind that there has in fact been transition and, and development and change in a less patriarchal moment, uh, not on patriarchal, but less patriarchal. We're thinking of Marlon James' Book of Night Woman, which was uh, mentioned by Isis, which is a male writer writing where all the leads are female characters. And um, Bernardino Evaristo's Lover Man, if anybody's read that, about the experience of a Caribbean man. Um, but even going further back, that there's always been these questions of um, voices of women in Caribbean literature. I think that's really important because the thing that we haven't mentioned is questions of power, not just power of publication, the power of the voices uh, themselves. And it's very crucial to, to state that the Journal of West Indian Literature, which was started in the 1930s, was started by a woman, Esther Chapman was also a short story writer and centered woman uh, in the Caribbean, very central in her, in her short story writing. Um, and also very important too, when we think about Caribbean writing, that we're not only speaking of the English speaking Caribbean, that across the Hispanophone Caribbean and the uh, Creolophone Caribbean, there have been very, very strong um, traditions 
of storytelling in which women are very much centered. I'm thinking of Edith Dantica, but she comes from a, a stronger, longer tradition uh, of Haitian writing in which women are very, very pivotal in, in that. So just wanted to, to slip that in. Uh, thank you all uh, for your comments. Thanks again to Linda for her wonderful presentation. And uh, we break now for lunch and then we reconvene, is it at two o'clock? Two o'clock uh, in this room. Thank you.
live in a community where radical What does it mean?
um, we're now moving into another exciting session uh, at the conference. And uh, it actually seems quite um, useful and um, in, in many ways, actually, I think very serendipitous that our conversation at the end of uh, Linda's session uh, is an interesting sort of dovetail into the, um, the papers that we're gonna hear now, particularly um, our opening paper uh, from Jerain Patmore. So uh, Jerain, uh, as somebody I should just say, I followed Jerain's work with Weber Women Lit um, in Jamaica. Uh, and I'm sure that, that, you know, I've enjoyed following it and the, um, the whole organization behind that. And hopefully she'll say something about that um, in her presentation. Jorraine Patmore is the owner and founder of Rebel Women Lit, and she started this literary community in 2018 as a book club, which has since grown into a bookstore, community, library, podcast, and it is home to the Spoken and Seen Festival and Caribbean Readers Award. So we are very eager to hear uh, Jorraine's presentation, which is entitled uh, women and Literature of the Caribbean, Creativity and Community. Jorraine? Good morning, London, and well, good afternoon, London, and good morning for those of us here in the Caribbean. I'm extremely flattered to hear Professor Smith say that as a, he taught one of my favorite courses at, at my time at the University of the West Indies. So I'm really flattered that you're following my work because I'm following yours very closely. Uh, so today I'll be discussing women in Caribbean literature. We had power cuts last night, so I decided to do a recording of my presentation just in case there's a power cut this morning. So after the recording, we can get into some questions and answers. And if it is that you want to deep dive into certain methodologies for what I do and why I do some of my work, we can do that then. So I'm just gonna ask the AV team to take it away. Also, I use pink because I have the privilege of not being in an academic space. So I can use pink and watercolors a lot. <laughs> What does it mean to live in a community where radical softness, empathy, and liberation are centered using Caribbean literature? How can we use the literature to challenge the way our society solves issues? I'm Jorraine Patmore, and I'm extremely grateful for the invitation to participate in this event and talk about how the community I've built uses literature to create safe spaces for people to reflect and reimagine the world. A bit of background about me. I grew up in an upper middle income family here in rural Jamaica. My mother claims I began reading before I entered school. And while I don't remember this, I do remember devouring encyclopedias in our library throughout prep and high school. My father has always had a clear influence on my ideologies of what it means to be a black and liberated person from taking me to literary festivals and events years before I could grasp what's meant by post-colonial aesthetics and his encouragement for me to read Marcus Garvey, Leonard Howell, and contemporaries like Dr. Clinton Hutton has had clear influences on how I approach my businesses. It wasn't until I finished university studies in New York and later here in Jamaica that I began to realize the impact of my mother's values of friendship family and creating community has had on the direction of my life. But let's get this out of the way. I'm not a writer, I'm not an editor, I'm not a publisher, and I'm not an academic. In fact, I don't have an academic background in the arts nor gender studies. While I did spend a few years volunteering and working in queer and women's rights advocacy, it's not a career field I see myself re-entering. My drive to do the work that I do with Rebel Women Lit comes from an overwhelming desire for a space to discuss what feels like has been for too long reserved for academic and activist spaces. So let's get into it. 
what is rebel woman lit and why will i be mentioning it so much in this presentation firstly rebel woman lit is a bibliotherapy community i started in 2017 with a group of readers who were determined to reimagine our world we center our community on sharing how the feminist queer and caribbean studies books we've read all promote compassion empathy challenges our understandings, gives us tools for problem solving, and enhances our self-awareness. I'll be talking about the work of Rebel Women largely because I have been spending a lot of time developing these communities. I'll be exploring the assumptions that I make in developing Rebel Women Lit, the way I see it fitting into Caribbean literature, and also Rebel Women Lit and its influences has had a great impact in the way that I and many around me now see new ways of doing Caribbean literature. So Rebel Menlet has a lot of features. We have an open book club, podcast, online bookstore, including some physical pop-ups, wellness and yoga sessions, literary events, an abortion monologue series, physical library, digital library, literary magazine that's online, newsletter, and our online Caribbean Readers Awards. The offerings that we have are major, and they're pretty uncommon, even for literary spaces that are existing in developed countries that have an access to larger audiences, more resources, and stronger relationship in quote-unquote traditional literary spaces. But we saw the need for this to be created, and it was important for us to create this to help us reimagine and push the idea of Caribbean literature being closer to the Caribbean, despite the challenges that we have had creating these spaces. We did it here in Jamaica. I want to put a asterisk here. I recently moved back to rural Jamaica from the capital city less than a year ago, and a lot of these offerings I have decided to put on pause as I will be doing my own reflections as to what it means for me to offer these services from rural Jamaica, including all the challenges that I've been having and coming back stronger with Rebel Women Lit. So we do have community members who are based across the world and we are dedicated to creating a safe, intimate, queer, and lit space filled with mutual respect, playful curiosity, and radical joy. The space was designed and we are deliberate in ensuring that we question the existing ways of doing things while collectively collaborating on alternative methods for building fair, softer, and emotionally intelligent world. For today, I will be discussing how community can use literature to recenter. Ooh, let me rephrase that. How community can be used to recenter Caribbean literature and how we use it to reimagine our lives. This comes with a lot of assumptions that I have made, not just for this presentation, but for the work that I do. One of the major assumptions that I make is despite Caribbean's literature heavy focus on gender in post-colonial nations throughout the, let's say, 1970s to 1990s, we still heavily rely on a cis-heteronormative view of womanhood. And we will often rely on stereotypes of women and their expected roles as cultural bearers in society in traditional and contemporary literary spaces. We all know and love the work of Paul Marshall, Merle Hodge, Erna Broadbird, Jamaica Kincaid, etc. And while we encourage our community to engage their work, we also encourage our community to engage this work with a critical understanding that despite writing brilliant, rebellious women, there's still more room for us to reimagine gender. With that said, the gender binary is extremely unhelpful and harmful. So I will as much as possible, try not to engage with the idea of womanhood and maleness as we discuss. 
creating communities while of course acknowledging that there are societal institutions that reinforce the differences secondly we and i uh, we at rebel minlet and i assume that the community is a radical institution that expands our ideas of love and commitment this notion is currently being challenged by many contemporary caribbean writers who are challenging ideas of what it means for us to have a community after we may have already thought that we have developed a national identity. In building our literary community, we intentionally try to disrupt the neo-colonial idea that romantic relationships are the most important relationships we can have. And we also try to find practical solutions to use community to disrupt capitalist burdens of individual ownership being the only route to engage literature. Yes, something as simple as creating a library with contemporary Caribbean books is a disruptive idea towards capitalist ideas of how we engage culture. We get inspiration for this by frequently engaging the works of many contemporary Caribbean writers, a few including Karen Lord, Nicole Dennis Ben, Leonie Ross, Nala Hopkinson, Shani Mutu, and I can keep going on. Finally, let's all be real here. We're talking about books. We all agree that literature is an expansive form that includes written and audio storytelling, but literature in many places means a published book. And I'm going off on a limb here and saying, See how many speakers before me may have referred to book lovers versus saying that we're story lovers. So yes, we agree that literature can be more than a book, but right now we're going to be talking about a book. There are some questions I won't be addressing today because they will largely distract from what I am trying to get across. These questions include who is writing Caribbean literature? I think many presenters before me would have established that and your interest in being this space you must know who is writing caribbean literature who's publishing this in itself is a very political answer and can be another presentation in itself so i won't be talking much about who's publishing where they're publishing from physically or ideologically but what i will explore is who is reading caribbean literature Who's engaging this work? Where are they from? Where are they based? And how are we engaging this work? So here's an unpopular opinion. The center of Caribbean literature is not the Caribbean. I'm going to say that again. The center of Caribbean literature is not the Caribbean. Remember, we're talking about books. Do I like this? Of course not. Of course, Caribbean stories are inspired by life here in the Caribbean. Caribbean writers are based here or abroad, and they often write in response to our neo-colonial Caribbean realities. But the books we consider Caribbean literature are largely an import to the Caribbean. And this creates huge challenges as we're trying to develop communities that engage Caribbean literature. In 2020, Rebel Women Lit features 73 books on our blog of the most anticipated books for 2021. This list was by no means exhaustive. We pulled from publishers across the globe. We asked for recommendations from writers who are coming up. What are the Caribbean books we should be looking forward to in 2021? I did this as a way to, of course, get more people to click on our blog and website, but also I wanted to examine just over the medium term what these books are and how we engage with them. I'd like to also point out that this was in the middle of our pandemic, no travel year. So take this with a grain of salt, but the results should not be too surprising. Of the 73 books on our blog, Two were published here in the Caribbean, both were self-published. Again, this was a pandemic here, so we can assume that maybe there would be, have, may have been one or two more books that could have been published by Caribbean writers that, you know, shipping got in the way of. But two out of 73 is something that we should note. 
of the 73 books that were featured on our blog for Caribbean writers, only 14 had launches, lectures, or readings at festivals based here in the Caribbean. I'm going to repeat that. So of the 73 books, only 14 had any events that were led by Caribbean groups, Caribbean persons. Most of these events would have taken place, of course, on the publishing route and did not see or were not hosted by anyone in the Caribbean, despite our push for digital and despite the large number of digital spaces that have been created. Now, I don't have a number for this, but I would love for you to imagine or try to imagine what percentage of these 73 books are now available for purchase in the Caribbean. With this in mind, how do we engage Caribbean literature and build community? These observations disturbed me. As someone who is involved in culture in the Caribbean and someone who has a hobby of reading Caribbean history, we've long seen the trend of the Caribbean being used. We've long seen the trend of the Caribbean producing whether physical and intellectual label, it being produced here and consumed elsewhere. We need to begin of to think of the ways we can shift the center of Caribbean literature to the Caribbean. It's very small in comparison to the large volumes of work produced in the Caribbean across art forms, across genres, across all means of economic production. But it's important for us to begin thinking of how we can recenter the consumption of Caribbean literature here in the Caribbean. Now, before you all run off blaming the bookstores for not carrying Caribbean books, let me give you a breakdown of the reality of what it means to sell books here in the Caribbean. We all know struggling independent bookstores globally, but being in an island, <laughs> being in a developing country, we do face unique challenges when the majority of our Caribbean literature is being produced and printed outside of the Caribbean. So I'm just going to show you a few screenshots from my email and give you an idea of what it means to sell books in the Caribbean. So in February 2021, I ordered 16 books from PayPal Tree Press. I love PayPal Tree Press. This is not any hate towards them. Hannah has been in extremely incredible in helping me figure out how we can get these books here in Jamaica. So anyways, 16 books from People Tree Press. They cost me 50 pounds. Well, I paid People Tree 50 pounds. That's 25 pounds for the books, 25 pounds for them to ship them. So that's 50 books. Getting these books to Jamaica, they arrive relatively quickly using U UPS. However, UPS decided to charge me 40,191 Jamaican dollars, which is around 225 pounds. So that's a 225 international shipping cost for 16 books. So that means the average cost of getting each book to Jamaica is about 17.22 pounds. The suggested retail price for people tree books is around nine to 13 pounds, which means that the suggested gross loss for a Caribbean bookstore is around four to seven pounds per book. These numbers of course vary depending on where they're shipping from, but I wanted to give you an actual example of what it means when we say that there are physical barriers to getting Caribbean books here in the Caribbean and why Reading, reading Caribbean books tends to be something that has class restrictions. This is a pretty expensive thing for a bookstore to take on. When we do our markups, we have to consider, are we going to be absorbing this loss? Do we pass this on to our consumers? And are there cheaper forms of media where people can engage? As a consumer, you may not readily engage with Caribbean literature. 
because of these costs. So though today's focus has been on how the Caribbean writes back and how we're writing forward, I'd like to challenge us to move towards seeing the other side of Caribbean literature, not just its production and how we write, but first to pull the center of reading towards the Caribbean. A lot of this uses principles from Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde in terms of our ideas of community building. So where is Caribbean literature being read and publicly talked about in the Caribbean? Most Caribbean people will only encounter Caribbean literature in early high school. The public discourse on Caribbean, Car Caribbean and contemporary Caribbean literature is often reserved for annual literary festivals panel discussions, lectures, book launches, and academic spaces. All of the spaces I just mentioned have a perceived class barrier, well, real or perceived class barrier. We'll also occasionally find Caribbean literature being discussed publicly in newspapers. I absolutely love finding these newspaper articles about Caribbean literature or when there are featured uh, new writers in our newspapers. However, this tends not to be consistent across islands. I have checked. And there are many other challenges that we face. This may include financial barriers, as I discussed earlier, for persons who are producing, sharing Caribbean literature, but also for people consuming it but also time barriers with accessing Caribbean literature. Not to also mention we are now living in the age of a, what's considered shortened attention span. I will admit to doom scrolling on TikTok and I've seen the effect it's had on my attention span. So I can speak for myself. But let's talk about time and let's bring it back to women and community. Here's what we do know, at least about Jamaica. So women spend twice as much time as men do on learning. Women spend on average twice the amount of time on unpaid community service or service others, others than men do and spend, time, spend almost three times the amount of time on unpaid domestic care work. Men spend slightly more time than women on social and cultural activities, but women spend slightly more time than men on mass media. High income women do the least on paid care work of all women, as they apparently avail themselves to paid care services provided by lower income women. It's also important to note that even though higher income women spend less time on unpaid care work than men, Sorry, high income women spend more <laughs> time on unpaid work than men. And let's try to understand what this means for Caribbean literature. And what does this mean for us building communities that engage Caribbean literature? My particular interest has always been in focusing on the stories of women. And here's an assumption that I made while reading through the study from Capri. The average Caribbean woman doesn't have time to read, but she will make time for her community. But let's be real here. We should not place the burden of building these communities on women. Women are the cultural barriers, women are the backbone of society. This does not necessarily mean that women are not burdened with this. So many of the books being published in the Caribbean by Caribbean women or featuring Caribbean women has a heavy focus on trauma, sexual abuse, domestic violence, incest, and the list goes on and on. Expecting women to also carry our culture, expecting women to be the ones to build community is an additional burden. So let's use Caribbean literature as a tool to connect women and not a means to an end to ensure that we are getting literature in the hands of more people. 
Creating spaces for Caribbean women to discuss Caribbean stories will inevitably become a space where wounds are being healed and healings need to be explored. It would be extremely ill-advised to take the tools of academic inspection and dissection of literature to community spaces when literature is being discussed. Moving Caribbean literature back to the Caribbean through communities means re-examining how we engage these texts. Of course, there will be a space to appreciate literary craft, but the lens in which these texts will be examined will be very different from the westernized classroom or a book launch at Walterstone's. So this is not school. <laughs> This is very important to understand when we use tools and we use art to engage communities. It is how we move the art form. It is how we move these communities from the margin towards the center. We create spaces for literature to be engaged. We don't create spaces where literature is the, the end that we hope to achieve. So how can we make literature more accessible for Caribbean communities? Perhaps one of the most obvious ones, social media. There has been a huge upsurge in literature globally on social media. Whether Bookstagram, BookTok, people are talking about books in many literary online spaces. And we must be willing to engage with these spaces. Even if you're not on social media, the digital communities such as a Google Hangout, Zoom meetings, these are all spaces that you can connect with communities, discuss literature, and engage it in new and exciting ways. More books. We do need access to more books. This may mean we need more bookstores. It may mean that we need more libraries. I much prefer the idea of having more libraries or bookstores with libraries. But if we're going to be ensuring that Caribbean literature is being consumed by persons in the Caribbean, we must make spaces for books in the Caribbean. Books must become accessible. £225 for shipping books to the Caribbean should not be access, should not be acceptable. We also may need fewer books. Now I'm not saying we publish less books, but I'm saying that Caribbean literature needs to be on different platforms. I absolutely love having Caribbean literature in our newspapers, as I discussed earlier, having them available online, having short stories available online, having them in podcast or audio form, making literature accessible while we figure out the shipping issues is extremely important. So let's think about how we can make literature less bookish. But at the same time, still work on the books problem because we do love the smell of new books, don't we? Now we must move Caribbean writers working from the Caribbean from margin to central. I can probably count on one hand how many major fictional Caribbean writers now are still based in the Caribbean. There aren't that many. Many of them are compelled to move abroad. A lot of this has to do with the publishing industry. So we must find ways to celebrate Caribbean writers who do the extra hard work of staying here. And we must ensure that when we do have access to spaces, traditional literary spaces, we are able to provide linkages for the Caribbean writers who are based here to continue to do their work here. As cultural leaders, we must demand that launches and events happen here in the Caribbean, or at least are co-organized with Caribbean organizations. It is more than slightly embarrassing that we were able to publish a list of 73 Caribbean books coming out in 2021. And for the books that had events, only a small percentage of them decided to have this event organized by someone in the Caribbean or an organization in the Caribbean. And even before the pandemic, it was rare for book launches of Caribbean books to happen in the Caribbean. It would be a few weeks, a few months after 
that these book launches would happen and oftentimes because of shipping issues it would be the writer themselves bringing these books in their suitcases to the caribbean because they knew they wanted and needed to have a launch or an event here in the caribbean lastly but perhaps most importantly for spaces like ours gossiping Gossiping itself can be its own presentation, but here's what I mean. Gossiping is important for any community. It's how we communicate. It's how we talk. Everyone gossips. We all love to pretend that we don't, but we do. Literature provides a unique opportunity for harmless gossip. It's why at Rebel Women Lit, our book club is central to what we do. It allows us to gossip about fictional people, people that we will never meet. And gossiping teaches us lessons. When we're discussing fictional persons, whenever we're discussing theoretical ideas, we are able to examine our own lives. This harmless form of gossip that literature provides us is perhaps one of the most underrated yet most utilized ideas of creating community through book clubs so it's all coming full circle this is how we based on the assumptions that we've made about Caribbean literature about building community have this extensive offering list that engages gossiping celebrating Caribbean writers who are here providing more books creating spaces for Caribbean literature to be engaged with fewer books and of course using social media Naturally, we aren't alone. The work that Rebel Woman Lit is doing may seem revolutionary, it may seem new, but it's largely based on lessons that I would have learned engaging literature, engaging literary spaces growing up. It's largely based on the work that I would have witnessed seeing from Blue Banyan Books, who's been doing this work before me and publishing a lot of these works before me and they're based here in the caribbean pre-lit magazine is one of the newer caribbean institutions that to me exemplifies what it means to be publishing caribbean literature in new ways i can't not do this without mentioning the influences calabash has had on me i will always say i grew up going to calabash when there were only a few chairs out on the lawn <laughs> and Calabash inspires me to think about what it means to ensure that we are the center of the work that we're producing and we are inviting other writers who have very little to no connection with the Caribbean to recognize that we are a powerhouse. And more recently, my engagement with Bocas has been inspiring. Joan C. Hillhouse Yes, she is an institution to herself. The work that she is doing in Antigua has been so inspiring to me in understanding what it means to really use literature to engage community. And on social media, if this is Paradise, that's Akila and Book of Saints, which is Cindy, they're both doing amazing and revolutionary work. I could have a much longer social media list, but I decided to pick these two because they, to me, exemplify what it means to do something different on social media and be a powerhouse in the work that they're doing. So closing, there are three takeaways I want you to have. Use Caribbean literature to build communities. It does not need to look like Rebel Women Lit. Understand what your values are. Understand how you're addressing the issues in your community and how literature can be used to bring these communities closer. Secondly, I challenge you to center the Caribbean in Caribbean literature. Ensure that the work that you're doing is reaching a Caribbean audience. Your work is not just being produced here or inspired by here, but it also has room for consumption. We deserve to consume the work that we're producing. And finally, remember stories build empathy radicalize community and change the world. I know we all know this, but it's time for us to practice it. Now go change the world.
Great. Thank you so much for everyone who sat through that presentation. And I'd like to open the floor for some questions, whether from persons in the audience or online. I'm not sure if we also have questions on YouTube. I'd just like to let you know that Rebel Women Lit, I'm not sure if you're hearing the dogs in the background, but it's the background of living in here in the Caribbean. So Rebel Women Lit is available on much, most social media pages. We don't have a TikTok just yet, uh, but you can engage with us there. You can also subscribe to our newsletter and engage with us there. You can also, my contact information, everything is available at rebelwomenlit.com. Someone tweeted at us earlier. I could not see the full message, but um, Zakia mentioned that Caribbean literature in itself as a term is something that largely came together in the UK. And it's interesting now for me to think about how we reframe bringing Caribbean literature back to the Caribbean. Thank you, Doreen. If, uh, sorry, I, I, maybe you weren't hearing us before. Think, can you hear us now? I can hear you now. Oh, was perfect, I just talking perfect. to myself? Great. Well, <laughs> picking up on your last few words there, in the UK, as we're in the UK, we have a mm -hmm. question from the floor here for you. Uh, hello, hello, Doreen. Uh, my name's Kevin. Just um, picking up on something that you, you mentioned earlier, you said that in moving to rural Jamaica, there were a number of challenges that you faced in putting on your full range of activities and things that you, you that you would normally offer which is a fantastic list but can you share with us some of the challenges that you faced as you said in moving to rural jamaica and um and offering your full suite of services certainly uh thanks for that question so when we just started rebel woman lit we started in Kingston. I was living in Kingston at the time and the model I had would have involved a book club that happens in Kingston, Montego Bay and Mandeville. And we were able to start doing this for a short period of time and then the pandemic happened and we went almost completely online, but largely our largest audience was in Kingston. Going online allowed us to expand internationally we're able to get a lot of persons who are in the diaspora or people who are interested in Caribbean literature joining our discussions and engaging the community in many new ways being in Kingston it made things such as shipping a lot easier for me um, technology is something I don't necessarily have to think much about even though I'm in King when I was in Kingston uh, so, for example, power cuts is now something I have to consider now that I'm in rural Jamaica and putting on presentations like this. Um, shipping has been a new issue for me. Uh, shipping books, even just from Kingston to rural Jamaica, has been something where I did not expect it to be this difficult, being able to find reliable shipping. Uh, but for me, probably the most hurtful part in terms of not being able to put on full services has been our physical library. Prior when I was in Kingston, I was able to share our physical library with our volunteer librarian. We host over 400 books that would have been split between my apartment and her house and persons would be able to access the books. Persons who are in Kingston would have been able to pick up these books for free and return them. There was no cost associated with using the library. But because most of our community is based in Kingston and moving back to rural Jamaica, it's now going to cost persons to access a large part of our physical library. And being able to host that library elsewhere has been challenging, uh, but it's something that I'm trying to figure out and reframe what I'm thinking. Uh, but moving to rural Jamaica has provided me with a lot more perspective, a lot of things that I would have forgotten as to what it means to live in rural Jamaica, what it means to engage in community, not just a digital community. Uh, and now I'm reframing and rethinking about what it means for a woman that to, yes, have a digital presence, yes, have an urban presence, but also what does it mean for us to engage rural communities? 
I hope that answers the question. Any other questions for Mr. Brown? Maybe you could take one online. If there, are, I see there are three in the chat. No, not. Okay, Michael. It was very interesting, Jerry. Um, you did mention, um, curiously, about um, queer spaces. Uh, as you and I know, LGTB issues are um, very much taboo subject in Jamaica. Could you tell us a bit more about that aspect of the work you provide? So interestingly, Rebel Women has always been very out loud with being very queer, queer centered, to be very queer focused in the work that we read and very gay in everything that we do. Um, I'd always say that our first book that we read was by Audre Lorde and so much of the work that we do comes from a queer view as to how we approach community building. Interestingly, we haven't met much direct resistance with regards to this. This may just be because we are in the space of literature, which means that we almost are in a bubble in itself where it's like, okay, those people that are thinking about certain things. Uh, but because I have a background in queer advocacy, a lot of the knowledge that I have has been able to transfer so I know that when I'm dealing with queer topics in Jamaica, I have to be sensitive with how I engage teenagers and how I engage children. I had considered offerings for children and teens with the work that I do with Rebel Women Lit, but I decided against it largely because of the queer work that I do. This does not mean that queer people don't exist as children and teens, I was queer when I was a child and a teenager, but it does open itself up to controversy, um, as you may know, happens in Jamaica. So based on the knowledge that I have from doing queer work before, I employed those in developing the offerings for Rebel Women Lit. But in terms of direct resistance, we may get a few hate comments here and there on social media, but it's easy to ignore. And a lot of the community itself, we pride ourselves on being, uh, someone in book club says we're queer normative, where there's almost an assumption that everyone engaged in rebel women that is queer. And then you might have to come out as being straight because we, we create such a safe environment where being queer is the norm. It's not something that you need to perform. It's not something that you need to advocate for in this space. We approach world from the center that you are taking a queer, not just queer in terms of your sexuality and your gender, but queer in terms of your understanding of what the world looks like, a decolonial lens, a queer lens as to how we view capitalism. That is the center in which we approach things. So within Rebel Women Lit, it's really safe. Um, the reactions that we've gotten from the public has been minimal. And because I have the knowledge that I do performing, well, working in queer advocacy, I know how to design the programs that we're doing. But we're very much like, there's no way you engage rebel women not knowing that this is a queer group. And that's very deliberate on my part. Very good. Thank you so much for that, Jerain. Um, we're, I think I could squeeze in one more question if anybody has a burning question. Well, okay. Hi, my name is Malaika. Um, I wanted to, to um, ask you a question around um, writing and around if one of the things that would be, I don't know, I wonder what, what could happen with Rebelit in terms of developing relations with writers outside of the sense, in the center, um, and if that's one of the things that could be kind of spoken about, and if it could be, maybe we can have a conversation about things like that, because I'm very much into community, but I've very much been into the developing the writing community. But um, yeah, I was really shocked by your presentation, and it's very much food for thought as a writer writing over here. Um, and as a Caribbean writer. Um, so yeah, it's it's more a question and a provocation and an introduction 
and a let's talk kind of thing but also yeah is this Malika Booker yes it is <laughs> Can I tell you, no matter how many times I talk to writers that are on my shelf, I still get starstruck all the time. I love your work. <laughs> but um, that that's a very good question. As I said in my introduction, I, I'm not a writer. I'm not a publisher. A lot of the work I do comes from my desire and my space. I'm coming from it as a reader and someone who loves reading. However, I... I'm 110% open up to partnerships with writing groups, writing institutions. I spoke about Pre and Calabash earlier. I know that they'll be doing work with new and, um, well, let me say emerging and contemporary writers. And that's something that I definitely want to be able to support with the community that we have. Um, but if there's any ideas that you have, I'm I'm 110% in, but understand that I'm coming from it as a space, as a reader. And I am forming a community so that writers, whether you're abroad or you're here in the Caribbean, there is already community, a ready market for you to present your work to that is here in the Caribbean that hungers for your work. And we're trying to create these institutions and the scaffolding to ensure that when you are ready to present your work here in the Caribbean, we have an audience, you have a market, you know that there are people who are ready and able to receive your work. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I hear you as a community builder and as someone who's an audience member. And I think in terms of us Caribbean writers writing here, we would love that audience. So I think it's important for us to kind of have that conversation. Um, so yeah, I will, I will be contacting you. But thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing. It's, it's fantastic. It's a, this is the amazing presentation. Yes, it, it was. And I'm very glad that that connection um, has been made because I do think through those sorts of spaces, some of the problems that Jorraine presented might be able to be circumvented. And, and you know, Jorraine, when I heard you, your presentation, I couldn't help but think about the long history of our music, Caribbean music, particularly Jamaica music, how so much of it was recorded right there in studios in Jamaica, in Kingston. And then the tapes would be sent abroad and produced and marketed. And people in Jamaica had to wait a year after the release in the UK to get an album in a Jamaica record store. And the music was made just a few feet from where you're standing. And you still had to wait a year for a Bob Marley or a Burning Spear album to come into your orbit. Um, and that speaks to lots of issues about power and distribution, which can be um, circumvented through uh, venues like Rebel Woman and like the kinds of connections that, that Malika just mentioned. I'm afraid we're gonna have to end it here because we have um, other panelists, but let's give Jorraine another round of applause. Thank you. And she's given us the details for Rebel Woman Lit, so I'm sure you can continue conversations with her that way. So our next speaker is uh, Cassie Smith, who is also coming to us remotely. Uh, Cassie is coming in from uh, University of Alabama, where she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in early African-American, American and Caribbean literature. Uh, both her teaching and research focus on representations of Black Africans in early Atlantic literature, emphasizing the racial cultural ideologies that helped shape English encounters with the early Americas and helped shape the literature produced about those encounters. Her current works in progress include a monograph tentatively titled Race, Class, Emancipation, and the Politics of Respectability in Early Atlantic Literature, which examines the ways in which issues of race and class merge in the emancipation rhetoric of an early modern Black Atlantic. And Cassie's paper is titled The Oral Tradition and Talking Back to the British Metropole. Over to you, Cassie. Hello, everyone. Um, so um, like with the previous speaker, I am in a morning time zone. For, so for me, you know, my inclination is to say good morning. Um, so for those of you who have already had your lunch, I will say good afternoon um, to you as well. I'm very, very happy to be here with you um, on today. I am grateful for those of you who have joined in, um, either in person or virtually. 
I am going to share my screen. And my, I have a little short PowerPoint um, presentation to go along with this. Um, but in general, I am a literary scholar. So most of what I have to offer for you today um, are some close readings of a couple um, Caribbean texts to kind of deal with this idea about um, talking back. And I, I should make two quick disclaimers up front. One is that um, as I put the finishing touches on this paper, I realized that it's actually more about the talking back to a British metropole part than it is about the oral tradition. Although I do um, touch on the oral tradition a little bit um, towards the end of the paper. And the second thing I should say is that I am coming at this topic and I'm participating in um, today's events as an early Caribbean scholar. Um, and so what that means is my investments in Caribbean literature um, focuses mostly on those texts that were written in and about the Caribbean in the 17th and 18th centuries, and that were written largely by white um, European and Creoles who either traveled to or lived for some time in, um, in the Caribbean. And so I, I know that um, there's a very specific divide between those texts that were written in the 17th and 18th century about the Caribbean um, and what we call um, West Indian or, um, or Caribbean literature today. So one of the things I want to do is to kind of put these two versions of literature in conversation and talk about um, what we can know about this act of talking back um, to a British met metropole. So um, what I'm going to do then is to basically turn to the age old legend of Inkel and Yarko. This may be a story that's familiar to many of you because it's one that starts in the 17th century and we see different iterations of it um, throughout the centuries. So this was a tragic tale about an Indian woman who was sold into slavery on the island of Barbados by her English lover after she saves his life. An Englishman and plantation manager named Richard Ligon is the first person to write about Yarko's story. And he does this in 1657 in the travel narrative he publishes called um, A True and Exact History of the Island of Barbados. The Guyanese writer Beryl Gilroy retells the story in a novel in 1996. Ultimately, I want to do an intertextual reading of these two texts. So I want to show two things. First, I wanna show um, how and why Gilroy would be interested in using the legend of Inkle and Yarico as a strategy for writing back to British empire. And the second thing I want to do is illuminate what I see as the intimate relationship between literature produced in an early Caribbean space and in the Caribbean today, both shaped by diverse cultural interactions that, de that define the region then and now. So often, we think about early Caribbean literature as being antithetical to the anti-colonial nationalistic aims of modern day Caribbean literature, which emphasizes themes of resistance and oppression, displacement and, 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 and exile. Not incidentally, these very themes energize Yarko's story in both its earliest iterations and in more recent ones. So Yarko's story occupies a brief paragraph in Ligon's narrative. It's very, very, very short, y'all, just a few lines. Um, and in this narrative, it's, it's, it's mostly Richard Ligon talking about his experiences on the island of Barbados, where he's traveled to Barbados um, to take over the management of a sugar plantation. And so the narrative is largely about um, the mechanics of running a sugar plantation and about the potential profitability of doing so. And he travels there in 1647. So he publishes a novel a decade later. So the events he's writing about are 10 years after the fact. Um, so, it, so in this narrative, he's assessing the island's economic viability and its culture, noting in minute detail, the people, food, flora, and fauna, the geography, and the religious traditions that shape the island. In this way, Yariko functions as part of the cultural landscape that he uh, presents for readers. The following, Often extrapolated passage from Lyon's narrative initiates what we now know of as the legend of Inkle and Yariko. And so the passage reads, this Indian dwelling near the seacoast upon the South America main, an English ship put into a bay and some 
and sent some of her men ashore to try what victuals or water they could find, for in some distress they were. But the Indians, perceiving them to go up so far into the country as they were sure they could not make a safe retreat, intercepted them in their return and fell upon them, chasing them into a wood, and being dispersed there, some were taken and some killed. But a young man amongst them, straggling from the rest, was met by an Indian maid, who upon the first sight fell in love with him and hid him close from her countrymen in a cave and there fed him till they could safely go down to the shore where the ship lay at anchor. The ship, seeing them upon the shore, sent the longboat for them, took them aboard and brought them away. But the youth, when he came ashore in the Barbados, forgot the kindness of the poor maid that had ventured her life for his safety and sold her for a slave who was as freeborn as he. And so poor Yariko, for her love, lost her liberty. Now, before Ligon provides Yariko's personal history, he introduces readers to her as a house servant enslaved in the house where he's li living on the island. And he talks about her physical features as you know being very much central to her description. She's a woman, quote, of excellent shape and color with small breasts with the nipples of a, a porphyry color. Sometime during his stay, Yariko was, was pregnant or got pregnant by another servant. And he relates her labor and delivery like this. She walked down to a wood in which was a pond of water and there by the side of the pond brought herself a bed and presently washing her child in some of the water of the pond, lapped it up in such rags as she had begged of the Christians, and in three hours time came home with her child in her arms, lusty boy, frolic, and lively. And so this is basic, this constitutes um, what Ligon includes in his narrative about um, Yariko. So you see, it's not a whole lot. The short passage describing Yariko in Ligon's text um, even though it was a fairly sparse account, sparked the English literary imagination, inspiring what David Bryan Davis calls a, quote, early outburst of middle-class sentimentality. In 1711, Richard Steele printed a more elaborate version of the story in the periodical The Spectator. He named the in in Englishman Thomas Ankle and created for him a fuller character profile. More so than Ligon, still emphasizes the young lover's interactions, describing a period of several months in which the two live in a kind of new world Edenic existence that suggests harmony between European interloper and American native. In a significant departure from Ligon, still compounds Inkle's treachery. Once she discovers that Inkle plans to sell her as a slave, according to Steele's version, Yariko tells him she is pregnant. The news does not ignite a paternal feeling in Inkle. Instead, according to Steele, he only made use of that information to rise in his demands upon the purchaser. Because Steele emphasizes more of their time together, he renders even more cruelly Inkle's heartless act. If Ligon's version is, as Myra Jalen argues, a dispassionate tale of slavery that, she, that treats Yariko's fate as another of life's vicissitudes, then Steele's version is much more prejudicial and emotionally invested. Steele's narrator ends the story with this admission. I was so touched with this story that I left the room with tears in my eyes. And so let me just, um, let me just re-emphasize the fact that like this is largely a figment of Steele's imagination, right? So what he has, what he has brought to the story about Yariko is um, basically stuff he's made up. By way of Steele's more elaborate account, Ligon's narrative of Yariko manifested in more than 40 subsequent adaptations, mostly in the 18th century, and in a variety of languages and genres, including poems, plays, operas, and epistles that ventriloquize Yariko's emotional turmoil. In these retellings, the thing Yariko laments is not her enslavement, but the betrayal of a lover. So um, at, at this point, I want to take a moment um, to look at this trailer for Yariko the Musical, and this is a twenty. Um, this is a twenty sixteen production from the London Theatre of Workshop, and I want to show you this um, just to kind of show how the story of Yariko is still very much present 
um, in the popular imagination. And then we'll come back to the Ligon text. I think there are maybe a couple seconds of an ad, y'all. I had to get this from YouTube. So bear with me, please. I'm Emily Gray, director of Yarrico, a new musical that's happening here, the London Theatre Workshop, inside the Ilbrook pub. It's a beautiful love story, but it is a love story with a twist. The story of Yarrico is, is set in Barbados. Um, the storm that has just been commemorated to her in Kendall Plantation. Uh, there's a connection there with my family in that my dad worked on Kendall Plantation. Native girl who was, who met an English man and was enslaved. From then the, the story really uh, took roots and it was published I think over 70 times um, in different various forms which in turn are towards uh, the movement that abolished slavery. It's really exciting this because I think you know the feminism debate is, is right at the moment and is out there and it's not the typical girl meets boy, boy saying girl story is the opposite and it's that strange and resilience and that, that gets her through it. Um, when we meet him, he's been sailing to the Indies and he's got shipwrecked on oh, Yarrico's yeah. Island and that's the first time we meet Thomas. Whilst he's one of the most like liberating and privileged characters, he's actually one of the most tortured and that's because he's basically enslaved by him with this gambling addiction that he has, which is such a serious affliction. And Yarrico, um, being this innocent, this beautiful sort of untouched, you know, virgin woman, um, gets sort of swept up and you're caught up in love and then kind of gets lost in the process. But it's just amazing to me how it, it hits home with current and modern audiences. 2013 in Oxford, where young 13 and a half girls are being groomed and then tapping on those the intersex things and the tapping under our noses. But also Yarrico features on other side of things in terms of relating to a part of the world we don't understand, neighbouring kingdoms that were having war with one another for power and dominance, and instead of punishing them, they would sell them to the white Europeans in order to get money, which would then fund their battle with the neighbouring kingdom. interracial relationships are coming to see shows and like for them it's no different it's no big deal but i think society is kind of not used to that sort of thing so i think once they see it in yarrico they're like actually it's a beautiful thing it's nothing to be ashamed of to be frightened of okay so you can see how this is yeah, being represented in um, in a 21st century context. I should say, I have not had the opportunity to see the play, so I can't really speak to the musical it, itself. Most of what I'm thinking about um, is just how it is, um, is portrayed through the um, trailer. But I'm basically struck by, first of all, how the director describes it as, quote, a beautiful love story with a twist, right? So again, there's an emphasis on the sentimentality of the moment. Um, and then the cast members describe Yarko as strong and resilient, right? She's beautiful, innocent, virginal. And then at the end, one of the cast members calls it a beautiful thing that resonates for present day viewers because it manages to capture the humanistic elements of Yarko's plight. In this three minute trailer, the enslavement, the imperialism that shaped Yarko's predicament are more or less muted. Instead, the musical echoes the same sentimentality that framed iterations of Yarko's story in the 17th and 18th centuries. English fascination with, with Yarko's story can be explained in part by the story's adaptability to the current moment, whatever that current moment is. The trailer I just showed, for example, portrays the story for a 21st century aud audience within the vein of interracial romance. In the mid 18th century, some adaptations began representing Yarko as black, or as mixed race, so part native, part black African, to contextualize it as part of the transatlantic slave trade. By the end of, of the century, so by the end of the 18th century, her race had become indeterminate. 
According to Frank Fesselstein, um, the growing uncertainty as to Yariko's racial ancestry that develops so conspicuously in poetic renditions of the tale may reflect a wider public distaste at British involvement in the cruel and immoral transatlantic trade of Africans to the Americans. I'm sorry, to the Americas. This then would explain why the tale's popularity waned at the turn of the 19th century. England abolished its slave trade in 1807 and the story lost much of its political impetus, though it remained part of Anglo-Caribbean culture, manifesting, for example, in folk songs and the landscape. There is actually a place, um, for example, in St. John's Parish in Barbados that's called Yarico's Pond. And of course, this is um, representing the place where Ligon says that she um, gave birth to a baby boy. And also over um, on the right side of the screen, there's this plaque, this placeholder, um, that was established to commemorate this as a place where Yariko lived. And you can't really see the text here. This was the best um, photo replication I could find. But this opening line is actually quoting from Ligon's 1657 text. This the very last line of his passage where he says that, and, um, and so poor Yariko for her love lost her liberty. So you can just see how she's being commemorated, how she's being memorialized in these public spaces. Um, you know, right up into the 21st century. In the wake of independence movements throughout the Caribbean in the 19th and 20th centuries, Yarko's story assumed new political significance as represented in Beryl Gilroy's 1996 novel. Um, and this is published by People Press. I know we were talking about that in the previous um, presentation. Inkle and Yariko, one of the last novels that Gilroy wrote, follows the basic details of Ligon's story. However, Gilroy complicates the encounter. She extends it over the span of seven years. And Inkle is not a wholly dominant figure or a villain. Inkle tells, Inkle tells the story as a first person narrator. Gilroy actually renders him sympathetically as a castaway struggling to survive in a new landscape. In the first half of the novel, Inkle repeatedly mourns his fate, suffering an identity crisis. Survival necessitates his assimilation into Yariko's um, tribe. When he joins Yariko's people as a captive, they strip him of his weapons and European clothing and cover him in a purple paste, which is used to ward off insects. The paste also remakes him in the image of his captors. He concedes that his knowledge and, quote, civilized ways on the island are useless. He says, quote, to un understand my surroundings, I knew I would have to give up my civilization. He marries Yariko in accordance with the customs of the Carib. He learns to hunt like Yariko's fathers. And in order to become a full member of the tribe, he undergoes initiation rituals like the boys crossing into manhood. He also adopts her tribe's mores, including the practice of polygamy. In the novel, Inkle and Yariko produce two sons, both of whom die in infancy. Inko accidentally poisons the first son shortly after the couple marries. Yariko gives birth to a second son several years later aboard the English ship that rescues Inko. Once the ship arrives in Barbados and Yariko discovers her and her child's fate, she throws the baby overboard. It drowns. Yariko too receives an extensive makeover in Gilroy's novel. Gilroy complicates Yariko's ethnic and racial identities by remaking her as part Carib and part Black African. In a plot twist similar to or Orinoco or William Earl's Obi in the history of Three Finger Jack, Yariko's ancestor, ancestors find themselves in Barbados through the duplicitous actions of slave traders in West Africa and French pirates in the Atlantic. Her West African ancestors join with the island's Carib population to create a nation of Black Caribs into which Yariko is born. Also, gone is the noble savage rhetoric that previously rendered Yariko a passive, pathetic victim of Inko's colonial ploys. Gilroy invests her heroine with a great deal of power, self-determination, and she even throws in a few character flaws like jealousy for good measure. Early in the novel, Yariko's Carib kin discover her and Inko's hideaway. They capture Inkle and force him into a cage. They take him before the chief and force him to kneel while a shaman performs a ritual to determine whether Inkle is in fact a threat. The shaman then rushes toward Inkle to kill him. At that point, 
Yariko broke out of line and snatching the flower from her hair and that from two or three other women, she rushed towards Zinkel and held the posy all over his head, crying, lover, lover, in her tongue. Yariko saves Zinkel. And this is reminiscent of the even more ubiquitous story about Pocahontas, right? And the story of, um, from John Smith about how she saves him from certain death in colonial Jamestown. But unlike Pocahontas, whose mythology cast her as a gentle, free spirit striving for peace and love, Yariko does not save Inkle to keep the peace or because she is enamored. She claims Inkle as a, as a possession, something she has found as a child finds a treasure, a shell, a distinctive plant, a crab with an unusual claw upon the sand. Yariko emerges as the dominant figure through the majority of the novel, treating Inkle as her captive lover. Of course, that power dynamic shifts when an English ship arrives on their shore after seven years, taking a pregnant Yariko and Inkle aboard. The baby she delivers aboard ship looks more European than Carib, and Inkle notes this, saying, everyone marveled at the child, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, and very pale in coloring. Yariko's decision to kill her son is an ultimate act of resistance, a reminder to readers of her free will. According to Inkle, Yariko saw the baby as her possession and no one would own her pet monkey. In Gear Wars Creative Hands, Inkle and Yariko exhibit a range of human emotions, love, compassion, jealousy, rage, greed, fear, anxiety. Yariko is no more noble than Inkle is ignoble. Rather than stock types, Gilroy constructs characters who are complexly human, both motivated by social, cultural, and political factors. In many respects, Gilroy's novel contributes to the distortion of Yarko as a historical figure. That is to say, though Gilroy presents a portrayal, a portrayal that is much more nuanced and reminds us of Yarko's humanity, the novel does not, indeed it cannot, recover Yarko's voice. Gilroy's adaptation is crucial, though, because it unsettles certain assumptions that we could easily take for granted. In fact, we most often take for granted about the nature of European, Native, African contact in the early Caribbean. The novel speaks back to European colonialism and oppression by offering a meditation on the concepts of power and humanity. We are reminded that power was not the sole and inevitable province of Inkle as a European colonial agent. Rather, in the novel, power arises organically out of circumstances and opportunities that favor Yariko at certain times and favor Inkle at other times. Gilroy prioritizes Black and Native subjectivities in a way not accounted for in the earliest renditions of Yariko's story. As such, she opens up a space, even if it is speculative, that invites us to consider the complex power dynamics at play in early colonial encounters and in the narratives written about those encounters, like Ligon's 1657 narrative. And so now I want to come back um, to Ligon's text. Ligon's narrative has been a popular object of study among historians and literary scholars who do work on the early Caribbean. We treat his true and exact history as a reference book, offering minute details about the landscape and culture of Barbados. We also examine its imperial function as a scouting report for would-be English investors. If we only encounter Lyon's narrative as writing empire, though, we miss the ways in which figures represented in his text respond to empire, like Yariko. What's interesting about Yariko is that her story unfolds off the page, so to speak. It happens before Ligon arrives in Barbados. This means then that when Ligon is telling us about Yariko, he is relating not what he observed, but he's relating details as told to him. Even the information about her labor and delivery beside the, um, at the pond is hearsay. This is where an oral tradition becomes significant. Yariko's story had an oral life. It was through Yariko, through, um, fellow, through, fellow, through fellow enslaved companions, maybe even through her in enslaver. And these stories traveled from the coast of South America to Barbados. In this way, Ligon does not tell 
the Oracle story, he retells it in a written form. When we consider the oral nature of Yariko's representation, her story in Ligon's narrative becomes less of an anomaly because hers is not the only life story he retells. In fact, Ligon records a number of personal Black and Native histories in his text. Examples of these personal histories include that of Sambo, an enslaved man who plays a key role in uncovering a slave revolt plot on the island then refuses his enslaver's offer of a reward because he sees it simply as his duty. According to Ligon, Sambo is a man naturally curious about science and religion, and his greatest ambition is spiritual conversion. Despite Ligon's interventions on Sambo's behalf, the man enslaving Sambo denies his request to be baptized. The denial allows the enslaver to avoid questions about the legality or ethics of enslaving Christians. English law at the time, um, prohibited the enslavement of Christians, but didn't really talk about what of those cases in which the convert is already enslaved. The enslaver avoids this quandary and in, in the process, according to Ligon, denies a man's salvation. Interestingly, Ligon articulates Sambo's struggles in a, timular, in a tenor similar to his discussion of Yariko. He scorns English law and expresses sympathy for the plight of poor Sambo a man as ingenious, as honest, and as good a natured poor soul as ever wore black and eat green. Ligon understands Sambo's efforts to enter the church as a sincere display of piety, but it could very well be an effort too on Sambo's part um, to gain his freedom through baptism, attempting to take advantage of the very laws that Ligon criticizes. Ligon relates the story of another enslaved man named Macau, who insists his wife be hanged after she delivers twins. And this based on a cultural myth that multiple births are a bad omen or a sign of adultery. Ligon reads the moment as a foolish myth, calling Macau ignorant, one upon whom custom had taken so deep an impression. The man's murderous rage is not tempered by all the reasons of philosophy that could be given him by both the slave master and Ligon. In fact, the only way the master can prevent the murder is by assuring Macau that he himself would be hanged by her, meaning his wife, upon the same bow if he killed her. For Ligon, this example of Macau illustrates the cultural mores of Barbados' enslaved population. Importantly, the moment coupled with that of Sambo particularizes the population of enslaved Black Africans, leaving textual traces of lives and their efforts to negotiate a foreign landscape that, like Yariko, might have otherwise faded into obscurity. These personal histories supply Ligon's text with literary texture, registering a complexity and richness in his interactions with and characterizations of the people he meets and the landscape. His narrative then, is not simply a record of imperial and commercial possibilities, but also a chronicle of contact. And just as those stories serve his larger rhetorical purpose, Ligon serves the subjects of those stories, preserving lives in a written form that might have been forgotten centuries ago and in forms that continue to speak to us today. Approaching Ligon's narrative in this way, as a compilation of stories and voices makes the text more relevant, not only in an early Caribbean um, literary context, but also potentially for contemporary Caribbean literary studies. Perhaps the greatest value in an intertextual reading of Ligon and Gilroy's versions of Inkle and Yariko is that such an approach reminds us of the ways in which Ligon's narrative is the product of collaboration among multiple cultures, without whom Ligon's text would not exist in its present form. For sure, Ligon and his French patrons and editors ultimately crafted the narrative, but its significance extends beyond what it can tell us about England and its colonial project. A true and exact history is not Ligon's story alone. More than an author, he is a transcriber of lives and diverse cultures that merge in Barbados in the 17th century. In this way, Ligon functions as what Roland Barthes terms an interlocutor. In contemplating the death of the author, Bart advocates a way of reading text that reconfigures the author as a compiler, thereby reducing his authority and control over the text. The author, according to Bart, does not create single meanings, but rather compiles through the act of writing 
multiple meanings for discourses and the text. As for Gilroy, her rewriting of Inkle and Yarko illuminates for us the ways in which um, the ways in which Caribbean literature of today can speak back to and help us make sense of early Caribbean literature. Although her novel is a form of speculative fiction, it points us to alternative perspectives and histories that complicate the ways in which we think about mechanisms of power and the ways in which people might or might not have interacted in colonial Caribbean spaces and in the literature written about those spaces. Thank you. Okay, um, I think we have time for questions, if anybody has any questions. Yes, we do have some time for questions and we will take questions. Thanks again, Cassie, for that presentation. Mm -hmm. We'll quick take questions from the floor here in London and also uh, if anyone online wishes to pose a question to Cassie, you could do so in the chat and we'll recognize you. Uh, for the audience here, if you just raise your hand and introduce yourself to Cassie before posing the question. Michael. Hello, Cassie, that was very interesting. I'm Dr. Michael Siva. Uh, the reason there was a bit of a laugh is I'm always usually one of the first to ask a question of all the presenters. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but as Matthew knows, my area of specialization is history. Um, I have a PhD in history where I specialize in West Indian history. Okay. And I found this reference to Ligon very interesting because um, most of us growing up in Jamaica uh, who studied A-level history at some stage or another, we had to look at Ligon's history of Barbados. Now, my question is, would you find, not just in the story of Yarrako, but in other portrayals of stories, whether they're Hamilton and what have you, do you find that because these musicals are presented to a wider public, that the brutality of slavery, especially when it comes to um, white masters and their sexual exploitation of women of color around the world throughout the British Empire, do you find that that often tends to be played down? I know it sounds like an obvious question, but I just wanted to get your feedback on it. That is played down for this more convenient narrative of a love story. Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. I mean, you know, the short, simple answer is yes, right? In in a lot of ways, that is the case. Um, and particularly with Inkle and Yarko, though, what's interesting is that that kind of playing down happens almost immediately. Um, you know, when the story um, first gets retold in the 18th century, um, you can see already how um, there's a certain kind of sentimentality that takes over. Um, there's another way I'm thinking about this is, you know, in how we talk about like Sa Sally Hemmings and Thomas Jefferson, right? Even the idea that there's this debate about, you know, should we talk about, you know, this as a relationship that they had, or should we talk about it as rape? You know, do we say that um, there was some kind of like sentimental, even the fact that we can't just call these acts of sexual exploitation what they are. Um, is something that's been longstanding. And I think, like I said, I haven't had an opportunity to see that production of Inkle and Yarko. In fact, I, I don't even know if it's been performed anymore since 2016. I would like to see it because um, the cast, they do talk about slavery and imperialism. So I would really, really be interested to see how it gets, um, how, how it gets represented on the stage. But what struck me about the trailer was just as you were point, pointing out, the emphasis on this love between these two figures, right? Um, and when you think about Inkle's actions, it really um, forces you to ask like, you know, was this really a love relationship or was this a relationship of convenience, um, you know, um, particularly on the part of Inkle? But anyway, the, the short answer to your question is yes, I, I, I do think it, um, it is downplayed, although you know there's some nuance that you you can add to to that that answer. Very good, thank you. Do we have any questions online? Not at the moment, no. Okay, anyone else? Well. 
Um, well, if there are no further questions, um, thanks again, Cassie, for a very interesting presentation. Um, as Michael said, the Ligon book is very well known. And um, I thought your comparison with Pocahontas was really important because it, it mm -hmm. did speak to the way in which there are these legends that form. And your last response, I think, right. um, forces us to challenge uh, the legend and also question why they had such endurance, uh, these, these sorts of stories, um, yeah. which indeed were exploitative. Um, thank you again, Cassie, for your presentation. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, that brings us to the end of that session and we will now um, prepare to the other room for some tea and coffee. Thank you.
Right, we were going to check in. And we've got um, past three, is that still on? So I'll just repeat it because it was in the past three.
Okay, I think uh, we're ready to reconvene. Um, so we're going to have a panel discussion. Um, and I am absolutely thrilled to um, introduce uh, Dr. Monique Roffey here, um, who has just joined us for this panel uh, discussion. Uh, Monique, as I'm sure everybody knows, is the author of The Mermaid of Black Conch, uh, which was winner of the Costa Book of the Year Award in 2020, shortlisted for the Goldsmiths Prize in 2020, and longlisted for the 2021 Orwell Prize for Political Fiction. Um, and she also teaches creative writing at the uh, at Manchester Metropolitan University. Is that right? Great. Um, so, uh, to, so this panel discussion is going to give you the opportunity to um, ask any questions uh, that you have that have come up um, throughout the discussions uh, for the day. So please do join in as well. Um, but I'm going to start off by um, asking people to reflect upon um, one of the, the terms that we've been using um, in this conference. So we call this conference writing back and writing forward. Um, so it would be use, really useful, I think, if, if each of the panel members just, uh, just talks briefly about that, perhaps a little bit more about the idea of writing back and then we can come on to the futures um, of Caribbean literature. Um, so, Monique, would you like to start? Microphone. Um, is it is this on? Yeah. Hi. Um. Thank you for coming. I'm really delighted to be here. Um. Yes. I think this is um really really exquisitely pertinent. I mean, we've been talking about writing back for generations now, mm -hmm. for decades. But <clears throat> I mean, in case anybody doesn't know, it was Salman Rushdie who coined the phrase. And in his essay in 1982, where he talked about the empire writes back with a vengeance. Um, and that was in 1982. Um, of course, we're all aware of um, what's happened to Salman Rushdie as well, um, currently. And um, so this idea that the empire is writing back then um, became um, encoded in a book that many of us know very well, The Empire Writes Back by Ashcroft and Griffiths and Tiffin. We all know this. Anybody who wants to know anything about the region will have studied this book. And it became this idea that there's this empire writing back cornerstone of literary decolonization and this idea of reclaiming stories and language and perspective and even our nation languages across the region and across the world. Um, the patois that is spoken in, for example, Martinique, the Martinican French patois resembles French patois in other colonized parts of the world. So um, it became this, um, this kind of cornerstone of things that we began to think about. And some, a book like, you know, Wide Sargas Lucy is a really, really astonishing piece of uh, reclaiming stories and writing back to a canonical text, etc. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to just bear in mind, because it's an astonishing fact, and a fact that I think is kind of like lodged in my heart, my core, my soul, and I stumbled across this fact um, in this book, Colonialism, Post-Colonialism, by Anya Lumba, and she says that by 1930, 84.6% of the world <clears throat> um, were either colonies or ex-colonies of Europe. 84.6% um, of the land surface of the globe. That's a huge amount. Mm. And she also says that Europe constitutes 8%. That, that is wild figures. That 8% colonized 84% of the world. And and in the aftermath, I would say arts across the world have been writing back and decolonizing ourselves culturally. So it's not just a Caribbean thing. This is happening all over the world that we are tr we've been trying to set the record back straight and reframe uh, our world in our, on our own terms. And... Um, yeah, so there was a time in the Caribbean and other, other colonized states where we were considered marginal. And London, for example, was the center. Um, 
you could argue it still is the center, a center of the publishing world. So I know you all know this, I know this is well-worn territory, but I think as we go forward and we're thinking of going forward, and I come from Trinidad, where we've had a literary explosion of um, forward thinking work across forms, across poetry, across literature, across, I don't know, every form, memoir, nonfiction, fiction, that we never forget that this was an essential part of our um, canon, you know, self canonical, self canon making is that there was a period of writing back. I, I personally feel very passionately that I'm part of a generation that began to write forward. Um, and I think that there are young writers coming on, up beneath me who are also conscious of the writing back, but they, ain't, they don't have time to be writing back. They are full steam ahead, consciously just like full pelt, without disrespect or without um, understanding their literary history. And I have lots to say about writing forward, but I'm just gonna say this for now. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Um, I think when I think of the uh, concept of writing back, I immediately, and perhaps in a sort of over tidy minded way, um, divide it into categories. And so there's, there's, there's writing back, if you like, as a, a critical concept, writing back as a matter of something that we as cultural interpreters and scholars are aware of. Um, and then there is writing back as something that is actually done by creative artists. And that won't just be writing back, it will be sculpting back, it will be um, painting back, all sorts of forms of expression um, will actually um, do that. It's actually in that second context in which I, was, I would say, you know, Salman Rushdie wouldn't have claimed for a moment that in a sense he had invented writing back <clears throat> per se in 1982. He drew, he drew attention um, to it, but not least as a medievalist, I can be very well aware of the extent to which um, scholars have quite rightly looked at, shall we say, the response in Britain to the Norman conquest in 1066 and on and on and on as an an endless stream, if you like, of colonial and post-colonial situations that have been a feature of human history um, o o over time, and they change in scope and they change in character inevitably. Um, and likewise, as, as, a, as a practice, as an artistic practice, this writing back or re responding back in other concept, uh, contexts, it'll be referred to as intertextuality, it's an endless process, I think, is the point that I would really want to make. And I thought Isis this morning brought that out extremely well, where she said that actually people writing back in the Caribbean now, you can say there's a substantial body of that literature where they're now writing back to a Caribbean canon that has established itself rather than um, to a <clears throat> European classical, whatever it is, um, canon that is um, uh, out there. So I think my position is in rather, as I said, in relation to um, the notion of contested heritage as a, as a notion that, that came in well and served its turn. There's, there's a point at which you sort of bank and divert, you bank a particular step, step forward in terms of understanding and then develop and then move on um, from actually what you're doing there. Um, and what I'm particularly interested myself in seeing is how, as we move forward, we write forward, we think forward, we interpret forwards, how it is that both the critical perspectives, the purely academic understanding, if you like, which is, it is what I can do, um, and the artistic creativity, how these are things, I, I think it would probably be a tragedy if they started working in harmony what they need to do, I'm sure, is to start is to keep challenging one another, but challenging each other forward. And that's what I'm interested in seeing happening as the forward bit of it. Thank you. Um, I, I don't depart from Monique or John on their views on this. I have full agreement that the practice of writing back is one that's been around for a while and has also been in evolution 
as well, uh, the point about writing back to a uh, Caribbean canon um, is, is an important one that we heard about this morning. Um, as an historian, my interest in, and a historian from and of the Caribbean has always been to seek out those moments in the past, those small interstitial moments that we often overlook when these practices that sometimes we think are new or of recent development were actually very present. And so the actions of whether it is writing back, speaking back, singing back, thinking back, were always there. And what does it mean for our understanding of the past if we are able to sort of um, present those in a way that has not often been thought of or reflected upon? For instance, uh, earlier today in one of our sessions, we spoke about the use of nation language, um, Patois Creole, um, in the prose and poetry of a lot of Caribbean writers. And there are pivotal moments that we can mark when there is a noticeable shift uh, in that use of, of, of language as expression and as defiance in some ways to not write or present words in, in the prose and expectation uh, of, of empire. But there are, have been moments previously which are very much well documented if one were to look at, for instance, late 19th century newspapers from Trinidad or from Jamaica, and you see uh, references to uh, dialogue that uh, appear actually in uh, nation land. And of course, you see the same thing as somebody who works a lot on Haiti um, in a lot of the Haitian sources of that period. So what does it mean when we start to sort of think about early generations and early periods in which there has been this active process of using uh, the voice, whether it's a voice we hear from our ears or a voice that enters our consciousness from our eyes that we read in this active, constructive way of working against um, the, 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 the very confining notions of empire. And I think if we start to think about it that way, we become more accepting of how restless that relationship has always been, whether here in the UK with Caribbean peoples here, as well as uh, in the Caribbean itself, with this notion of a sort of exterior empire power structure that um, becomes very defining of, of our habits and our, our um, being. And, and so that resistance is, is very much found in that. And I, I, for one, as an historian, have found that to be one of the most um, empowering and um, uh, motivating aspects of my work when you do find those moments where you have a Jamaican traveling to Cuba in 1908 and writing about Cuba from the perspective of a Jamaican, not the perspective of an American or a uh, somebody from the other part of the Hispanophone world, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that infusion of that experience then comes back with that person to Jamaica and then spreads in all of these other ways. So um, writing back is, is, as I see it, has been a historical process that, that we're still um, always, uh, D discovering, recovering, and, and representing. Thank you very much. Um, one of the things that really struck me with our um, earlier presentations um, was how wide um, the, the, the kind of um, scope of texts and literature um, has been that we've been talking about. Um, and a question that, that I wonder about is really about how helpful or unhelpful that category of Caribbean literature might be, because it seems to be such a kind of, um, well, I, I suppose that really I'm asking you, um, is it a kind of catch-all? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to be, a, a, to be seen as a Caribbean writer? Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very complex for me. It's been very complex for me. Um, as a European with a European background. And as you know, I mean, um, there are a small group of uh, Caribbean writers who have European backgrounds and we are, we're alive and well and we populate different islands. And 
oh gosh, it's been so complicated for me <laughs> because obviously you can't, from a European perspective, you, you can't go forward, you can't establish a voice, you can't make books until you have confronted history and the history of the European perpetrator. And not just history, but your own family history. So you have to interrogate like your parents and your grandparents. And what I know for sure is that many European uh, writers have done just that. Um, so you have Dinah Macaulay's um, Huracan, and you have Amanda Smith's um, Black Rock, and fortune and you have my white woman on the green bicycle and so you do see i'm just i'm going to get off the subject of european um caribbean people but i've noticed that a lot of people who are in my bracket of caribbeanness have written at least one book which is like interrogating what we are doing in the region like how did we get here and what our our, our families responsible for crimes are implicated implicit in historical crimes so so we so creatively I think a lot of us are doing that and then psychologically spiritually and emotionally um, we're doing other work and working our way slowly into um, this world I, I've met so many um, people such as Malaika who live in live in diaspora and I'm, I'm not going to na name names, but um, we all sit around and go, when are we going to stop writing about Trinidad? You know, five books in or something. Um, I do hope, I don't see myself as only a Caribbean writer. I have other books and ideas and activism across different uh, worlds that I teach. But it is something that has definitely, um, whether I wanted it or not, or liked it or not, it has come to me, I have come to it. It's part of what I did with my creativity, um, initially explaining myself. I've written about climate, uh, the climate emergency from the point of view of, a, of the region after my brother suffered a terrible flood. I've written The Mermaid of Black Con. Um, so it's a bit like, like it's like, you I don't think I've ever thought to myself, you know what I'll do? I'll write a Caribbean novel. <laughs> <laughs> it it doesn't work like that if you if you know the Caribbean and if the Caribbean has been part of your life and hybridity and cultural heritage. Um, it's very much the opposite way around. It's very much one day you wake up and your mother tells you some crazy story, and then the next thing you know you have the title of a book, and the next thing you know you're off. And it's only been over a period of time where the Caribbean aspect of who I am and what I do has become established whether I, by other people, you know, other people mm. tell you who you are. Mm. And sometimes you think, yeah, I get that, that's true, you know, or not, or, but I, uh, so I think with me, um, if you have pale skin and your European background, super, super complicated, and you're only really gonna survive if you can come to terms with um, who, why you came, who you, what you're doing there. What you, what you what your family doing there, um, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> a little more more thinking type value. We've got a, a note coming in there. Um, in turn, I'm I am in a sense the last person to talk with any great intelligence about what actually makes um, anything Caribbean um, Caribbean, because it definitely is not my area of. Um, expertise, although a real area of historical interest, which is similar to um, uh, Matt's position um, here. On the other hand, I am one of the people with Linda who is responsible for putting um, this particular um, day conference uh, together in that way. Um, and it's really, a, for me, the answer is saying something a little bit more intelligent than the very obvious geographical um, area that the Caribbean Sea is at the very, very least a distinctive geographical zone which allows us to define um, a certain area. I do at least work across sufficiently long periods of history and archaeology and over sufficiently large areas um, to be actually quite relaxed about having 
categories which are pragmatically convenient and indeed perfectly realistic in the same way as the discrete character of the Caribbean Sea makes it something realistic to refer to, which as soon as you start moving into generalizations that you have made about them in cultural and historical terms, means that you're endlessly defining the limits of how far you can go with those particular views that there are some things that seem to be typical of there but they're not untypical of anywhere else you are generalizing about an area that of course is actually going to be highly diverse within itself um, and to say there is just one way of looking at the Caribbean um, is, is, is obviously going to be nonsensical. One thing that actually is very, very interesting to me, and particularly from looking at this from the point of view of what I prepared for this, that is really looking at the situation, which I would say is essentially between around about 1750 um, and 1850, is the extent to which con quite foreseeably historical events could have gone a different way so that what now makes the Caribbean as an area of islands, a, a massive archipelago um, within a sea, very, very distinct from continental America and what we call the United States, that those boundaries could have fallen in a different place and that large parts of the southern and southwestern, so I beg your pardon, southeastern uh, United States could have been actually the same cultural zone as what we're referring to as the Caribbean. And that's not to say that it's actually all that very different, but because of the independent, the, the, the successful war of independence um, for the USA, it did follow a very, very different trajectory. And indeed, a lot of what happened in the French and the British um, Caribbean colonies was in response to events in America and the threats and the opportunities that that um, posed, as well as the very dramatic events in um, in Haiti or San Domingo, um, as, as it was then. So um, th that's a way of saying that, in a way, the Caribbean, to me, is self-defining, and it's self-defining in a way that immediately says, just be extremely careful in making any sort of silly generalizations. Uh, about it, and especially when you don't know anything like is enough about what circumstances actually are there. So. Okay, question. Oh, they're on, yes. Okay, perhaps we could go to them. Or either I see. Who wants yeah. to go first? Yeah, if if they know, if they maybe Linda, you could just repeat in the meantime the question that the last question you posed about. Um, yeah. So, um, so Isis and Jerain, uh, delighted to have you with us. We can't actually see you, but uh, we will talk to you. Um, so the question was really about um the uh the breadth of uh text and culture that we've been talking about um throughout this day, and I was just wondering um to what extent you felt that. Uh, the terminology Caribbean literature uh, was helpful or not helpful? Does it pigeonhole you? Does it liberate you? We'd just be really interested to get, get your uh, takes on that. Uh, so Isis, do you maybe want to go first? Sure, I'll go ahead. I see that there is a comment in the Zoom chat that um, Jerain is sharing though. Um, I would say that, I think I would just piggyback off of the last comment made which is to say that we need to take time and caution with how we understand Caribbean texts to be working. Um, what we expect of a Caribbean text is something that I think we need to start stretching. So not only that the writers are going to continue to stretch themselves to tell their story, because at the end of the day, any writer of any work is really telling their own story. They're speaking from whatever memory they have, um, or whatever their local circumstance. And so I'll emphasize that local circumstance to think about what has been happening. Oh, whoa. About 
the experience that they were having um, wherever it was on, on earth. And I think about someone like, um, well, I think I'll, I'll just defer and let Jerain go because she does have a really great example here with Shani Mutu's polar vortex. Yeah, I think you're about to talk about Alicia McKenzie. I know we spoke about that book. Um, I really was about to do it. <laughs> so if you haven't read Alicia McKenzie's A Million Aunties, it's something I definitely recommend you read as to what contemporary Caribbean literature text can look like that isn't, it isn't necessarily advocating that this is what a post-colonial Caribbean identity looks like. This is what trauma looks like. It's very refreshing in terms of how we can expand our ideas of Caribbean identities and what it means to write Caribbean stories for a Caribbean audience. The book very much felt like it was looking inwards. Uh, an example that I have in the chat as well is Shani Mutu's Polar Vortex, which is her latest novel. I believe it came out in 2020 that is centered around two very chaotic lesbian um, women, elderly women in Canada. Uh, but there's something about Shani Mutu's style. If this is your first book by her, you can tell that this is a Caribbean writer. She's not writing about the Caribbean, but the style and the descriptions that she uses to describe Car um, Canada's winter is something where I was like, I've never seen a Caribbean writer describe winter in a way that feels like you're writing about the Caribbean. There's something very distinctive about her style that is reminiscent of other writers, such as Olive Senior, um, Jason Allen, who also writes about nature. But I think it's such an important, I don't want to say shift, but it's an important expansion as to what we can consider Caribbean literature looking like without it being, we're writing about a post-colonial world. We're writing about the place of the Caribbean. And it's what happens when our Caribbean writers in the diaspora feel free to write about different subjects beyond the Caribbean, but still have a Caribbean position, a Caribbean style that they take with them. So I'm excited to see what the expansion looks like. Absolutely. And if I could just add one more point to that, because when we think about the Alicia McKenzie example, what makes it so refreshing, but then also should remind us of what has always been happening is how cosmopolitan it is. Um, and that's the experience of being Caribbean and, and having been born into diaspora, right? Um, unless we're thinking about the indigenous writers, um, the indigenous folks of the Caribbean, then we're thinking about diaspora all the time, right? Born into a diaspora. Um, I'd like to respond to both of you because it's so exciting to hear what you have to say. Um, I've just been, I mean, talking about this idea of Caribbeanness and, and writing, not just forward, but writing now. I've just been reading um, a book by, it's going to be published next year by Brianne McIver, who's a Trinidadian, uh, living in Trinidad, non diasporic writer. And she's writing about the beauty industry in Trinidad and the carnival industry and the celebration of female sexuality, but also the monetarization of it and the um, scandalization of society. And her, her her heroine is an outsider. She's a Trini, but spent too long away and she's come back, she's isolated. She doesn't have too many local friends, but the word cosmopolitan comes up when I think about this book that is set in Trinidad, but it could be set in New York. It could be set in anywhere that's got a fashion industry. And it's a whole new departure from what people think Caribbean novels mm. should be about. It's, it's, just, it's just like, oh, it's about this, you know, take that. It's about something I've never, I've never read a book like this before because, you know, why shouldn't, I, why shouldn't I read a book like this? But it's cosmopolitan and it could be set in New York, extremely Caribbean in its language and its, everything, it's feel, but it's just like, so unlike, it's like nothing I've seen before. So I, I, I think that there's, what you're both saying really resonates for me as somebody who's in diaspora here, that, you know, it's very hard to nail down what Caribbean uh, writing should look like or who should write it and what we should be writing about. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so much has been said that I, <laughs> I, I don't have much to add other than 
just to say very briefly that um, um, this might be more by posing a question to my fellow panelists as as part of it is, you know, I do think that there can be a challenge in the term Caribbean literature in the sense that there may be an expectation that it must be written in a certain way, whereas the freedom of writing an experience that happens to be Caribbean, but, but written in, in, in howsoever um, the, the, the writer wishes to express herself needs to, you know, take privilege. And I think we get back into questions we have already sort of raised at this conference about expectations of publication and expectations of audience and so on and so forth. Um, and, and this, of course, was a greater challenge for an earlier generation of Caribbean writer who seemed to have been very much sort of, you know, hyper-conscious about how they would be re received in um, different spaces. And right? one of the good things is that the evolution of the canon, the evolution of uh, how we understand Caribbean voices now allows for these various different ways of expression to come in. But it still does ask the question, I think, and this is the one I would pose, you know, whether or not the Caribbean writer of now does feel sufficiently freed to express you know, herself in whichever way um, they like, or if as canons form, orthodoxies and expectations also form that can be uh, limiting factors. One very brief um, comment I'll, I'll add to that. It's quite interesting that there's, as the title of this conference was, was evolved, I think we started out with Caribbean literatures and histories in English, you know, spreading our net very, very wide, of course, to make sure that we got um, material in, but it's it sort of focused down in a way, but the, the recognition of that plurality um, was there from the beginning. Um, I'm, before I ask my next question, I'm just going to open up uh, to the floor if anybody here would like to pose a question or online. Uh, Annabelle, do you want to? Dalbert Sandiford says, writers anchored in, Car in the Caribbean may, be, may have difficulty breaking into the British market. British literary agents and publishers tend to publish if they think there is a profitable market for their publications. Even the UWI press is selective about what they publish. Is self-publishing the route for fledgling Caribbean writers? I have noticed that a number of my number of memoirs, for example, recently published in Barbados, have been self-published. Um, about I think it's um, well traditionally been very hard for Caribbean writers to get published um, and that's changing a lot. Um, in fact you could say that Caribbean writers are experiencing a little bit of being mm. on trend in a way. Mm. You could say that but I don't know how you know if, if you have a, 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 a what we would say a a constellation of maybe six to eight big Caribbean novels suddenly coming out. What is that? Is that a trend? What is that? Because I think that, um, you know, we have Marlon James winning the uh, Booker not long ago, and he's unstoppable writer. Mm. I mean, he's just like, oh, got this incredible, like, you know, um, power. He just hasn't stopped writing. But I, I think whether we're um, trendy or not, I think we have to um, establish ourselves trendy or not. You know, we have to still be here. <laughs> you know, I think we have to survive. If there's been a spike in interest in Caribbean writers, let that be so. But I'm more interested in whether people are going to be, we're going to still be trendy in 10 years' time or 15 years down the line, are people going to be um, interested in our work? Um, so, yes, it's always traditionally be hard, but I think it's changing. I mean, I'd be interested to hear from the other Caribbean writers on, you know, out there. I mean, for example, my recent book, okay, I can talk personally about this. I mean, uh, the, the Mermaid of Black Conk was rejected by everybody. Nobody wanted to publish it. Um, and also one of my other books, The uh, White Woman on the Green Bicycle was rejected by everybody. Nobody wanted to publish it. And eventually both these books found their way into publishing. And then they became like, they've sold very well and they've become 
almost mainstream. One of them has become almost mainstream, but it had to survive that kind of gatekeeping. Like nobody wants this black mermaid. Nobody wanted this white woman on the green bicycle because nobody trusted me as, as, a, as a storyteller. Um, and that has its other reasons. So I've been part of that gatekeeping. And then, you know, I wonder about Marlon James. He also had to find his way in. And I know that he had friends calling his book in at the Booker. So I think it's really tough. I do think it's tough. And at the same time, against all these odds, we are becoming um, a force to be reckoned with. Somebody else wants to say anything? Oh. Can, I, can I just, Isis, you looked as if you wanted to jump in there. Yes, I just wanted to say that the last two questions I think are are quite related, right? So where Matthew was talking about, um, you know, the the what is it that defines Caribbean literature, and then this question about how to publish. I think that the idea is that Caribbean writers will always be free to write, but they won't always be free to be published, right? And this ties so much of this together. Um, I don't actually have the figures to say what percentage of books that are on shelves or books that are published are by Caribbean writers, but I know it is a very small percentage, right? And so where we might be seen as trendy, I think to use your term, um, where we might be trendy at this moment, it still tends to ride on the coattails of African-American literature still, right? So we want to think about how... Um, how the literature of the Caribbean, how the works in this canon, how they fit into a larger publishing industry. Where are these books selling? Is it for um, local bookstores? Is it for the large bookstores? Or is it really for classrooms, right? Academic classrooms. Is that still the largest um, portion, uh, proportion of books sold for, Caribbean, for the Caribbean? So we want to think about all of these parts as we consider um, what the future of Caribbean writing looks like. But at the end of the day, the writers will always be able to write. They just won't always have a chance to be well read. So should they choose self-publication? I think that winds up being a question that goes right back to the writer because self-publication comes with its own challenges of promoting it, marketing the text, of course, the cost of the text, all of that. But of course, if you are a Caribbean text, that has been picked up by a larger um, publishing house, are they actually going to put the thrust behind it, the push behind it, your book that is necessary for it to ascend, if you will, to the kinds of sales that someone like Nicole dennis Ben or Marlon James has achieved. So there's a lot that kind of has to be weighed when we think about what it is that gets books out and then what continues to keep books in discussion. And at the end of the day, classrooms seem to, to be the safest space. If you can get a book that winds up on a professor's um, reading list, you have a fantastic pool of um, soldiers in the, the Caribbean literary army, because when those students learn about those texts, they tend to talk more about them. And then it feeds and feeds and feeds. Um, and that keeps these texts uh, being read. Fabulous. Thank you. Jurain, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think Isis definitely hit all the nails on the head with regards to those those responses. Yeah. Great, thank you. I have um sorry, I have John Shorter here as well, who's raised his hand. So I don't know if you want to add anything at this moment about that uh, subject. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Hi. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's still morning here. <laughs> uh, oh, so uh, first, I uh. I just want to congratulate Linda for how well um, she managed, she and her team managed to carry everything off after contacting me last year. And um, I sort of, you know, uh, helped her with the getting everything off the ground and everything. Um, I've been listening to all the papers and presentations uh, as the, the event has progressed. And I'm extremely proud of everybody. And uh, I just think that this is uh, something that um, is that this is the start of something that is um, incredibly important to uh, the future, the, the current and future of uh, Caribbean literature, as well as, um, you know, the wider realm of arts within the region. Um, so I actually want to dial it back a little bit to the, 
to um, some of the historicisms that Matthew was talking about earlier. Uh, my degree is in history. He is one of my most beloved professors after all. <laughs> uh, so I first became interested in um, helping Linda with this panel uh, because of uh, some questions I was asking myself uh, regarding my own thesis. Um, I'm currently pursuing the new MA in public history in the history department. And um, I'm having, and I'm focusing on oral histories of um, my grandparents' hometown of Waterhouse and looking at how, um, looking at, you know, what are some of the historical factors that went into producing um, what is, you know, what has become notoriously one of the most volatile areas of Jamaica. But not only that, we have these seeds of cultural creativity coming out of areas like that. So historically, we've seen that Jamaican culture has been driven by this sort of subaltern wave. And um, I'm very much interested in finding out, you know, what are the historical models that go into creating these sorts of um, into creating the sort of incubator for um, cultural mobilization that then sometimes gets taken over by, you know, um, the, more, uh, the more upper echelons of society. And um, in keeping with today's theme, um, what I intend to do is to basically kind of like shift the nexus of the narrative away from uh, the historical geoposition that the Caribbean has been in as sort of periphery to the empire. And I think one way in which we can, you know, sort of achieve this is, uh, is not just examining the, it's not just examining this in a historical way, but also looking at it as um, a sort of trajectory and uh, basically writing back, writing forward to me, and, um, and I think most of, most of the other panelists will agree is, you know, systemically, you know, raising the voices of people that have been inadvertently marginalized by these sort of um, historical processes. And then looking at how this marginalization then feeds into Jamaica's cultural creativity. It feeds into the regional cultural creativity and how that can then propel us into our own geoposition, geopolitical platform, instead of just being on peripheries but you know, having the Caribbean being a center of creativity, a center of literature and, and history in its own right, in its own form, with its own stories told by its own people, instead of you know, constantly having ourselves tied to what is an important traumatic and tragic past, but what does that mean to shape us as a unique set of individuals, a unique set of minds? And I think the difficulties that we're having with publishing, the difficulties that we're having with um, cultural entrepreneurship really do come from us still needing to take a good hard look at what it means to be Caribbean and what it means to you know, be emerging as our own unique space of creativity while still you know, um, being kind of like encumbered by you know, present uh, and former existing colonial um, baggage. So uh, I think that this is something that we also need to be considering every time you know, we, we decide to write something or put on a play or sing a song or whatever. We have to all, it, it's this sort of dance that we're always doing. You know? we're, we're trying to establish ourselves as a, as a region and as a people with our own narratives and our own um, testimonies. But we still have to be coming out of the shadow of this very dark history. And I think that that's kind of what sets us apart from, uh, it kind of what brings us into the sphere of influence, but kind of sets us apart from what Isis was saying with um, being very much influenced by African-American um, political and cultural um, enterprises. But I think, you know, just having this discussion here today and these ideas that are throwing around is the first step. And I, I think that's all I have for now. <laughs> that's wonderful, thank you, John. Sorry, I, I, I was, um, I just wanted to, to just jump in with the words colonial baggage because um, what horrifies me, and I do still want to talk about writing forward, what horrifies me is people who don't have any, is the colonizers who have no colonial baggage. And that is what is at the heart of our problem is that colonization has been left off the national curriculum in colonizing countries. Mm -hmm. 
And so I now teach at um, a university and I don't teach undergrads, but I do teach on an MA and often I get quite young people um, who are obviously English or British and they get incredibly um, inhibited and hurt and guilty and just a, a range of difficult emotions when you bring up the subject of colonization because they're new to it, they're new to it and they don't identify as colonizers. And of course they aren't colonizers, but it is a, it is a crime not to teach our colonial history at, um, at, prime, no, at sort of secondary school because they do do this in, for example, um, Germany, um, young Germans understand what happened under the Nazis and they've managed, you know, they have guilt, but they're also living with it and moving forward. So we have colonial baggage and the colonizers have no baggage whatsoever. So, <laughs> so we, we write into this gap and, um, and we have to go forward, if that makes sense. We haven't yet gone forward with it. Thanks. I'll be very brief because I know our, our <laughs> colleagues and friends here in the audience have questions. Um, just two very quick thoughts, which I think connect to some of the points that John raised, John Shorter. Um, you know, when we think about the relationship between the Caribbean person, artist, writer, expressive person, Caribbean, to um, empire, we often need to remind ourselves that empire itself has often shifted and changed in the perspective and the consciousness of people in the Caribbean, right? Whether it is through the defeat in a moment of, of revolt, whether it is through the humor in the mimicking of someone who's a planter or someone who's of the white elite in, in, in the societies, whichever way it manifests, there's a way in which that the empire never always seems as some big omnipresent presence in our in the lives of the Caribbean. And I think having that as some sort of an awareness to understand and appreciate the way in which um, the expressiveness, the forms of voice that have taken place over time have emerged in the Caribbean gives us a sort of, you know, makes us appreciate some of the points that John was trying to raise about how do you understand this, what he referred to as a subaltern wave. Lots of it historically has been that there, there has always been this sort of sense of challenge, right? This, this understanding that even the United States is a very, very recent comer to the game of empire. And, and a lot of Caribbean writers have written in the 40s and 50s in that vein. Um, and that's a sense of, of, of strong positionality. The second point, which I say very, very briefly too, is that um, when we think about the spaces for the expression and the publishing of Caribbean writers and, and, and Monique's point about Caribbean being on trend, we should also be aware that there is a difference between Caribbean writers being on trend and the Caribbean being on trend. And there's a way in which in certain spaces here in the UK, I, I, I can say, um, the, the, the Caribbean, whether it's particularly in, in areas of nonfiction, is often, you know, preferred to be received to a larger audience when translated by a British writer uh, here rather than a Caribbean person. I mean, I'm just making that very, very bluntly. Um, and it's a different sort of paradigm that prevails in the United States or in North America publishing, I, I found regarding how there are spaces that are presented. I mean, it's similar to what Isis mentioned about the uh, alliance or the, the sort of, you know, relationship with African-American writing and issues and themes and the Caribbean must somehow conform to those exact same sorts of ways of na narrating a story and an experience to be received or have a presence. And these are, you know, sort of come back to the point I made. I mean, what, how does the Caribbean writer today deal with that when there is this, this interest in the Caribbean, there is an interest in black history, broadly conceived, but also those very, very specific ways in which we read and, and write and understand and present the Caribbean. Um, you know, there's still that very strong battle as to how that, that should be manifest um, by, by uh, you know, Caribbean voices. I mean, you know, this is a very point about just even how the story of the Caribbean is taught and told here in the UK, right? It's taught and told in a way that is part of um, this history of, of, of the UK as almost very separate, right? That the Caribbean story is not separate. It's very, it's very linked, it's very connected. 
And I think that that's something that 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 helps us understand these approaches differently. I talk way more than I intended <laughs> to. Please, Michael. Um, I think we need to move on. So I do want to go to uh, the future um, of Caribbean literature, and I know Monique is dying to step in here. Um, so we'll think about the, uh, the sort of the writing forward. Where do we go from here? And where do you think Caribbean literature is going? I mean, I'm so excited about today. Um, I come from Trinidad and we've had this explosion of talent and 95% of this talent has been by women. And um, it's just like, it's just amazing. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody of you are familiar with the poetry of Shivani Ramlachan and Vani Kapildeo and Dion Brand. I mean, those just come out of one tiny island. And then we have um, people writing about the Venezuelan um, immigrant crisis and we have Chick Lit coming out of Trinidad and we have all kinds of queer writing coming out of Trinidad and we have, um, okay, I'll just, you know, speculative fiction, Karen Lord, speculative fantasy fiction and, I mean, I mean, and also, you know, magical realism isn't new, but if you look at what Ayana Banwo, Lloyd Banwo is doing, so it's just gone bonkers. It's just gone off the scale um, at the moment. And that is as if, again, coming back to this, like we've, we're framing ourselves as being here and, 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 and being established and being part of a global world of voices rather than waving the big Caribbean ting, ting, ting and colonization. I'm sure a lot of our writing, it's all there, but what I'm seeing is just this kind of new wave of women writing. I mean, I'm thinking also about young adult fiction. We've got this wonderful writer called Alaki Pilgrim who's written these first of a trilogy of books for children. I just, I mean, and of course with that comes content. So, um, Lisa Allen Agostini, I mean, we're talking about how do Caribbean writers get published. I mean, Lisa Allen Agostini for years was being knocked back by agents and publishers, and then she went for, with a small press, and out of nowhere, her book ends up on the Orange Prize, the Women's Prize shortlist. And what is she writing about? She's writing about a, a subject that, for example, a writer like Sunny Ladu has been writing about, but in a different time, which is um, domestic violence. And um, Shivani is writing about domestic violence. We're writing about things that perhaps our male writers are not writing about, even though this is not a female problem, it's a male problem, blah, blah, blah. So feminism, Caribbean feminism and womanism is, is being expressed um, big time. And I find this incredibly exciting. And um, I don't know what to say, we've always had so, just quickly around women writers, um, we know the Caribbean has this wealth of women writers, but we're also seeing um, feminists excavating all the women we've lost, which is dozens and dozens. And there's a woman called Alison Donnell out of UEA, who is, is basically bulldozing in her way into finding um, all these lost writers, these women. And it's, it's not um, five or 10 lost women writers. It's hundreds of lost women writers that have been erased and forgotten. And so we can't stand on their shoulders because we've lost them. Um, so it's exciting um, for me. And there are so many big books on the horizon. And I, I, I was on a stage recently with Ingrid Passau and Ayana Lloyd Banwo. And we're both, all three of us are Trinis, Indo Trini, African Trini, European Trini. And we, none of us could stop talking. You know, we had to elbow each other out of the way get our word in. And that's one tiny island that's got enough going on for three women to like be getting on with. Um, blah, 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 I'm talking too much. That's fabulous. Um, can I just go to Jerain and Isis, if you'd like to add anything? And then I think we probably need to wind this up. Jerain, would you like to say anything? Uh, certainly. Uh, when it comes to Caribbean futures, I'm excited about what that means for us to reposition Caribbean readers in literature. As I said before, I'm excited to see how we center Caribbean readers, what we do. And that could mean something as simple as we've been able to talk to writers who've demanded from their publishers that in their contracts, these books have to get back to the Caribbean. 
or they have to be sold to Caribbean bookstores at a cheaper rate than what you sell to UK or US bookstores. These are things that are in their contracts. Um, for example, when they're doing launches, their publicists must have events in the Caribbean. They're very simple ways that we can think about, okay, getting involved in the publishing machinery is difficult, but how do we ensure that the work that we're being created is focused here at the Caribbean? And how do we begin to, in many ways, dismantle the ideas that we have around and the ideas that we've cemented as to what Caribbean literature and just publishing in general needs to look like in the developing world? So those are the things that excite me about the future and excite me about how we can write back into the Caribbean. Thank you. Isis, final word, I think. Sure. I think about the future of Caribbean literature and I think about the fact that we are moving away from um, a focus on nation and renewing a focus on the individual. So what I expect of, because it's been what has been happening over the last 10 years or so, what I expect of the future of Caribbean writing is more inclusivity, more fluidity, more honesty, and more curiosity. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, can I have like the final yeah, final word? Very quickly, John. <laughs> yeah, um, so I think the future of uh of, of all of this is basically a radical redistribution into that silence colonial gap that Monique was talking about earlier. And I think the way that we can do that, as Jermaine and Isis have been have been kind of saying coherently, is just being as authentic and fervent as possible in our identities as Caribbean people and um, and the kind of strategies that we can use to make sure that our stories not only center us, but are available to the people that are like us. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I think we need to move on. Um, we have uh, Malika Booker who's going to do our keynote address. But before that, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists, Jeraen, uh, Isis, John, Monique, our very own John. Um, and Matthew, so thank you. So I am equally delighted uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, Malika Booker, who I know many of you have been speaking to throughout the day. Um, Malika is just an amazing woman. Um, she kind of does everything. Um, she has research interests in Black British contemporary poetry, women uh, contemporary poetry, Caribbean and African American contemporary poetry, autobiographical and confessional poetry, poetry of witness, poetry and performance, and on top of all of that, uh, she writes amazing verse and she also teaches creative writing um, in schools and at Manchester Met uh, University. So uh, I'm delighted to pass over to Malika, who will be uh, closing our day. Thank you. Um, um, is it possible to put up the um the PowerPoint or to how do I get it up here? I told you I'm, I'm technologically challenged. So um yeah, is it possible for you to get it up here? Yeah, I put it here. Hi everyone. I write on a laptop, but anything else, as my students know, there always has to be a technological person in the class to help me. Um, this has been an amazing um, day. Um, I'm so um, inspired and 
actually educated. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to kind of speaking to you. I was amazed by some of the overlap, some of the things that the talk that I will be doing will have. So at the moment, I'm in the, uh, I'm in the last year, sorry, I'm just seeing my book there. I'm in the, <laughs> I'm in the last, I thought I know that cover. Um, I'm in the last year of a PhD. Um, and so I'm just going to share um, um, and speak to you about the work that I'm constructing at the moment, which is completely different from Pepper Seed and completely different from the autobiography, autobiographical work I've been doing. So the, this talk is called Begat, 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 the Caribbean Imaginings of the Female Biblical Narrative. Um, Genesis, how our world was formed. And it came to pass that a heaping set of ships start land. And it came to pass that the soldiers had traveled far from the back of beyond to behind God's back, leaving chilly homes to gather chilly homes to gather up a heaping set of brown skinned souls, and they land here in hot sun and pelting rain. And so it began, bowly whips start lashing, iron start brand skin, and so it began. First the land was bought then stock was built and then the world was created. And it came to pass that there would be generations formed by matriarchs catching the nen nen in this hard place. Um, and so what I'm gonna be doing is kind of giving you some poems from this po poetic inquiry that I'm doing as a practice-based PhD and also talking about ideas around it. I would welcome any kind of conversations afterwards about it because I'm learning about it as I'm going on. And so begins my manuscript in process with this embodied rereading of Genesis, this interrogation of the formation of West Indian society, this merging of Caribbean vernacular with biblical register, this relocation of the womb into the center of infamous begetting litany, which I've always had problems with. I remember being in Sunday school and saying to my mom, how comes is men begotten men begotten men. So this idea from this came from even when I was small in Guyana, just questioning, where's the woman in the list of begotten? So it was with great joy that I was able to write this begotten piece of poetry. And so begins my preoccupation with the King James Bible, the result of a lifelong haunting and a radical reimagining of this canonical text where the geography, language, and characters are relocated to the Caribbean. Today, we're focusing on the development of a critical poetic using the King James Bible as an analytical lens through which to read the effects of plantocracy on the theme, Caribbean female body. Um, and that's what we're looking at today, but in the larger body of work, we're also looking at masculinity and vulnerability. Um, and we're also looking at um, Ruth and Naomi, and reading them through a queer lens. But today, we are focusing on this. Um, so today we're focusing on the development of a critical poetic using the King James Bible as an analytical lens through which to read the effects of plantocracy on the Caribbean black female body, both in the region and the diaspora. The body becomes a site of reclamation, a space where the erased defiantly account their embodied truths emancipating themselves from anecdotal, marginalized positions occupied in the Bible. In an interview for Tin House podcast on the 1st of October, 2022, the author Dion Bran, the God of my world, one of the gods of my world states, when one arrives in this world in her body, our body, one has to make one's history in a right way. One has to make one's intellectual history. One has to make one's kind of erotic history one has to make one's way in the world that doesn't recount history. I'm also writing this in the shadow of the great um, Jean Binter Breeze. Um, and, and here I've got to kind of do a rendition of her poem, um, Caribbean Woman, but I'll just refer to it because I'm too nervous to sing and, and bring Jean in. But she has this poem where she says, oh man, oh man, the Caribbean woman. And it's such a, and Jean just so centered um, and spoke out of these voices. Um, so I want to bring her up here and I think I'll 
bringing her up for a long time because I still feel her loss. So even though this is ta tangential to the talk, Jean has to come into the space. Um, as someone who nurtured a lot of writers here, trying to find their voice. So Brand further states that this is an accounting that has to do with abstraction because the thing that is written is the record of the conqueror and there's another record. That is the record of the body, the record of the lives lived and the record of the recollections of those lives lived. So this project seems to try to do exactly that. So we begin in the middle passage, working within a matriarchal framework where the womb takes center stage. Let us be clear that this is not a defensive action. It's an act of defiant reclamation through an assertion of selfhood and lived experiences, a persistence of experience. Ocho was 12 when she begat Violet, then Ocho lived till 50 years due to hard life, but is in, in this beat up land. But in that time, she also begat Sitaira, Sam, two dead twins and Frank. And as she was field woman, so her daughters wore field work on their skin and she three boy children. The American jazz singer, Diana Reeves states in her song, I'm an endangered species, but I sing no victim song. I am woman, an artist, and I know where my voice belongs. A manifesto I return to again and again. In fact, it sits above my desk. One that shapes my positioning when undertaking this kind of work. I'm man mindful that myself and my protagonists, or rather the constituency that I'm reimagining and enabling voice to are not victims. And as such, I'm not answering back to patriarchy, but rather that my poetics provide them with tools to empower, to testify, to bear witness, and to represent an alternative voice, an alternative voice, constantly marginalized and maligned. In the Old Testament, as during the colonial project's massive institution of slavery, violence is an everyday occurrence, and there are constant wars, ethnic cleansing throughout scriptures. Meanwhile, women's brutalization in both the colonial and biblical narratives is mainly insignificant. Females are merely a backdrop or catalyst for savagery, a body legitimized to be acted upon with no repercussions. In Judges, a wife is venomously assaulted and her husband's reaction is to dissect her body and send their parts to the far-flung regions of Israel as a rallying call to gather and incite war on the perpetrator. The Levite woman here is a mere inciting incident in Judges 19 a subtext for bloodshed and more misogynist assaults on women that ensue. This biblical endeavor enables her to use poetic monologue to empower her own truth and own her own narrative. And as the event occurred in Judges, her ghost takes him to court, where she is witness and accuser in a courtroom that is an experimental sonnet. The first poem in the sequence enacts a lyrical courtroom in which both language and actions are cross-examined. The ghost in the witness stand writes herself into the biblical geographical space that is Caribbean in language and conjures notions of the auction block, but also conjures notions of recent violence visited on the Caribbean body in the region as recent as during COVID, when the attacks of women increased across the Anglophone Caribbean, body parts being found scattered across the hinterland, in ways reminiscent of the Levites' actions in Judges. High Miller's poetry collection in nearby bushes seeks to address the atrocities that occur at night in bushes in Jamaica, when women and the vulnerable are preyed on and brutalized, not unlike the assault on the Levites' wife. In the collection, I'm playing with time so that a poem can be in present day, move back and forth in time. Um, his poem here, Where Blossoms the Night, aptly captures the horror the Levite's wife seeks to address in her poetic courtroom. As Kai's lyric state, it is, it is this inscrutability, the wild and passionate uproar, here where is the horror, the horror, here where you might find the war, that seems to be reaching for an ad inadequate language to describe those vile and barbaric deaths. A ghost in the witness stand seeks to bring the gaze solely on the victimized, to call patriarchy to account, to have the black body unpick the term persuades and instigate just how weaponized and untrue this word is. 
So what happens is in the process of writing, the, the creation of the poem says, I want a courtroom. I, as the writer say, I'm writing a poem. <laughs> And, the, and then it's up to me to try and find the container to be able to think about how can I have a courtroom here. And so the Levite persuades his unlawful wife to return to him, the title. The title is a ghost in the witness stand. And so ghost is an interesting thing because she's a ghost in the, in the, in the narrative itself. He's not named. He's given various names, so unlawful wife, woman, whore, concubine, but she's not named. And to not name a thing is to ghost it. To not name a person is to ghost it. But also she is in the witness stand. And so she's a ghost in the witness stand. And also we're thinking about the ghost of the narratives, the constant narratives and retelling. Um, the ghosts, I don't know, that I saw constantly online, the ghost in where, where, you know, um, I suppose this was happening globally, but I was looking at the Caribbean because I was in this project, but where women are, have been killed, but what has been talking about is the morals, and the values around that, as opposed to the person. Constantly you have me ask, do you see us? So my ghost in the witness stand, a Levi persuades his law, unlawful wife to return to him. In this project, sometimes the, the protagonist wants to actually have a conversation with the biblical text. But in here, the protagonist, the ghost in the witness stand says, I want to interrogate that word persuades. And what better way to interrogate something than through the use of the lyric? Persuade, substitute, dragged, hair clamped in palms. Persuade, substitute with hand collaring throat. Persuade, barricade, breach, law unlawful to my body. Persuades, his right, his might, my flight, ask why. Persuades. And so that is a sonic courtroom. It employs the aspect of a sonnet. It's a hybrid form. Um, and then halfway through, it changes. It has a turn. Um, and then she uses the sonar solid um, uh, from Terence Hayes, where what happens when you repeat something over and over and over and over and over again. In this text, he throws her body over a donkey. But the donkey as well can be, sometimes when I was home, Sometimes when some of my aunts felt that they were being, they were working hard, they would say, I'm not no donkey. And so what, when she says this donkey can't carry no load, no damn load, and you repeat it over and over, what's the effect of that? Um, and then she tells her own story. She says, persuades. Um, and she really wants to interrogate words like persuades and took her. I found that a lot in biblical texts. So he took her or they took her. Such a throwaway line. But when you start interrogating it, what happens? And then what happens when she starts looking at what actually happened? And what this witness stand is, it's not a combat, it's not a combating space. It's actually a space where it's all her space. This is her courtroom. She is the witness. She testifies how she wants to testify. She's not trying to write back into anything. She's just writing herself. The other way he start, I up my body, say he thicken me up like I is rump, say he thickening me up like I is a rump. Body to distill, slow to quarter and cut up. Body to dissect, slow to quarter and cut up. I was parade each day on his auction block. My parades a pirouette, toes bloody on wood block. In the way he watched me, make I had was to run. Is the way he first licked me, make I had was to run. One foot in front of the other, my skin put foot. One foot in front of the other, my skin put foot. Because in his words, I was a bird to pluck, pluck, pluck. And so she tells her story throughout this long sequence poem and uses various uh, poetic tools um, to shape it. 
Um, and it's a poetic inquiry where I learn, what does that mean? What does that mean? Where does that stand? Um, um, and demands this, these kind of different types of use of the sonnet, which is a place where you make an argument, to make an argument. Bear in mind that this Levite story is in Judges in the Bible. So it's interesting that in that space, that this, this work demands this. Um, um, and then reading biblical accounts um, and biblical dissection of the Levite woman is found in a, she's returned to her husband's, her father's house. And so she talks about what does that mean when a woman runs to her father's house? And what does that mean? Um, and so then it also takes the text of the biblical and writes it over and over. It's interesting how many people say that they read the Bible, the King, this, um, this is my investigation of the King James Bible, but my investigation of, of how we are treated in certain spaces, but don't really read this work. They read around it. They'll tell you what about her and her transgressions. And they tell you that she was an unclean woman and an unlawful woman, but they don't really read that work. And she says, stay in there, stay in that space, see me, see what was done to me. Um, and it's based on using the form used by Terence Hayes for the Solar Sonnet. And Philip B. Williams explains in a Twitter essay that the Solar requires a pairing of its craft with social understanding of political possibilities that echo within the reader. So the more the reader knows, the more the same line. If you don't know anything, it just looks like a poetic trick. You're just repeating a line. But if you do know, it's like a Rubik's cube. The more the knowledge you know and have bouncing back and forth between the poem, then you are able to accommodate a complex emotion. That this is a type of sonnet, it's incredibly risky because it's, it, it, at the heart it can look gimmicky. But what happens if you know the history of watermelon and African-American history, and you read this over and over? Um, and so it felt like this was a, a, a good way to, to take the biblical text and have that used over and over. What happens if you understand the biblical text? What happens if you understand that that's just a, a, a one act in the Bible, but after that, it's, it instigates ethnic cleansing, it indicates um, brutality, but also what happens if you place that geography into a space like the new world? What is this, what's happening? So the writing of the poems enables me to explore and find out as well. In Genesis, likewise, Dinah, the seventh daughter and child of Leah and Jacob, after being brutally violated, by her family's given space to enact her own perspective and defiantly brings her monologue. She says, this, this is no poor me one poem, no woe is me song, because my crushed petals can still bloom in hostile hot sun, pale bruised yet headstrong. These women are defiant, they're Talawa. So this anthem is alluded to by other Talawa women mobilizing and assertive of their own truths, enabling me, the poet, to discover, to understand, to be surprised by the preoccupations of the speakers. One of the main themes that developed during the act of writing was a reckoning with the problematic act of no naming. Women were frequently addressed as wife, woman, and sought this space as a space of activism. While writing Samson's mother's poem, I asked the question, what is your name? And this opened up a can of worms in which Samson's mother responded in a sequence poem entitled Samson's Mother Speaks. And in the first section, erased. Um, oh, let me stop for a minute. I was meant to do this, sorry. Thank God for this. So I was meant to talk about why the sonnet. Um, the sonnet is said to be, not only is it an essay, not only is it a space in literature, in, in poetics where you can, it's like a, an essay where you can work out, you start off and set up something, you can work out an argument, but it was also um, what June Jordan has said is, is that the sonnet was one of the spaces that blacks were supposed to stay out of, but ventured into anyway. So when you take that on board as well, and you see that these women are enacting the sonnet, 
But the other thing that we talk about with the sonnet is that um, uh, it's something about the spacious and brevity of the 14 line poem. It suits the contour of a rhetorical argument. The form becomes a medium for me, the poet, to explore uh, my capacity to bring together heart, feeling, and thought. It brings together the lyric and the discursive. It's a conducive to calculation and experiment. It's a closed form that keeps opening up, right? Um, so Muller argues that um, Mira's Dove follows the words worthy and conceiving the sonnet as a site of freedom and imprisonment at the same time, um, Dove maintains that the words worthy and notion of dangerous and liberating at the same time, Fred Morton says it's, it's disruption. It's a way of its political and aesthetic innovation. Um, for me, the sonnet is a poetic um, essay, a vehicle for debate and persuasion. And add to that its political inhabitation of a radical activism in African-American landscape since the 50s with Claude McKay used it to give voice to protest poem. If we must die, a sonnet McKay reclaims was written for the abused, outraged and murdered, whether they were minorities or nations in the world. We start to understand something that's happening in this project when the women decide that we are gonna tell our stories in sonnets, but we're gonna make you open up those sonnets, right? Um, so what happened as well is um, I, I, at the same time, there's a bit in the project where, where the women wanted to speak back the text of the Bible. And we're in a language way, they wanted to employ that biblical register, the musicality of the biblical register with the vernacular. Um, and I discovered this form by Karen McCarthy Wolf called a coupling. And in a coupling, you get an original text and you lineate it, and then you write back to that text. But you need to mirror that text by kind of having some aspect of echo. So it might be rhyme, it might be alliteration. So the text meets, but it also interrupts. And so I thought, what about if I try a coupling sonnet, right? So that in the, bi in, the, in, the in answered prayers, um, um, Samson's mother starts off by really speaking back to the lyrics that's written about her and really almost as if it's like, this is what is said, this is what I say. And what's nice is that she could get the last word because of the 14 line. Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, that day the worms crawling in my belly stopped. Drink nor wine, neither eat any unclean thing. And I ban my belly tight with rope, pick food like bird. For the child shall be a Nazarene to God from the womb. Yea, I danced on bare sand to the music of these words. Thou shalt conceive a child and bear a son. A little cloud briefly darkened, you were not a girl. The woman, the woman, barren his wife. My name was a speck of dust beneath these men's feet. When the woman bare a son and called his name Samson, you, little gooseberry, were named before you ripen. And the woman, the woman, she, the wife, the woman, my name rattled the bars of their throat yet stayed in prison. The former constraints set up these couplets with the biblical text opening the conversation between Samson's mother interjecting. There's an orality at play, a reasoning according to the Rastafarian division definition of debate. The coupling is built around echo, call and response, repetition, variations of repetitions and variations of sound as well as the energy created by the friction and the juxtaposition of the words against each other. And this friction is amplified as the sonnet is a vehicle that, as I keep saying, facilitates argument. Though it's use of the term, the bolter. Um, and so um, I wanted to finish with Noah's why, um, with a poem. And so basically, um, in the absence of a name, Noah's wife sings her own praise song. And I wanted to just assert that this is not about combating, this is not about writing ourselves into the patriarchal mar narrative. This is about just writing, this just asserting who we are. I'm not interested in writing, writing back. I'm interested in exploring these voices to find out where the Caribbean body sits in this space and how can this be used 
to tell our stories? And how can it be used to think about time so we can move back and forth in time? In the absence of a name, Noah's wife sings her own praise song. The poet notes that the Holy Spirit did not inspire biblical writers to recall her name. Um, what's good about writing is that you can get to kind of say the things that irk you in the poem in a little aside before you start the poem. And so sometimes it feels like as the poet, I'm having a conversation as well with the protagonist. But don't get me wrong. I don't know. I have to skill up to to um, to write what these characters want to write, whether it's, you know, Mary, the mother of God, um, trying to tell her Caribbean mom that she's uh, having a baby and that Joseph is not the father um, at her young age and how the mother reacts. I sit down to write about Mary and think it's going to be something holy or think it's going to go somewhere. And it's like, no, you're telling your mother that you're having a baby while while she's in the kitchen with a knife. How do you think that's gonna go? <laughs> and so I'm gonna finish with this. Um, and I hope it gives you a kind of idea of this poetic inquiry, this experiment, this interrogation of biblical texts, and also this idea of what happens when the language, the geography, um, and the culture is placed into this biblical terrain. Um, and, um, and, and interesting enough, there's also sections, what happens to the male body, vulnerability, masculinity, what happens when someone says you have to kill your son, right? Um, what happens to you the night before? What happens behind in these gaps in the space? So I'm gonna finish with this. In the absence of a name, Noah's wife sings her own praise song. The poet notes that the Holy Spirit did not inspire biblical writers to recall her name. And so it began the act of no naming, the deep grave they dug to shove you into, the way they savagely slapped earth down on top of your head with the bellies of shovels, even your shadow flattened behind your back like coward, you behind your husband and tree picked me bam bam, knowing of the seven offspring only three took root. Oh, exhume her, anoint her with first names, dip fleshy thumb to print lavender oil into her forehead in this act of naming, press that name into scripture. Genesis is bereft due to your pain. Say it, you, we see you, flesh and blood, your mouth a litany of prayers. In Genesis, the word was brought into being with the act of naming. Praise for the rough stalk when doubts flayed his skin, raw with ineptitude. Praise for your crude sketches in the sand, you who saw the ships hold like a womb to be rocked, like a lullaby by the water. Prayers for the hammer you wield, striking, for the lift and slam of axe against tree, for bleeding palms, the raw calluses. And yea, the Bible does not tell us about you, lawful wife, the follower of God, you whose marriage was rock slide on Sundays. I forgot you could see it. Ah, <laughs> uh, where am I? You should have been reading that along with me. I'm sorry, everybody. Okay. <laughs> in Genesis, the world was brought into being with the act of naming. Praise for your rough talk when doubts play their skin, raw with ineptitude. Praise for your crude sketches in the sand. You who saw, you who saw, you who saw the ships hold like a womb to be rocked like a lullaby by the water. Praise for the hammer you wield striking for the lift and slam of axe against tree for bleeding palms, the raw calluses, yea, the Bible does not tell us about you, lawful wife and follower of God. You whose marriage was rock slide on Sundays, rippling brook on Thursday and salt in wood at twilight. Praise you whose marriage was sawing of branch, was thump up your back and lash him down with words. You whose name squatted in birth papers, was he faithful husband to your bosom chest? Crappy mood swings and haunting days. This is the question we must ask, and we praise you still, despite the absence of your name. Praise for the countless days in the horseshoe, alleviated by bundles of lavender, and you scattered, and you dried, stacks like heaps of hay, prepared as you took inventory. The stench, my husband, you implore daily. Praise the herbs you gathered and pound to season our palate. 
the rice you buried in your hair to restore to new earth in this new world, how you and your son's wives save seeds for nourishment, your son's wives too unnamed like a cluster of newborns discarded on delivery. Praise that sip of ginger beer and cool evenings to soothe the belly, the rain lashing down, roughing the waves, pelting, the sway, the nauseating, the wombs on that boat like living in a coffin for 40 days. Then bless the cattle, surviving the chains down in that boat, deep belly. And what we're missing is you and your daughter in Noah's name. Forgetting. And it's just so dry, they scatter names upon me, like dice on flat four tabletop. Scatter names on me like how this broad old arc does not stop rolling and rocking over these rough, rough waves. Guessing, your name is Mzara, meaning mother of Sarah. Guessing, mm, your name is Batimus. Guessing, nah, your name is Batimosh. Fingers pointing and wagging. And him shushing me, bellowing, Mrs. Noah, tone foul like I am a flea sucking his blood dry to bone, each miscarriage dubbed in, dubbing my belly cursed vessel unworthy. So each time he dashed the just born corpse overboard, I bawled and bawled as each bounced into their watery grave on me. Um, so, I thought I would finish with Noah's wife. I thought I would start with Genesis and finish with Noah's wife um, in this conversation, um, thinking about the Caribbean, the new world, the formation of the world, women, the complicated. I think this is a complicated project. It's complicating some of the things, some of the things that people spoke about today, um, some of the things that we as Caribbean writers are exploring in our world. One of the thoughts that came to me. Um, uh, from the talk earlier is, is, is uh, as you were talking, my heart sunk because we were talking about the fact that there's so much kind of violence against the woman's body in Caribbean women's work. Um, but I think um, as I'm exploring this really patriarchal text, which is where so much violence is visited upon the woman's body and where I'm placing the the, re, the the Caribbean kind of geography and 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 person in there and where these women are lines or really rays this I can only be kind of like a conduit to the stories that they are presenting that they are saying um, and on, can only try and find the containers or the vehicles or the form to help to 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 hold it. Um, and, I, and, and the question, and, and come kind of realize the questions that it's raising. So um, yeah, so I welcome any questions and any thoughts, but I thought, yeah, it would be nice to share this project and these new, piece, these new pieces of work that I've been working on. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Malika, for an absolutely thrilling paper, and I'm sure I'm not the only one here who was um, moved and delighted to get an insight into um, a project that is ongoing. Um, I'm actually going to bring things to a close, but we have drinks. Um, Malika is certainly going to be there, so please hold your questions. Um, we are going to have drinks uh, in the room opposite where you've had tea and coffee. Uh, we have wine, we have rum punch, courtesy of the Jamaican High Commission. Thank you very much, Vivienne, um, who made it uh, for us. So please join us for drinks. Um, it just leaves me to say thank you very much um, to all of our amazing speakers today. I'm sure that, um, I mean, I found it a, a wonderful um, day. So much uh, to think about. Thank you very much to Matthew Smith for chairing um, so beautifully. Um, if anybody else is still online, thank you for being there. Thank you to all of you for your questions and your involvement. And let's 